Good afternoon, Mr. Young. Ms. Anthony Hook, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Sounds good. Thank you. We'll be starting shortly. Thanks.
Afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. We'll be starting shortly. Yeah, I think we got about three minutes. Yeah. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? We can. Great. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. It's four o'clock. We have a quorum. We're going to go ahead and get started. Mr. Young, could you start the recording, please? Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today's date is October the 6th, 2022. We are convening and broadcasting this public hearing by video conferencing. My name is Anthony Hood, and I'm joined by Vice Chair Miller. Commissioner Emer Moore and soon to be Commissioner May. We also join my office's only staff, Ms. Sharon Shellen and Mr. Paul Young, who will be handling all of our virtual operations, and our Office of uh, Zoning Attorney from our Office of Zoning Legal Division, Mr. Dennis Liu. I will ask all others to introduce themselves at the appropriate time. The virtual public hearing notice is available on the Office of Zoning's website. This proceeding is being recorded by a court reporter and the platforms used are Webcast Live, WebEx, or YouTube Live. The video will be available on offices on his website after the hearing. All persons planning to testify should have signed up in advance and will be called by name at the appropriate time. At the time of sign up, all participants will complete the oath or affirmation required by subtitle Z 408.7. Accordingly, all those listening on WebEx or by phone will be muted during the hearing and only those who have signed up to participate or testify will be unmuted at the appropriate time. When called, please state your name and home address before providing your testimony. When you are finished speaking, please mute your audio. If you experience difficulty accessing WebEx or with your telephone call in or have not signed up, then please call our OZ hotline number at 202-727-0789. Again, 202-727-0789. If you wish to file written testimony or additional supporting documents during the hearing, then please be prepared to describe and discuss it at the time of your testimony. The hearing will be conducted in accordance with provisions of 11Z BCMR Chapter 4 as follows. Preliminary matters, applicant's case. Applicant has up to 60 minutes. Report of the Office of Planning and Department of Transportation. Report of other government agencies, report of the ANC, 
Also, testimony of organizations, five minutes, and individuals, three minutes. And we will hear in the following order from those who are in support, opposition, or undeclared. Okay. After those, let me just read this. I don't normally read this. After testimony of those in support, we'll hear from the parties in opposition and then proceed with the individual testimony if applicable. Then we'll have rebuttal and closing by the applicant. Again, the OZ hotline number is 202-727-0789 for any concerns during this proceeding. The subject of this evening's hearing is uh, 801 Zoning Commission case number 22-06. This is 801 Main Avenue, Southwest PJV, LLC, Consolidated Plan Unit Development and Related Map Amendment is Square 0390, Lots 53, 801 Main Avenue, Southwest. And again, today's date is October the 6th, 2022. And the ANC tonight uh, is ANC 6D. So with that, I'm going to ask Michelle, do we have any preliminary matters? Or if my colleagues have preliminary matters, you can speak up. If not, we will continue to move on. Michelle. Yes, sir. Um, so we have a one, two, three party status request in opposition. Um, if you'd like to do those first. If so, I'll proceed with that. Yeah, let's um, let's do this. Let's do the party status. Um, okay. Yes. So so the first one is from Capital Square Homeowners Association uh, in opposition, Aaron Berg, Corinne, Corin, uh, Carol, Patricia, Giorno, Ramos, Gustavo, uh, Pinto, and Gail Fast have been permitted to testify for the party. Um, and that is at Exhibit 22 and 22A. Um, the applicant did file opposition to their request stating that they did not provide the documentation uh, that that gave uh, permission for them to proceed in this um, case. And uh, they followed up with a uh, supplement to their request that uh, does give them um, permission from the homeowners association to proceed in this proceeding with um, the representatives as stated in their uh, supplement. So we have this for the um, commission to uh, make a decision on. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Uh, as Michelle has already teed up so well, I don't have to do a whole lot of talking, which I won't. Uh, the application came in, it did, it fell short. Uh, the applicant responded to that application and I think the um, Capital Square Homeowners Association in, a, in an amendment uh, which I believe is 22A exhibit, uh, followed up with the permissions to be able to proceed as a party. I'm in favor of, of giving them party status unless we have any objections. Okay, not, not seeing any. We would not, any, no objections. We will grant them party status. Okay, next, Michelle. Okay, so next, um, the next two, I'm actually going to call them together. Um, uh, Corinne Carroll and Gustavo Pinto, they are both residents within 200 feet. And the reason why I'm calling them together is because um, they are also members of Capital Square Homeowners Association, and they were also named to be permitted to testify for the Capital Square Homeowners Association. So I just want to put that out there. They are applying for individual party status, but I did want to point out that they are also members of the um, party in opposition that you just granted party status to, but they are asking for individual party status in opposition, and that's at Exhibit 39, 39A, and 33. Thank you, uh, Michelle, and I saw that. I'm not sure, unless I missed something, I think they could probably come together with Capital Square Homeowner Association, unless my colleagues saw something else. Uh, I'm not sure what different they have, and I'm sure they will have time to testify uh, in that case. I would just ask, <clears throat> excuse me, I would just ask that those two persons join the party <clears throat> in which the building they live in. But let me hear from others while I try to clear my throat. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I think you're on the right track. Um, it's it's unusual to have, um, you know, a, a collective party uh, and then also have members from within that party or even like part of the testimony for that party to be separately considered parties. And I don't know that there's really any 
any advantage to them um, uh, or to us to, to have them considered as a separate party. Uh, and like I said, it's it's unusual to to have this, and I think that their interests are common among the rest of the members of their association. And so, uh, I don't think they are. When you consider it in that light, I don't think they're really uniquely affected when they are. You know, they have next door neighbors who have the same effect, and everybody is represented by that uh, association. Okay, thank you. Any other comments on that issue? All right, so we will. They're not in party status, but let them also know that they can join the their neighbors, which is the same development, Capital Square Homeowners Association. <clears throat> and you, they can um, also do a vote on that, please, since you're denying yeah, I, it. I just was making a statement for the record. So okay. they can join what they can do is join the the group that we've given party status, or they will have time, as as Commissioner May said, they're not uniquely affected. And they can join the uh, party uh, that we gave party status. Hopefully, they can work that out together. If not, we will hear that testimony because they're not, as he stated, our regular relations say uniquely affected, and all of them appear to be affected the same way. So, with that, uh, I'll make a motion that we deny uh, the name Pinto and the name Carl party status with the explanation I provided previously and asked for a second. Second. Then moving in private second. Any further discussion? Not hearing him. Michelle, would you please record the vote? Yes. Um, Commissioner uh, Hood? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner May? Yes. Commissioner Imamora? Yes. The vote is four to zero to one to deny party status to uh, Corinne Carroll and Gustavo Pinto. Um, in the minus one being uh, the third mayoral uh, appointee being vacant. Thank you. Um, okay. The only the other preliminary matters are uh, expert witnesses. Matthew Bell, um, he has previously been accepted. Um, Brett, oh boy, I'm going to mess this one up. Suiatoka, um, I don't think we've heard from him before. Um, Robert, Michelle, Seems. Let's, let's do all the ones that we've heard from. Let's do all and then okay. we'll come back. To the ones we've Watch heard it. from before. Yes. Uh, Robert Schiesel. We've heard from before Shane Detman. Okay. All right, so those three we've heard before Mr. Bell, uh, Mr. Cecil and Mr. Detman. I think we've all heard any objections to continue that status. No objections. Okay, Ms. Shellen, let's go back to Brett Swatter Tocha. I think I got that correctly. That's at Exhibit 15D and also Gabriella Canamar, 15D also. So Both. Brett, let's do Brett first. Uh Swatocha. And I'm sure they will let us know if they if you messed up their name, but I think I got it correctly. Uh so so any objections to Swat Mr. Uh, Brett Swatocha? Or Tucha. I, yes. I just have a question. I mean, looking this over again, there is not an indication of how long uh, Mr. Swiatoka has been in practice, a registered architect, but I don't have any idea, you know, how long has he been in practice and how long has he been an architect? And if the applicant can just answer that, that's helpful information to have in, in a resume that we are considering for expert status. Great. Let's let's bring let's bring uh the, the Applicant up, and also we can bring Mr. Swat Tocha up as well. That's right. This is Holland Night. Are they all in the same room? Yes. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> I heard that, Commissioner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon. We have it together today. Um, so. For the record, Lila Batiste with the law firm of Holland and Knight. Uh, Mr. Swiatoka um, has been previously accepted as an expert by the Zoning Commission in Zoning Case 02 38I. Okay. Well, that's helpful to know. Um, but I am curious about the, his, um, how long he's been a uh, practicing architect. 
Uh, for the record, Brett Swiatoka with Perkins Eastman DC. I've been practicing uh, with Perkins Eastman DC uh, since 2010 uh, and for three years prior to that since graduation in 2007. Okay. 15 years. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, I thought um, your name was familiar from a prior case, but you know, because it's unusual, it's not the average everyday name. I'm like May. Hood <laughs> and Miller. Yep. Even more, even, I'm not going to. Even more. Yeah. 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 So, okay. So, so Here. we will continue that status unless I hear any objections. Uh, the next one is Ms. Shelley's already mentioned Canamar. Did I, did we pronounce, did I pronounce your name right? Canamar, Gable? Yeah. Gabriella Canamar. And she Gabriel. has been previously accepted as an expert witness as well. She's been previously accepted as well. Yes. She's here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And landscape, yeah. Land, it's not landscape. Okay. Any, any objections to continue that status? So we will now, do that. There are, there are some dates in her resume, so, so I have a sense of how long she's been in practice. Okay. So and, we and, will uh, we will continue that status and we will update our, our books. Okay. Anything else, Michelle? Uh, no, sir. I'm just gonna I'm gonna find out from the party in opposition who will be doing their cross examination which person will be designated for that. So I'll reach out to them and find out which person will be doing that for you. Okay, thank you. All right, um, Ms. Matisse, you may begin. And I would ask that you, you know, we look at in your presentation, I don't have to tell you what we look at, racial equity, outreach, those kind of things is where we wanna include, but I'll turn it over to you and hit the highlights and where the differences yeah. are where people are having problems. Uh, problems. So I'll turn thank it over you. to you. Thank you. Lila Batiste, Dennis Hughes, and Chris Cohen with Holland and I counsel to the applicant, which is a special purpose entity affiliated with Jair Lynch Real Estate Partners. Uh, Jair Lynch seeks approval of a PD and related MAP amendment from the MU12 to MU9A zone for lot 53 square 390, which is a 1.23 acre site located at the intersection of 9th Street and Main Avenue. Southwest across the street from the wharf. The proposed PUD is a mixed use building consisting of 498 residential units and approximately 24,000 square feet of ground floor retail. 75 units will be set aside as affordable, which is equal to 15% of the residential gross floor area. The application should be approved by the commission for four reasons. First, the rezoning and Proposed redevelopment. I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Batiz, Mr. Cohen did not register to testify. So we need to give him the oath. I, I did. Oh, okay. Well, he will not speak in this evening's. Is he going to answer any questions? No. He won't answer any questions? No. Okay. He's just going to sit there. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, the application should be approved by the commission for four reasons. First, the rezoning and proposed development is consistent with the property's designation on the comprehensive plan future land use map, which is medium density commercial. And this has been the property's land use designation since the adoption of the 2006 comprehensive plan. Second, the design and scale of the development is consistent with the guidance provided in the Southwest Neighborhood Small Area. Third, the PUD benefits and amenities are commensurate with the development flexibility, specifically the heightened density achieved through the PUD process, and the project's impact will be mitigated and are acceptable given the project's benefits and amenities. And finally, the PUD provides more IZ units than what would be required if the applicant pursued a straight zoning map amendment that OP could support, which was MUA. Mr. Chairman, I know that the Zoning Commission takes very seriously outreach to community stakeholders as part of the PUD process. So the last thing I'd like to highlight in my opening remarks is the extensive outreach efforts of the Jair Lynch team. Even before we were actively engaged as zoning council for the project, representatives from Jair Lynch discussed the proposed redevelopment of the property with ANC 60 
and even went as far as to ask their input on seeking approval of a PUD versus a standalone map amendment. ANC 6D created a subcommittee chaired by Commissioner Lightman, whose single member district includes the property. Commissioner Kramer. We were directed to meet with that subcommittee throughout the PUD process in order to understand and address the community concerns. We met with this subcommittee 25 times between February and July. We also met with the residents of the Capitol Square townhomes on the north side of G Street three times. And these meetings were more than just the applicant hearing what the community had to say. These meetings resulted in substantive changes to the project design, primarily related to building height and traffic circulation, and an expansion of the PUD benefits and amenities package. For example, Jair Lynch per, um, pursued and received concept approval for two curb cuts serving the private alley for the project so that G Street would not be the only means of ingress and egress. Also, the PUD was ex uh, benefits and amenities package was expanded to include approximately $750,000 of improvements along 9th Street. Finally, the Jair Lynch team was persistent in its outreach to the Jefferson Middle School Parent Teacher Organization because the middle school is adjacent to the project site. Early in the zoning approval process, the PTO asked the team how traffic circulation from the development relates to the middle school, which we addressed in our pre-hearing statement. Also, the PTO wanted to make sure that the construction protocols mitigate the impacts of noise and dust on the school. From that discussion, the Jair Lynch team agreed to enter into a construction management plan that addressed the PTO's concerns. The Jair Lynch team also agreed to contribute $150,000 to the PTO to fund off-site programming, especially while, while the PUD site is under construction. The applicant spent so much time meeting with the ANC 60 subcommittee and the HOA to address their concerns, they had only a limited amount of time to meet with those who are supportive of the project. Notwithstanding, there are 21 letters in support of the project in the hearing record from people who reside and work or work within one mile of the PUD site. And in those letters, um, they express their desire for the PUD benefits and amenities, including the grocery store and the traffic improvements on 9th Street. In addition to community stakeholders, the applicant has engaged with the Office of Planning and DDOT throughout the zoning approval process. Both agencies issued favorable reports providing support for why the application meets the legal standard of review and should be approved by the Zoning Com Commission. This concludes my opening remarks. The next person to testify for the applicant is Malcolm Haig with Jair Lynch. <coughs> He will be followed by Mr. Swiatoka Perkins Eastman, who will discuss the project site plan and design. Rob Sheasel of Grove Slade will discuss the transportation considerations. And Shane Detman of Goulston and Stores will testify on the PD's compliance with the comprehensive plan and the Southwest Neighborhood Small Area Plan. Thank you. Is the presentation? Um, uh, Paul, can you pull up the PowerPoint? Thank you. And you can go to the next slide. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, I'm Malcolm Haith. I'm a developer with Jair Lynch Real Estate Partners. I'm joined here this afternoon by Ruth Hong and Radhika Mohan. Uh, we are the owner and developer of 899 Main Avenue. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Jire Lynch is a local real estate firm founded nearly 25 years ago on three pillars, people, place, and prosperity. We build across the district and the region all types of properties, including office, retail, libraries, community centers, schools, to market rate, attainable, workforce, senior, and permanent supportive housing. Jire Lynch has developed or acquired over 10,000 housing units of which over 4,000 serve families earning up to 60% MFI. 
First and foremost, we are community builders. We believe in creating spaces that will stand the test of time, generating value and opportunities for neighbors and residents. Next slide, please. As Lila mentioned, with this PD process, we met with the community and neighbors over 50 times in the past year. We were tasked by our SMD Commissioner Lightman and the community to come up with a plan that addresses the 9th Street traffic streetscape and shifting the 9th Street, or I'm sorry, the um, G Street curb cut and architectural design that is contextual and has neighborhood retail that includes a grocer and a bank. We were also tasked to address affordable housing and celebrate Southwest culture through art. Next slide. Through conversations with the ANC subcommittee, we tried to address those concerns as best we could and are appreciative for the feedback from the ANC, the subcommittee, and the greater community. And though at times those conversations were frank, they were collaborative. We made tremendous progress in those meetings and we believe the building design and function is better for it. We are proud of the building that we have created and collaborated on with the community. In addition to the ANC, we have continued conversations with Capital Square Townhomes HOA, Town Square Towers HOA, the Southwest BID, Southwest Community Center, Southwest DC Action, the Wharf, and others, as well as several conversations and now support from the project from Jefferson Middle School Academy uh, Parent Teacher Organization. Next slide. Through those discussions, mostly with the subcommittee, we adjusted the design in response to varying feedback from the community. As shown in the image on the top left corner, we started the process with an MU10 zoning and it consisted in 110 feet across the site. In response to the ANC and the community about the scale of the building, we proposed MU9 zoning. This allowed us the flexibility to shift density away from G Street to Main Avenue. As shown in the image on the top right, the G Street portion of the building is at 100 feet. With additional comments, we further lowered the G Street portion of the building to 90 feet while increasing the main avenue side to 130 feet. This is the baseline for the massing in our application and is shown in the images on the bottom row. Further adjustments to the courtyard in relation of the building to its context were also made. Our height adjustments and scale are a result of a robust dialogue and reflect the desires of both the Office of Planning and the community. Next slide. Outside of the building design, we have expanded, revised, and refined our benefits and amenities package through the PUD process. And we are pleased to provide the creation of approximately 498 housing units, including 86 two bedroom units and eight affordable three bedroom units. We are also providing 15% of GFA devoted to affordable IZ units and 60% MFI. This is approximately 75 units, including 16 three bedroom units, and all eight three bedroom will be affordable. We are providing a lead platinum building with superior urban design and efficient and economical land utilization. Through several discussions and iterations with the community and the subcommittee, we derived a plan for re envisioning of 9th Street while addressing traffic concerns. This includes approximately $750,000 in infrastructure improvements and the addition of elements requested from by the community, including a PUDO zone, expanded pedestrian street, streetscape and landscape, and a shifted curb cut off of G Street. We are also providing a contribution to public art. In addition, we are excited to bring neighborhood serving retail to the community, including a grocery store and a bank, which were requested the community. I will now pass to Brett Swiatoka to discuss the architectural design in more detail. Thank you. Next slide. Brett Swiatoka, Perkins Eastman, DC. Uh, so the, the first part of my presentation uh, will be intended to orient everybody to the site uh, within the greater Southwest context of DC um, and illustrate the existing conditions around the site, which served as um, a the basis for our approach to the overall design that has been proposed. Um, you can see in this uh, overall satellite image the building's position uh, along Main Avenue. Um, we are within walking distance of L'Enfant Metro, uh, as well as the Waterfront Station Metro, um, and within walking distance of the cultural amenities and neighborhood resources um, that make Southwest the Southwest neighborhood great. Next slide, please. 
Um, zooming in a little closer on the site, you can see its position within the immediate context uh, with Capitol Square development to the north, uh, Jefferson Recreation Field and Jefferson Middle School Academy to the east, uh, Main Avenue and the wharf to the south, and uh, Banneker uh, Park and Overlook to our west. Um, You'll, you'll also see in this image uh, off to the right, uh, Town Square Towers. Um, and a, the important thing to note here is the, the similar relationship that's established between existing with Capitol Square Towers to the uh, low to mid rise development of the apartment buildings north of G Street um, to the to the design that you'll see that we we've proposed with the relationship of 90 feet at G Street to Capitol Square development uh, north of G Street. Next slide, please. Uh, the next series of images will illustrate uh, with photos the existing context around the site. Here we're standing on the east, east side of 7th Street on G, looking west toward the site, which you can see the existing office building in the distance. You also see the dense, beautiful, mature trees uh, that line G Street uh, in the foreground, uh, as well as um, Capitol Square uh, development there on the right side or part of Capitol Square development on the right side of the image. Next slide, please. Uh, if we move across uh, 7th Street and turn around to look east um, on G back toward uh, Town Square Towers, you can see again, just barely peeking over the trees there, the top of Town Square Towers with that similar relationship of, of 90 feet existing uh, to the three story uh, apartment development on the north side of G Street. Next slide, please. Here we've moved across 7th Street, turn around on 7th Street and looking uh, east, uh, west, sorry, west toward the site. Um, you can see how dense the tree coverage really is here in front of uh, the Capitol Square development and just barely peeking through the trees uh, on the, the left hand side of, of the photo. Is is the existing office building on the site? Next slide, please. In this image, we're actually standing in front of um, the development at Capitol Square, looking south uh, across G Street, and you can see the view, the predominant view out of those uh, existing houses, um, is toward the the recreation fields of Jefferson. Uh, the existing warehouse structure that exists there, you can see it covered in ivy on that north side of the building, um, and Jefferson Middle School Academy off in the distance there on the left side of the image. Next slide, please. Um, here we see 9th Street, which I think all will agree is, is less than an ideal pedestrian condition. Um, you'll see later on in, in the presentation of our proposed design, uh, the improvements that uh, we're proposing for 9th Street, which greatly increases the amount and quality of pedestrian space uh, on 9th Street as you move north and south uh, along the edge of the site. Next slide, please. And then finally, uh, for the existing conditions, we have a photo here standing um, in front of the wharf, looking back toward the existing uh, suburban style office building uh, that exists on the site. Um, the, the existing office building um, was built at a time when suburban style buildings were being built in urban conditions and the existing building um, does not support the urban condition with activation of the street fronts. And you'll see later on the way that our proposed design uh, works uh, much more appropriately for this vibrant urban condition uh, that we have existing in Southwest DC. Next slide, please. This is a quick overview diagram of some of the major points that have shaped our approach to the design in addition to that existing context. Um, you can see here that you know, clearly with the triangular shape of the site and the approaches, there are three major corners that will be uh, highly visible. Um, in addition, there are three major faces of this site and this building that each have to address very unique and nuanced um, context and and our design we work very very hard to to have the the building design um, address those uh, appropriately uh, for the existing context uh, next slide please 
The massing view here uh, illustrates the way that we've sculpted the, the 3D configuration of the building to address those different contextual conditions that we just saw in images uh, and referred to in that diagram. Uh, the relationship of the building along Main Avenue addressing uh, the, the height and massing and scale general configuration of the buildings at the wharf. Um, the breaks in the building that are intentionally composed to scale the building appropriately to each of its frontages, as well as break down the overall length of any individual component of the building. And then, of course, the stepping of the building in two locations, uh, most significantly down from Main Avenue to G Street um, to address that existing context uh, of town square development to the north. And then also the stepping of a single story as we move uh, southeast along Main Avenue toward Jefferson Middle School and deeper into the, the neighborhood of the wharf in Southwest DC. Next slide, please. The section here um, just further illustrates the condition of the building as it relates to the context. Uh, you're moving in a north south direction primarily. You see the relationship of the height and scale of massing to Main Avenue. Um, the break in the building created by the entrance court to the or entrance plaza uh, that serves the lobby of the building. Um, and then the, the 90 foot portion of the building closer to G Street and the existing 50 foot uh, um, capital square development uh, on the left side of this section. Next slide, please. Uh, the wharf has has served to really activate Main Avenue uh, as as a retail street, and our design of the building serves to really reinforce that development of, of Main Avenue as a retail street by introducing retail and activating the frontage on Main Avenue and turning the corner onto Ninth um, with that approximately twenty four thousand square feet of of retail as described by Lila earlier. Um, on the east side of the building is where all of the vehicular and loading access occurs uh, off of the proposed north-south private drive, uh, bicycle access to parking a half level down from that from the garage entry ramp um, is also located within the building. And those those service elements of the building are also conveniently located and screened, intentionally screened behind the existing warehouse structure. Uh, that exists there. So it, it really uh, diminishes the impact of any of those components on the active frontages of the building um, and, and allows us to really focus our attention on activating 9th and Main. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there is a fairly significant change in grade between Main Avenue and G Street, um, a, a full story, and uh, working with that Topography, we actually um, strategically located the lobby up a full story for a main avenue uh, access via that entry plaza that you see at the ground floor. Um, together with that green space, the lobby, um, the uh, two story uh, point access townhouses, townhouse style units at the north side of the building, and the retail that turns the corner on main, we are really activating this full length of the building. Uh, you also start to see here at the uh, the the peel back of the building from the property line at the southern end of the site, uh, which which really is part of developing that active pedestrian frontage um, along the full length of ninth. Um, at, at the southern end of the site, we peel the building back to expand that pedestrian zone, and at the northern end of the site, uh, we've made significant proposed significant changes to the street configuration to dedicate less space to vehicular. Um, paving and more space to active um, and landscaped pedestrian scale environment. You'll see that in some further exhibits. Next slide, please. This slide illustrates um, the distribution of the proposed 75 IZ units uh, and, and really just highlights that we are, we are proposing that those are distributed around all frontages of the building um, and generally through all of the levels of the building uh, short of the top three levels. Uh, next slide, please. The uh, penthouse level of building has communal recreation space as well as units. Uh, the active uh, indoor and outdoor communal recreation spaces are intentionally biased to the most active corner of the site adjacent and across from the wharf uh, and intentionally separated from both the school, Jefferson Field and Capitol Square development to the north. Next slide, please. 
And the roof plan here illustrates uh, that we are uh, fully compliant with all of the setback requirements um, and, and illustrates the height components of each of the building, each of the, the elements on, to, on the roof of this building. Next slide, please. Um, we'll quickly move around the site here and the renderings uh, showing the architectural development uh, beyond massing and we'll, we'll go in kind of a similar pattern to the, the way we moved around for the existing context uh, photos. Here, I'm um, standing east of set or flying east of 7th Street rather and looking back toward the site. You see the way that we've composed the building uh, uh, almost to develop a streetscape type character of multiple buildings, multiple scales, um, each that address the unique conditions uh, of the context of the site. The building uh, you also see here really serves to define uh, the open space established uh, and existing at Jefferson Recreation Field and create a backdrop. And you see uh, indications here of art on the building. Uh, art is a significant part of uh, the developers kind of ethos and approach to development. And so the building serves to create um, essentially a, a kind of canvas for the development of that art. Uh, that will be visible from multiple points around the site. Next slide, please. This image uh, reinforces a lot of the same things that we've already talked about, including the step down in massing and scale. Uh, but what you start to see more distinctly here is the definition of unique elements and the scale of the elements on the building on the north uh, G Street wing of the building as compared to Main Avenue and how those components uh, like the expression of, of bay balconies, bays um, and uh, you know the point access two story base of the building with the units there start to scale the building more toward the residential scale of the development to the north while the Main Avenue wing really starts to work within the context of, of the wharf, the existing wharf structures, um, and the corner of the building working in dialogue with that uh, existing wharf building across the street to create almost a gateway uh, or a threshold uh, to this section of Southwest DC. Next slide, please. Uh, th this illustrates similar things. Um, and I think a key element here is the introduction of the, the South facing court um, elevated plaza, I would say, uh, that serves as a many space for the units. Uh, this, you know, the introduction of that element uh, breaks up the street wall uh, of the, the building and creates these uh, elements that the, the tower kind of elements of the expression of the main avenue wing of the building uh, that work in conjunction with the scale of what we see in a lot of the buildings uh, existing at the wharf. And then as similar as as inspired by the diagram shown earlier, you see the unique kind of condition created by the corners of the building um, at each of those primary corners um, on the site. Next slide, please. Again, here you see those same conditions. Uh, what this illustrates again uh, and reinforces is the, the view um, from the existing uh, development to the north, south, across the open space of the field. We also see, again, that relationship between town square towers and the similar scale three-story developments to the north, um, and that the, the unique condition of that corner, uh, the southeast corner of the building. Next slide, please. And quickly dropping down uh, to a pedestrian level to give you a sense of the experience of the building, um, you know, from the street level here, you're standing on G Street. Um, you can tell um, uh, based on the existing photos that we showed previously, we've intentionally omitted some trees here. So you get a sense of what the building looks like. Um, and again, this shows that development of the scale of the building, the development of kind of multiple articulations, creating a streetscape like feel for the building. Next slide, please. Here, the key thing to, to, to see is that the, the scale of the elements on that G Street wing of the building are really scaled toward the, the residential scale development to the north. You have the two-story point access units, um, and then the, uh, the, the prevalence of bays uh, creating, activating the frontage overlooking Banneker, and then you, the step and scale to, to match what we see across at the wharf. Next slide, please. And here is that view from Main Avenue uh, 
showing you know, really, I think what this successfully shows is the, the breakdown and the overall scale of the building. You see, rather than a single building, you tend to read this building uh, as multiple masses on the site, um, each with a different articulation and scale addressing its unique context. Next slide. And again, focused on the main avenue frontage, you can really see the activation of that retail base of the building in dialogue with what we see across the street uh, at the wharf um, and the activation, you know, the, the breakdown and scale of the building with that court uh, elevated terrace um, between the two main masses on Main Avenue. Next slide. And just quickly, uh, for illustrative purposes, showing the building inserted into those existing context photos for scale purposes, you see the building in the background uh, on the right hand side of the image and the on the left hand side is the existing condition. Uh, you can see how the building steps down and creates that defined uh, edge for Jefferson Field. Next slide. Here you see the building. Uh, as viewed underneath the existing dense tree canopy on G Street, um, you know, illustrating you know, the activation of that frontage and, and really, to some degree, the limited view of the building that you do get for the much of the length of G Street. Next slide. And here on the left, you see that existing pedestrian, uh, less than ideal pedestrian condition on 9th Street and the improvements that we're proposing with the significant expansion uh, of that pedestrian environment uh, with the reconfiguration at the intersection of 9th and G and the introduction of significant landscaping, uh, creating, uh, you know, a beautiful urban pedestrian environment along this side of our building. Next slide. And with that, we will turn the presentation over uh, to transportation. Good evening, commissioners. My name is uh, Robert Schiesel. I'm a transportation engineer uh, with Grove Slate. Uh, our comprehensive transportation review is entered into the record. So per uh, Commissioner Hood's request, I'm going I'm to stick to the highlights of this project's transportation elements. Uh, first, uh, next slide, I'm gonna start with the design of the private alley. Um, it was a little bit of a unique evolution of how the site access uh, developed for this project. Um, and that's mainly because um, the ultimate solution we, we came to, which is the private alley up on the screen, had to do three things. It had to balance um, DDOT's standards and the feedback we received from them uh, the needs of the building, especially the desire to have a tenant that can be a grocer, and feedback from the community. To help meet the DDOT standards, the main driveway is located on G Street, uh, and on a curb cut located at the DDOT minimum spacing standard of 60 feet from 9th. Um, I would note it's only able to meet that spacing standard because of the improvements, which I'll get to soon, that we're proposing along 9th Street. Second, to meet the needs of the building, we studied various ways a uh, grocery store could could get large trucks in and out of the site. Uh, the best way we found to accommodate the needs is having trucks entering on Main Avenue and exiting on G Street. So this is why there is a second access point to the alley on Main Avenue. Uh, and per DDOT's request, it will be limited to these large trucks. Um, finally, after hearing feedback from uh, the townhome community, we shifted the G Street curb cut as far west as it could go. As I said pre, like prior, it is at the minimum, meets minimum spacing standards. And we did, we went to the minimum spacing standards at the request. Um, in our conversations uh, with the community stakeholders, uh, we were told of several issues, and one of them was cut through across G Street um, as, uh, as drivers were coming through the townhome community and um, shooting across G Street straight into this driveway. And based on that feedback, uh, we shifted that driveway as far west as it could go. Next slide. Uh, the private alley will also include uh, signing, marking, other operational measures to enforce this site access plan, because it is a little unique. Um, and, and all of these measures will have the goal of ensuring that only the large grocer trucks used to curb cut on Main Avenue, nobody goes the wrong way, um, and we don't create um, any safety issues at the Main Avenue side uh, in that curb cut. We're going to be working with DDOT um, on these measures um, all the way through the final public space process. Next slide. Uh, I think another major um, unique 
aspect of this project, especially for Grove Slade, was very early on. Jira Lynch came to us and asked us to develop or think outside the box and whatever transportation uh, transportation improvements that could be potential benefits uh, for the project. Um, something that that normally would it be um, considered in a CTR or part of a traditional mitigation package for a project of this size. So we did. Um, after putting our pencils down, coming up with a few alternatives, um, we pre presented some ideas to the community. We evolved that. We sent out the DDOT to their review, got their feedback, and we pushed it along a little bit further. And what you see on this screen is the, um, the result. These improvements are basically on 9th Street between G Street and Main Avenue. They include the removal of unnecessary pavement that's needed for vehicular traffic, including some of the higher speed uh, slip turn lanes, and basically repurposes all that room with bicycle lanes and a significant increase in the amount of room dedicated for pedestrians. There's also some relocationing and shortening of some crosswalks that will, that will help pedestrian flow and safety across 9th Street. Um, one of the driving influences of this concept um, was the feedback we received from the ANC. Um, they informed us of issues when the office building was in um, operation about double parking in front of the lobby on 9th Street. So uh, one of the things that this we adjusted in this plan was the incorporation of a pickup drop bus zone in front of this building's lobby. Uh, next slide. Um, some of the changes can be seen on a side by side with the existing aerial and the and and the uh, proposed changes. Most of this, if you look around on the southwest corner. Of 19th Street, see both sides, um, the removal of those little special lanes for the turns, southbound and northbound, and how we're able to pull the resulting curb out to put at that southwest corner. You can see on the on the image um, some nice landscaping that Brett showed you an image before. Um, we also analyzed all these improvements technically in our comprehensive transportation review. Um, the analysis result basically said that all the safety and multimodal benefits that come by these improvements are at minimal cost for vehicular capacity. Next slide. Um, the mitigations recommended in our CTR <laughs> consist of uh, two things, the loading management plan and a transportation demand management plan. Uh, the loading management plan is a set of measures that will make the private alley function as uh, designed, as, as I said before, helping prevent conflicts between the loading vehicles, the trash trucks, and the cars accessing the parking garage. Transportation demand management plan is a set of measures to help minimize the vehicular chip generated by the project. What's in front of you is just some of the measures on these plans. Uh, the full and comprehensive lists are in our report. Next slide. Um, over the course of the project, uh, we met with DDOT multiple times. Uh, we reviewed the access. Uh, we coordinated the improvements I just showed about 9th Street, and we also um, discussed and agreed to our methodologies and scope of our of our transportation analysis. Um, and we look forward. Uh, to continue coordination with, with DDOT as we, as we do things like um, get to the final design, a lot of these elements of public space. Regarding our staff report, uh, the applicant is, agrees to accept all the DDOT requests uh, noted, noted on this slide. Um, and I think and before, before I end my testimony, I do want to uh, say, you know, reiterate what some of my colleagues have said tonight about how uh, a lot of the um, transportation plan over the life of the project did evolve in response to the concerns we heard and how it really is unique on the project to have um, uh, the applicant, Jire Lynch, task us with being creative and thinking out the box all the way very much in the beginning. I, I can really say that because of this project and those improvements, there would be a measurable improvement to the pedestrian and bicycle access adjacent to the development. So thanks for listening. Uh, I look forward to any questions you have. Um, and now I'll pass the presentation to Shane Deppin. Thanks, Rob. Um, Mr. Young, can we move on to the next slide, please? Good afternoon, commissioners. It's, it's good to see you. Uh, my testimony um, this afternoon will we'll finish up the presentation with uh, an application of the standard of review uh, that's necessary for uh, a plan unit to plan unit development and related map amendment. Um, as the commission knows, under the PUD standard of review uh, in, in subtitle X of the regulations, the commission essentially has to uh, look at the project and make three determinations. First, uh, you have to approach the, the comprehensive plan and make a determination that the project is not inconsistent uh, with the comprehensive plan. Uh, you also have to determine that the project does not uh, result in any unacceptable impacts, uh, but instead that those impacts need to be favorable, capable of being mitigated or acceptable given the quality of the public benefits being offered. Uh, third, uh, the public benefits and amenities offered in the project have to be not inconsistent with the comprehensive plan. Uh, the regulations say that the zoning commission shall judge 
balance and reconcile the relative value of the PUD benefit package, the degree of development incentives being requested, and any potential adverse effects of the project. Next slide. <clears throat> With respect to the comprehensive plan, as the commission knows uh, full well that, that the, com the comprehensive plan is made up of uh, many, many policies, some of which may be uh, at times in competition with one another. Uh, and so as we apply the, the comprehensive plan evaluation, uh, we have to at least recognize uh, where potential inconsistencies exist uh, and where policies are potentially at conflict with one another. Uh, there's a balancing test that's done in order to make an overall determination that the project is not inconsistent with the comp plan when read as a whole. Next slide. Mr. Chairman, you mentioned at the outset that uh, the commission now uh, you know, looks at racial equity. Uh, and the, as you know, the comprehensive plan puts a keen focus on equity and racial equity in particular. Uh, the framework element talks about how equity is both an outcome and a process. And you heard at the beginning of our presentation, uh, Lila and Malcolm mentioned about the extensive community outreach uh, that took place, not only with the ANC, but also uh, the, uh, the Capitol Square condominium uh, uh, co-op development to the north, uh, the ANC subcommittee, uh, the town square condos uh, on the east side of 7th Street uh, and other stakeholders. Uh, as a result of that, it was more than 50 meetings. Though the input provided by those 50 meetings directly informed uh, the outcome of this project, project that was presented to you today. In addition to the community outreach process uh, informing the project, uh, when we approached the comprehensive plan evaluation, it was also informed uh, by a large amount of data, disaggregated data that's available uh, at the Office of Planning's website, DC Public Schools, the uh, Housing Equity Report, uh, and other district policies set forth, housing policies set forth in the Comprehensive Plan, the Southwest Neighborhood Plan. Um, all of that was taken into account uh, as part of our uh, Comprehensive Plan uh, evaluation. Again, approached through a racial equity lens. Next slide. Uh, this just shows kind of an evolution of the future uh, land use map uh, showing the uh, the site. They are directly across the street uh, from the wharf. The reason why we're showing this is that uh, the current future land use map designation of the site, medium density commercial, dates back to 2002. Um, the 2002 comprehensive plan amendments changed the site from low density commercial to medium density commercial. Um, actually, I'm sorry, in 2002 it was low density commercial. In 2006, uh, when the DC Council passed the 2006 amendments to the comprehensive plan, um, to reflect uh, changes uh, actually in the AWI framework element, framework plan, um, it up the site to medium density commercial. You can see on the middle map there, uh, the change to the designation on the site to medium commercial. At the same time, that's when you saw the change in the wharf uh, to high density commercial, high density uh, residential. Again, all of it recommended in the AWI framework plan. Uh, in 2016, uh, the, the commission adopted the 2016 zoning regulations. And at that time, the site was simply renamed from W1 to MU12. It was, I think there was a comment in the record that um, the adoption of ZR16 um, or the 2021 comprehensive plan actually rezoned the site. Uh, it was simply renamed to MU12. Um, and there you see in the on the right image, the 2021 recently adopted future land use map showing the site still medium density commercial. And again, that dates back to 2006. Next slide. And so if we look at consistency with the future land use map, um, uh, one could argue that the existing MU12 uh, zone, which is a low density commercial zone, um, is inconsistent with the current medium density commercial designation on the flum. Um, if you look at the framework element, the description of medium density commercial talks about how buildings are larger and are taller uh, than those in moderate density commercial areas. And it specifically identifies MU8 and MU10 as zones that are generally considered to be consistent with the current designation. Um, with respect to MU10, that was the, the initial zone that we had pursued in the initial application. Typical matter of right densities, and as you know, the framework element descriptions for the flum categories now are described in terms of density. No longer height, no longer stories, it's density. Um, a typical matter of right density for the MU10 zone is a 6FAR with more allowed through IZ and a PUD, and through a PUD, under the MU10 zone, you can get up to 8.64 FAR. Next slide. And so even though we moved uh, to the MU9 zone in response in order to accommodate comments around the scale and height of the project uh, relative to the townhomes to the north, um, 
while we moved to the MU9 zone, we did not do that in order to gain additional density. Um, what we did, we did that in order to be able to move the massing, to move the height of the project down to the south towards the higher scale development of the wharf. And so, as I said, under an MU10 PUD, you can get up to 8.64 FAR. Uh, we are well within the density at 7.99 FAR. We were well within the density that is contemplated under the comprehensive plan for a medium density commercial PUD. Next slide. Looking at the generalized policy map, the site is designated as a neighborhood conservation area. Uh, and as been stated in, in previous cases and in, in previous zoning commission orders, the neighborhood <laughs> conservation area designation on the policy map is not intended to be interpreted the same way across the entire city. It really does stress uh, a contextual evaluation of what's going around uh, in the context for the entire site. And so see, you can hear, you can see here that we are designated neighborhood conservation area. We take some guidance from the small area plan, which we'll take a look at, but also the wharf is across the street. And I know that there were some comments about how the building is too related, too connected uh, to the wharf. And, um, and we, we in no way consider ourselves part of the wharf. Uh, but as you heard, as the design of the project evolved and the massing and the height was pushed down uh, to the wharf, the reason that was done is because we were taking into account the context of the entire site. We were relating to the context of the wharf on the south, higher scale development, uh, and able to depress the height down to 90 feet on the north in response to the townhomes on the north side of G Street. Next slide. And so again, we get some information from the Southwest Neighborhood Plan uh, that really sort of highlights uh, the juxtaposition in scale that you see throughout the Southwest neighborhood. It talks about uh, this relationship of high rise right next to low rise buildings. Uh, it talks about how it's an eclectic mix of high and low density uh, residential uh, housing typologies that really give the character, a unique character to the area. Um, it talks about how buildings in Southwest are typically less than four stories and higher than eight stories. And then the existing zoning throughout the area oftentimes does not let um, development developments maintain that juxtaposition in heights. And so with the with the proposed MU9 zone, being able to push the height down to the wharf, we're able to propose varying heights uh, in response to the surrounding context. Next slide. And so again, you can see that if you look at the context of the entire site, uh, which is uh, which is uh, referred to in the framework element, uh, if you look at the density that's proposed uh, informed by the future land use map, and you look how the project has evolved in response to comments in the surrounding context, I believe that it's not inconsistent with the, with the policy map. Next slide. Uh, we'll start looking at the, the commission's published racial equity tool. As you know, it's a, it's a two part tool. Uh, the first part suggesting a commentary and evaluation of the, the various citywide and area elements of the comp plan. That's already in the record. Uh, next slide. Uh, so I won't go into any detail here. It is, there's a thorough evaluation in, uh, on the comprehensive plan policies in the record. Uh, but I'll just note here that listed before you uh, are the area element policies that uh, we believe the project will substantially advance. Next slide. This is a listing of all the policies that uh, we've identified as being applicable to the project and also will be substantially advanced by the project. Next slide. And then the second part of the commission's racial equity tool asks a series of specific questions about direct displacement, housing, physical, what are going to be the impacts of the project? Uh, what will be the changes to access to opportunity? And so uh, what we've done uh, to satisfy this aspect of the racial equity tool, next slide, is we put the project through an evaluation of, of, a, of a number of equitable development indicators. Again, this is in the record, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but uh, we addressed displacement uh, in this equitable development evaluation. Uh, not only just direct displacement, but also the three types of displacement that are talked about in the comprehensive plan. Physical displacement, uh, which is direct displacement. Economic displacement that looks at uh, housing cost increases as a result of, um, uh, of a pot potential development. And what this project does to help offset the potential for economic uh, displacement uh, with the 15% affordable housing proffer. Uh, and also cultural displacement. Malcolm mentioned about how public art is really part of Jira Lynch's ethos when they approach every single project. And with the public, with the public art proffer uh, and the community involvement that um, uh, will be will take place uh, in developing that public art, uh, we do that. That goes directly to cultural displacement. Uh, next slide. With respect to housing, uh, if you look at the various district housing goals that are applicable to uh, this particular planning area, starting with the housing capital report, um, the project will provide approximately 498. 
uh, new housing units, uh, of which approximately 72 will be set aside as, as IZ units. If you look at the goals of the housing equity report, that, that approximately 498 units represents about 6.3% of the overall overarching housing goal for this planning area. The equity report actually shows, sets a, an affordable housing goal for this planning area of 850 units, but shows that even with pipeline projects uh, that were in the pipeline during the development of the equity report, this planning area was already on track to exceed the 850 affordable housing unit goal. That doesn't include several other design review cases that have, that'll have IZ in them as well as other PUDs that have been already approved by the commission. And so the 75 affordable housing units that'll be in this project uh, represents about 8.8% uh, of the goal set forth by the equity goal. So it's just gonna even further exceed the goal that's set forth uh, by the equity report. The, the comprehensive plan housing element sets a 15% affordable housing goal uh, for each planning area, meaning of all the housing uh, units within each planning area, the comprehensive plan wants to see 15% of those housing units set aside as dedicated affordable housing. The chart that's on the right, the lower right there is from the housing element, and it shows that the um, this particular planning area is already at 22% affordable. And so again, uh, the 15% affordable units for this project is just a net add uh, to exceeding the comprehensive plan housing element goal. And again, the Southwest Neighborhood Plan talks about uh, maintaining the 19% subsidized units uh, in the in the Southwest area by having projects exceed IZ targets. This project does far exceed IZ targets. Not only that is the Southwest Neighborhood Plan talks about you can exceed IZ targets in terms of square footage, or you can do less square footage with larger units. This project's providing more square footage, and it's also devoting every single three bedroom unit in the project to IZ. Next slide. These next couple of slides just go through the, the remainder of the, the equitable development indicators uh, in terms of what they are and how the project uh, goes towards each one. So uh, they're there for the commission's uh, review. They're also in the record. Next slide. And next slide. So looking at the small area plan, there's been a lot of comments in the record about the consistency of the project with the small area plan. And just uh, the text that's before you here is taken from the framework element. And I wanted to just kind of note it uh, because it was kind of a significant change in the framework element during the development of the comp plan, uh, because it talks about the relationship, it clarifies the relationship of a small area plan to the larger policy document of the comprehensive plan, talking about how a small area plan provides supplemental guidance to the commission, and it does so only to the extent that it does not conflict with the comp plan, and that it's not binding on the commission unless it is incorporated into the comp plan through a DC Council Act. This, the Southwest Neighborhood Plan has been um, incorporated into uh, as a result of this latest round of the 2021 amendments. And so the recommendations of the Southwest Neighborhood Plan have been brought into uh, the comprehensive plan. Next slide. The, the neighborhood plan is set, the recommendations are set up around a number of, of overarching concepts and they're, they're there in the green text there. Uh, and this is just the list of Southwest neighborhood plan recommendations uh, that are applicable to the project and that are substantially advanced by the project. Under no circumstance did, were we able to find any instance where the project is directly inconsistent with a recommendation of the Southwest neighborhood plan. Next slide. There are a number of design principles uh, in the modernist gem concept of the neighborhood plan that I'll quickly go through. The first one, encouraging a mix of building heights. Again, going to that, uh, the recommendations and the comments in the neighborhood plan, talking about how there's that juxtaposition, that unique uh, difference in scale between low rise right next to high rise. Uh, and so, as Brett mentioned, and you can see here in the diagram and some of the images there, you can see some of those examples of that difference in scale that's unique to Southwest. Next slide. As Brett talked about how the building sort of took shape over the course of the process and how uh, as a result of being able to go to the MU9 zone, we can push the height uh, down to the higher scale development of the wharf and bring the north block of the building down to uh, 90 feet, creating that relationship of 90 feet across the street from the 50 foot townhomes, which is exactly the relationship that occurs elsewhere in Southwest, including on the other side of Jefferson uh, recreation fields. Next slide. Um, achieving design excellence, uh, Malcolm talked about how the project is going to stand the test of time. Uh, and part of that is because of the high quality materials that are being proposed for the project. Next slide. 
Uh, Brett talked about variation in the massing. Uh, Malcolm talked about how the massing and how it evolves sets the baseline uh, for how the design of the project sort of uh, uh, took its form as it's in front of you today. Uh, but also additional variation in the project is achieved through the application of different uh, materials around the project to make it read more like uh, multiple buildings as, a, as opposed to one massive block. Next slide. Uh, we have a lot of enhancements in green space around the perimeter consistent with the uh, the modernist gem uh, principle number four in the in the neighborhood plan, particularly along 9th Street. Next slide. Uh, it's a lead platinum building, uh, and so it's going to incorporate a number of sustainable building uh, features. Next slide. Uh, parking has been uh, parking and loading has been uh, tucked along the east side uh, of the building along the private alley, and so it's not going to detract from any of the 9th Street and, and Main Avenue uh, street facing facades. Uh, it won't be impactful to the pedestrian circulation around the site. Next slide. Uh, and then the ground floor, particularly down at the corner of Main and, and 9th Street, where uh, it's directly across from the wharf, as Brett mentioned, the wharf has really transformed Main Avenue uh, into a, a retail corridor. Uh, and so um, the the storefront design at the base of the building along Main Avenue and along in the southern portion of 9th Street will have maximum transparency, really activating that, that pedestrian uh, realm along Main Avenue. And then as you move north, as Brett mentioned, uh, you have a number of uh, direct walkout units uh, on the north block of the building that sort of like re reduce the uh, sort of the vitality, the, the, the activity uh, at the ground floor, kind of creating a quieter presence for, presence for the building in relation to the moderate density residential to the north. Next slide. Um, we've already talked about the number of uh, connectivity improvements. It's going to be less vehicular paving uh, and more pedestrian and bicycle circulation uh, area around the site. Next slide. Of course, you know, we need to identify comp planning consistencies. And, and as we were doing our thorough analysis of the comp plan, we did identify a few policies that really focus on diversification of office options, um, uh, reuse before uh, before demolition. Um, and so we, we believe that those particular policies that would uh, support reuse of the existing office building are far outweighed by uh, the housing effort report um, goals and the recommendations uh, for housing and affordable housing, uh, the proposed amount of affordable housing that's in the project, the sustainability benefits of the project, uh, and a number of the policies that are listed there. Next slide. Um, just looking finally at the, the PUD balancing test, again, as the commission knows, uh, you have to judge, balance, and reconcile the benefits, the impacts, um, and the, um, the potential um, uh, or the, the requested development incentives. And so next slide. This just goes through a list of the public benefits organized around the categories of public benefits that are in the regulations. Next slide. And it's, so, and it's that substantial package of public benefits that we balance with the development incentives that are being requested. We're requesting a, uh, a map amendment, a PUD related map amendment from MU12 to MU9. As a result of the map amendment, there is a gain of approximately uh, 4.99 FAR if, if compared to matter of right zoning, 4.39 if compared to what we could achieve under a PUD with the existing zoning. And there's a, there's a height increase of, approx of 70 to 80 feet, depending upon whether you're comparing to matter of right or PUD. The only others, Technical zoning flexibility that's being requested in this project is some minor side yard flexibility along the east and west sides of the building. Next slide. And then we and then we take a look at potential impacts, and and this is an assessment of potential impacts of the project organized according to the comprehensive plan citywide elements. Um, overall, I won't go through this in in detail. Overall, we find the impacts of the project to be favorable. Uh, some capable of being mitigated, specifically with respect to transportation. Next slide. There are a couple categories where there are impacts. This is this is all favorable in terms of housing, environmental impacts, and economic development. Next slide. There were a couple categories of, of impacts where we believe that um, the impacts would be acceptable given the quality of public benefits um, of the project. Uh, those fall in the categories of parks and open space, uh, urban design in terms of the change in scale uh, of, of the proposed building uh, to the north and to the south. Uh, compared to what's currently on the on the site. But again, we believe that these impacts are acceptable given the high quality uh, and number of public benefits being offered. Next slide. And next slide. 
This is just a list of the benefits and amenities on the left and the incentives and potential adverse effects uh, of the project. And again, uh, we believe that the benefits and amenities balance, uh, if not far away, uh, the incentives and potential and consistent and potential adverse effects of the project. Next slide. This just goes through the, uh, the purposes of the zoning act and, and shows how the project is also consistent with the overall purposes of the zoning act. Next slide. Uh, in conclusion, uh, I believe that the, the project is not inconsistent with the comprehensive plan when viewed uh, as a whole. Uh, and that any potential inconsistencies related to policies about the, the reuse of the existing office building are far outweighed by the consistency with the future land use map and the generalized policy map, as well as the citywide and area elements of the comp plan and the Southwest neighborhood plan. Um, I believe, as I've mentioned, all of the impacts I believe are favorable, capable of being mitigated uh, and acceptable. And that the substantial public benefits are directly uh, related to and not inconsistent with uh, the comprehensive plan. With that, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, thank you for your time. Uh, I'll hand it over to Lila for closing. That, that concludes our presentation on direct. Okay, I want to thank you for thank you. your presentation. I'm getting feedback, so I guess you're all, all in the same room. Uh, but anyway, uh, what I'd like to do, colleagues, is um, do eight minute rounds. Uh, and I'm doing that so we can all, because it's still fresh in some of our minds. And if we go for an hour, one person go an hour or two, then by the time we get there. So let's do eight minute rounds. I'm going to start off with saying the first, the first round is going to be eight minutes. Eight minutes. With a bit of that feedback in the second. In the second. <laughs> so the second round is going to be um, five minutes. But let's start like that. And I'm going to start with Commissioner Mayor as, as usual. I'm, I'm going to try to do it in less than eight minutes and only one round. We'll see. Um, I, my questions are, are pretty basic. I mean, I think it was a pretty thorough uh, presentation and, and uh, hit all of the important questions. Um, I do have a question about the, the existing building and its lot occupancy in comparison to this and, and not so much the percentage, but you know how how proximate it is uh, to the nearby structures. So it seems like it's it's pretty much the same distance from the Capitol Square buildings, right? Uh, Fred Swiatoka, Perkins Eastman, DC. Uh, so the existing building, uh, if you were to look at it on the site is set back farther uh, from the north property line on G Street um, than we currently have, than we have the northern extent of the proposed building. And it is farther north of Main Avenue um, in, off of the property line than our existing, primarily uh, due to the sculpting, the shape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know, I mean, I know the overall footprint, the overall is, footprint is, is to go to the south side, but how far, how, how much, Farther to the north does the building does your proposed building extend compared to the existing? Uh, I don't have those exact dimensions. I could provide an estimate, and we could clarify it in Let's see. in post here. Sorry, sorry. What, what is your estimate? Approximately twenty feet. And uh, along the uh, east side of the building, uh, what, it, it's not clear to me what the existing building, how far away that is from the school building that, I don't know, weird warehousey building that's next to it. The existing building is approximately eight feet from the eastern property line and from that eastern, uh, uh, yeah. the existing warehouse type building. Um, yeah. So our, and, the proposed and, building. Is farther than that. Yeah, and and what's the width? There, you're creating a, a private alley essentially, and so how? What's the width of that? Um, at minimum twenty feet. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, there, I mean, the reason I'm asking these things is understanding. I mean, one of the principles of of the tall buildings in Southwest is that you have the taller buildings, but then you have more land around them, and you are pulling it away at least on the east side. 
uh, and you're creating new space on the on the Ninth Street side, um, new public space on the Ninth Street side to to, and it seems like that's a, an attempt to kind of give the give the building a little more room to breathe. Um, the next question is um, the the artwork on the the east facade that that large mural. I'm I'm just trying to understand that, understand sort of the purpose of that as opposed to simply just doing um, more windows on that side. Uh, so at, at a basic level, because of the configuration, the geometry of the site as the plan layout, uh, the corridor moves north, that section of the building is not wide enough to have corridor access and units along that kind of narrow tip of the building. So that is um, behind that wall is corridor for the building um, for a significant length of it. Uh, and so this was uh, it, an opportunity we saw to introduce art on the building uh, in lieu of um, windows that would serve just the, the end of the corridor. Hmm. Okay, I, I looked at the plan. Yeah, at the plan. It seemed like it was, seemed like it was that, that much. But there was that there was that was just corridor. That was just corridor. I mean, there's a there's a unit there that's I don't know. It looks like it's maybe a quarter of the length of that face where you have the artwork is actually corridor, and the rest of it is part of a unit. That's accurate. Okay. And so you just plug, you just you 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 have a a um, an end unit that basically has two sides already with windows on it, right? Yes. So you really, you really didn't need that third side, and so instead you're putting up artwork. That's correct. It's a little, it's, it's a little unusual, but. I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna question that. Um, the my last question, believe it or not, Mr. Chairman, my last question is um, the uh, there's a slip lane that's going away on Ninth Street, uh, and it's a, a butts National Park Service property. It is within the DDOT right of way property. property. But I'm just curious yeah, just as to whether. There has been any uh, national park. You're basically going to be marrying up new green space to the adjacent park service green space, which, you know, my question is like, who's going to mow the lawn? Um, a little basic, but has there sort of contact with the park service about getting getting rid of that slip lane and what that what that could mean? There has been no. Um... Discussions with the, the National Park Service from the applicant side. When we discussed it with DDOT, um, the concept, um, it, it was discussed that it would be that would be a budding NPS land, and we thought about multiple ways it could be designed when it gets to full design. Um, right. And it needed it, it doesn't have to actually blend straight across. Um, DDOT right. was supportive of, of something that doesn't even touch the land, but obviously we would be open when we fully design it. Because if you notice, it's such a concept. There's not even we're not even showing how the sidewalk connects through on just the DDOT property yet, but it right. will. Um, so that's kind of an element TBD. Okay, you know, that's me... fine. I, I would just uh, encourage the uh, the applicant and uh, and DDOT to um, coordinate with the National Park Service. That's part of National Mall Memorial Parks. Uh, and so um, it would just be good to uh, have contact with the park or with my office. You can talk to my deputy, Tammy Stidham, um, who can put you in touch with the right people. Um, but just having some initial conversation about what could happen, I think, would be helpful. Um, otherwise, I don't have, I don't have, have, I have any other questions. Have any other. Okay. How's that, um, Mr. Chairman? Yes. All right. Um, I did a good job there. Huh? You did. Maybe we better start on eight minutes uh, from now. No, I'm just playing. Uh, I thought <laughs> we would have had more questions. We probably want to hear more from the public as well. So, uh, Commissioner Amy Moore, thank you, Commissioner May. Uh, 
All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner May finished with 30 seconds to spare. Hopefully I get those 30 seconds added to my eight minutes. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have very many questions, uh, just a few comments in general. Um, I appreciate the thorough presentation. Uh, as always, uh, Commissioner May uh, steals my thunder a lot. So, uh, but uh, just in general, I appreciate slide number 15, the urban edges nodes diagram those are always helpful so uh for any member of the public um listening or project team listening those are always great i uh, appreciated the explanation of the corner conditions that was helpful um clearly at uh lead platinum uh this project uh is generally well conceived i think um and thoroughly uh, sort of thought through and reviewed um, that I would expect from Perkins Eastman DC um, uh, in terms of the architecture, uh, you know, uh, the finish the fenestration details. I think um, look nice. I think the materiality of it all, the material selection is good. Um, um, the question, I guess, or comment that I had, a couple things. I always seem to be the commissioner that, that, that makes this comment about trash, uh, both residential trash and commercial trash. I noticed that there's a couple of building support spaces through, uh, that are identified uh, throughout the floor plans, but it seems awfully small for 498 uh, units. Um, so just may want to may give want that some additional thought. Additional. Also recognize uh, the parties or letters in office addition to this um, and Mr. Devon did a nice job in terms of at least explaining uh, affordable units. So in general, I think more housing is good. Affordable units are even better. Um, and my concern in general is just when you do that at such great height, you know, how does that impact good urban design? Um, so certainly reducing the height, you certainly compromise the number of units. Uh, I know that those uh, letters in opposition has requested Either 20, or 20 or 20 to 25%. And I understand that uh, that is a significant addition in terms of affordable units. And you listed that there are 16 uh, two bedrooms, eight three bedroom affordable units, which leaves about 50 uh, one bedroom units. Just wondered also if there if clearly maybe. Uh, Increasing the number of affordable units might not be tenable, but perhaps a readjustment in terms of. Let me let me interrupt. Let me interrupt. Let me start the clock. I don't know why we always get feedback. I don't know if anybody else is getting it, but I can hear it, and I believe others can hear it as well. So always, I hate to pick on Holland Night, but it's always somebody and they got to cut off one of those computers because we always getting feedback, and what's going to happen to us is. The public is going to say that they couldn't hear and follow the, the hearing. And we live will be back down here redoing all this. So let's see if we can find out what the issue is. They or just maybe, muted. Uh, they were not muted before. They just muted. See if okay. that works, Chairman. Let's Hood. try let's try it again. If not, I would suggest next time maybe all you all can stay at home and do it that way. So that works better for a lot of us. So, okay. I'll go ahead, Commissioner Eamon Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That seems to be uh, much better. So, uh, in terms of the mix of affordable units, uh, I also noticed that many of them were stacked four through nine. Um, you did, in general, uh, try to uh, disperse them throughout uh, the building, but just wanted a, a comment whether um, that was conceived or thought of or addressed in terms of just a broader mix. Uh, 51 bedroom units compared to 16 two bedroom and eight three bedroom. While uh, those are significant, um, I think just sort of curious about that, just crunching the numbers for every additional percentage of increase is about uh, five units. So I understand that 20% um, is just uh, not achievable or feasible, but maybe a broader mix might actually assuage some of the uh, community's concerns. Um, just, uh, just a general comment about that, if, if anybody 
to address that. Thank you, Commissioner Imamura. Um, we will take note of that comment um, and and come evaluate it or study it with the project uh, team and respond back to the zoning commission. I appreciate that. Uh, I think the comment about the modernist gem principle about the mix of building heights is is um, laudable and, and important to mention. But again, this is. Um, at significant height along uh, Main Street. And so I have concern on the north side of Main Street, creating sort of a uh, valley. Um, and so I certainly appreciate the increase in density. I think that that's important. Um, and I recognize too that a reduction in height also um, reduces the number of uh, units. And I think in general, uh, on the north and south side of the, uh, the building, um, the step down in height uh, was good. I uh, wish we could have extended that a bit more, but uh, those are generally my comments. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've got two minutes, so I yield back and uh, give those two minutes to Vice Chair Miller, if he so chooses. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, um, Commissioners um, May and Ian Memora for seating time, which I don't think I'll need. Um, and thank you to the applicants team for your presentation. Mr. Chairman, I'm thinking I'm having some connectivity problems yet again. Uh, it, let me know if I should stop uh, and I'll mute my, I mean, I'll stop the video of myself. Maybe that might help, um, but I think it's okay right now. So thank you to the applicants team for your presentation. Thank you for um, the community engagement, which you have held the uh, 25 meetings, I think you said in the last, several months. That's a lot of meetings. Um, the uh, changes that have been made as a result of comments that the ANC community uh, Office of Planning, uh, maybe zoning commissioners at set down said, uh, I appreciate the changes that have been made, the adjustments uh, to the height uh, toward, at, at, at the, um, on the G Street side. Um, but then that did result in the increase uh, up to 130 on the main avenue side, which I'll have a question about in a minute. But um, so there, there are a lot of uh, commendable um, aspects to this project. Uh, uh, the, the, I mean, 500 units of housing, uh, 75 of uh, which, almost 500, um, and 75 of which are affordable at 60% and 50% MFI, um, and the, and the, uh, the eight, eight three bedroom units, all of which are affordable. Um, uh, the three bedroom, all, eight, all the three bedroom units are affordable. That's um, an unusual aspect to a non subsidized, public subsidized project. Um, and um, there's some references in the community opposition to a 20%. Um, affordable set aside figure. Uh, um, but that I think refers in the Southwest small area plan and other place other places in law to publicly just dis public disposition sites. And this is not a public dis public site that's being disposed of. This is a, a, a private site uh, that does that is not as far as I know, asking for a subsidy. Um, so just to, sticking with the positive right now, um, I think it's very attractive. Uh, uh, all the bays and balconies, uh, I, I really like. I like the contrast between the low, the lower, and the higher. Um, the um, parts of the building. Uh, you didn't mention, I don't think, in your verbal presentation, the lead platinum. I. I there's not a lot of, uh, I, I think that Washington DC has a lot of lead. I think we may be one of the leading <laughs> lead, uh, certified levels, high levels of, uh, buildings, new buildings being built. Uh, and, and I know we had some platinum buildings, but I, I don't recall a lot, a lot, if any, that have come before us of residential high, uh, higher rise buildings, uh, and so that's very commendable. Maybe you can respond to that. Are, are there other lead platinum 
uh, multifamily buildings that have been built in the district that have come I'm aware of any that are at least platinum. Yeah, that's uh, that's and that's a that's a commitment you're making. That'll be a condition of the order. And speaking of conditions of the order, because this was a criticism, uh, I think, in some of the opposition, that the grocery store and bank retail space that you're offering in response to community requests. Are you making a commitment that, I mean, obviously the retail environment is challenging in the District of Columbia. The whole commercial market is challenging the district right now. Um, but are you making a commitment that as a condition of the order, you will include up to 6,000 square feet of grocery space and, uh, and a certain amount of bank financial services uh, space, uh, which I guess doesn't um, exist a lot in this particular neighborhood or they wouldn't be asking for it. There's certainly a lot of grocery stores and, re and banks in my neighborhood. It's, it's almost obscene that there are, and it, it isn't equitably spread out throughout the city. It is obscene, actually. I'll use that expression that there are almost, well, I'll, I'll, I, I, are you making a commitment to the conditions of grocery store uh, as part of the order? Yes, we um, are committing to a minimum of 6,000 square feet for grocery store and additional um, retail space for a branch bank. As conditions of the order. So I, I think that's important because there was opposition testimony that I've read, and I'm sure, and I don't know if we'll hear tonight, saying that this is just a hope and something you're throwing as a bone that you're going to try to do. It's an intent. You don't have a, you don't have a signed lease. You, you, we rarely, at this stage of a uh, PUD hearing, have a signed commitment of a lease. Um, uh, so, so, but the, a condition of the order is a, is a lawful requirement. And if you're not able to keep that commitment, you'll have to come back to the Zoning Commission with public input to, to, to change that use. Um, so I just think that was something that I needed to note for the record since I saw opposition testimony saying that's just a hope, it's just an intent, it's just something you threw out there to try to appease uh, opposition. It's, commit, it's, a, it's a lawful commitment that's part of the condition of the order if we get to that point of approving uh, this case in some format. Um, and so the lead platinum is also very commendable, um, and, and, a, and a good model for other projects coming forward. Um, the, uh, I, I, I would associate myself with Mr. Emore's, uh, and your, and I appreciate your response that you would consider the mix of the size of the units since we are do some of the opposition testimony is calling for more. Um, they're simultaneously calling for more affordable units and less height and density. And so uh, there's a disconnect there. Um, it's the, it's the additional height and density, especially in a non subsidized project that is paying for the, um, affordable housing that the market, uh, wouldn't normally, uh, uh, provide. So, but I would encourage you to, uh, I would associate myself with his remarks and uh, ask that you do look at that, uh, mixing, increasing the size or increasing the percentage. Um, there, 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 there's, uh, may, I don't know if you want to respond at this point. I'll have questions, I think, further after other testimony, but, you know, we have uh, testimony from uh, uh, our former friends at OAG. Uh, saying that we should be considering this in the lens of the iz plus map amendment and you went the pud route as i understand it because that's what the anc asked you to do because there's public benefits and there's more input there is there's not more there's input there isn't any public amendment uh, well there's much less public input in a map amendment uh process and less engagement about what you can do in terms of public benefits and amenities um 
needless to say, but, but regardless of that, they, they called for, they said there would be 12,000 square feet additional affordable housing if it was just an IZ plus map amendment. Do you have any response to that initially, or did you see that testimony that I just saw today? Yes, we did, and I just want to note, I noted it in my opening remarks, the project, had we just gone through a straight map amendment, the Office of Planning would have agreed to support a map amendment to MU8, which would yield less IZ through the IZ plus um, regulations than what we are proposing with the MU9 APUD, so for about 15,000 square feet more um, of IZ that we're proffering through this process that would be generated through the IZ plus rezoning. Okay, well, I, think, I appreciate that response. I see that my time is down to zero. I didn't, I didn't see the Mr. Imamora's or May's time added to mine. I don't know if I've gone way over that. So I'm going to stop Mr. Chairman and maybe have further we're questions gonna, later. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to come back. We're going to do another five minute rounds. Uh, Commissioner May and Commissioner Imamora may have thought of something as we were going along. So let me just ask my question. Can we go to, can we go to the. Uh, racial equity. I'm, I'm not going to get to traffic yet. So, Mr. Cecil, hold tight. So, I probably will be like Vice Chair Millen, go well over the eight. Um, let's let's talk about the racial equity. Um, and I think that was your second. I think it's in the. I think it's the second PowerPoint in the record. I'm not sure where it is on you all's, but. Um, and let's go to page. Let's go to where you first started talking about the uh, displacement. I think that's page 54. Is that 54? Yeah, 54. Equitable development indicators. I don't I don't necessarily think you need to put it up. I don't need to put it up, Mr. Young. I think I'm just making sure the African has it in front of them. So page 54. We talk about displacement. Displacement due to housing cost increases. Uh, well, first of all, let me back up. Well, what we had before us, so you had 50 meetings. Three meetings you had with the capital, the capital square town, townhomes. Is, is that correct? I want to make sure I captured right. I'm looking at my notes, which is dangerous. Yes, but uh, let me just clarify. We had 25 meetings with the ANC 60 subcommittee, which we understood mm -hmm. for a long period of time that that subcommittee was representing the concerns and comments and views of the immediate neighborhood and then some at some point during that process i think maybe in march or april the capital uh square homeowners association actively reached out to the applicant separate from the anc subcommittee and then we started to engage with them so and you only met with them three times right that's correct okay why did we meet <laughs> So we had 25 so we had meetings with the ANC. ANC. Subcommittee, so, yes. I'm just hearing myself. I'm hearing myself so, back every time back I say something. Time. So if y'all could just put it on mute. Uh, so we had 25 meetings with the subcommittee. Um, three meetings with the town. It looks like a lot of the issues are coming from the Capitol Square for the most part. Uh, was Capitol Square, Capitol Square was a PUD in front of the Zone Commission some years ago. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, that's one of my first cases, uh, but I, I will tell you that um, I, I just it just doesn't add up to me. We got twenty five with A and C, we had a total of fifty, and we only met with three with issues. I I just think there could be some more collaboration, uh, because it looks like you all have made some improvements, but I think three meetings was not enough. You have fifty, and and I know there are some other nuances. So you had fifty with one. And I'm already losing five minutes. So let's go to the equitable, equitable development indicators. So when I look at this, uh, Mr. Debman, and we talk about, let's just look at the family size units, dwelling units with three or more bedrooms, all three. And, and then here's the thing. I know you all are going by regulations. Maybe our regulations need to come up to the racial equity uh, analysis. Maybe something, something is off kilter. All three bedroom units and project devoted to affordable housing is 60%. What would a unit 
an estimated at 60% of MFI, well, what would one of those three units cost? And this is where I think the biggest issue in this city is because a lot of people, and especially people who look like me, can't afford that. So what would it, what, what's the cost of one? Chairman Hood, are you asking about what it would go for market or what would the IZ rent be? What would the IZ, would the IZ rent be? Yeah, uh, off the top of my head, I don't know, but I could easily pull that up. It, it's all driven or it's all dictated by the, the published DHCD uh, right. maximum rent schedule that comes out every year. And, it, and, and I think what you're getting at, it's based upon the regional medium family income. At, at, so, at, so, by HUD. I, believe me, I, I get all I that. Get all that. that. You know what? Y'all really need to come to the second rules second or something because I'm getting a whole lot of feedback. Not us, Mr. Chairman. It's we're on mute and we only have one computer on here. So maybe it's um are you on your phone or do you have another device on? I, I, run, I, run, I run. do uh, you all are not, not on mute. Yeah, we're you all are not on mute. You're not on mute. You're not on mute now. Now you're oh, on no. mute. And I don't hear anything back. We run hearings all the time, and the only time I get feedback is with uh you guys so uh so anyway um so what what i want to do i want to try to get to the bottom i realized the the iz schedule i realized what then paid is what they published when we finally got them to be able to publish but i think where the problem is and where the zoning commission get beats up beat up at and 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 at some point we got to really get to the bottom of it we got to really get to 60 percent of mfi but i do want that mr Debman. i want it market rate and I want it um, in, under IZ, under the IZ schedule. Because if we need to reach out to them, because I looked at the record, and the record feels like, unless, unless, unless I'm mis mistaken, or maybe some of these things that you all have uh, enhanced or dealt with, with the 50 meetings that you have, have been changed and the, and the community had not responded. Now, let's talk about traffic. We have the um, IZ rent schedule available. At 60% MFI, the, the current DHCD schedule says that it, the max rent for a three bedroom IZ unit would be $1,960. So guess what? The people that, that fuss with us, that's not affordable to them. And I'm not, I'm not placing that on you, but a lot of people that's not affordable to. Them. And I think what we got to start doing is finding out, and this is what this whole racial equity lens is, the way I believe it until my counsel or somebody or the public proves me wrong, we, and I'm not just picking, I'm not just picking on this African. I'm not just picking on Mr. As a matter of fact, let Mr. Lynch know every time I go in War 7, the folks are on me about what we approve. So anyway, you can take that back. I'm going to seize the moment. But anyway, $1,960, some people may think it's affordable, but the people in this area uh, don't believe that it is affordable. We got to, we got to find a nexus, and at some point, we got to deal with the disconnect. Now, let me, so, so you won't think that I'm saying everything negative about this building. I like the design of this building. I like the design, but the question is, do people look like me? Are they going to be able to get a few units and stay in this building? And I know you got um, DHCD and other entities involved, and we got to get to the bottom of it. Because at the end of the day, it's all the zoning commission. And we're following our regulations and rules. I don't know what needs to be tightened up, but eventually we, we will figure it out sooner than later. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm not going to go down that line. So whatever, we, and, and I do know uh, we're working on getting a little more than just telling us displacement due to redevelopment, no physical displacement on existing residents. Soon that's not going to be enough. We're going to need to know an analysis and I'm not sure how far we can go, but we need to know analysis. And I'm looking at this, this is kind of like, and I appreciate it now. I'm not saying I don't, but I know we can, we can, we can explain better. We can get more in detail. So people understand how we, we have achieved and got to some of these measures and how we got to these outcomes. Um, let's go back to the ANC. Ha, ha, again, all those meetings with the ANC, and it, se it seems like what I'm hearing from the applicant does not reflect what I see in the record. What I see in the record, there's still a long disconnect. What I would tell you, it's not like some of the other cases where we didn't go forward. I think there's still some room to, to try to come closer together. Um, so I, I would just encourage us to try to figure, figure out what some of the outstanding issues are, especially with the, uh, ANC 6D and, and also using our racial equity tool and expound upon this. And I, I believe you all took a good stab at it, but I don't think from what I heard in the round table, I don't think this is good enough. I think we need to, um, 
kind of explain a little more because when you talk about 60 uh 60 um 60% of the MFI talking about it's affordable affordable to whom and the people who want to live there we might need to find some kind of way to get to get units affordable to the people who are always saying that the zoning commission is not doing their part we're not exercising racial equity and my time is up and we're going to do five more uh, I'm going to be lead by example and I'll come back. Let's do uh, five minute rounds. Uh, Commissioner May, you have five more minutes if you need it. Uh, no, I don't. I mean, I think you're hitting the important points. Um, so I don't have anything else to ask. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Ema Moore. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, focus of, of your comments. Uh, Vice Chair Miller's comments, my comments about uh, the distribution of the units uh, is probably the crux of, of the conversation here. But just to circle back, um, and again, I think I, I don't want to be known as that commissioner about um, making sure that uh, the size of the trash rooms um, are appropriate, uh, especially for the 498 units, but also storage as well for 498 units that requires a lot of attic stock. Um, it doesn't seem like I, I did note the building support throughout the building, but it just doesn't seem like there's a sufficient storage uh, for a building of this size. Again, uh, it's, it's laudable that you know it is a lead platinum, um, and a lot of great uh, effort and time uh, and care has been given to all the details. Um, but as you know, most designers know that uh, storage is often um, sort of cut short there. Uh, also wanted to ask too if confirmation could be made. Again, I hate to ask this question, but uh, access to the green roof for maintenance. Um, it just seems that every time I ask that question, uh, the architects always come back and say, oh, uh, right, we'll put that in there. So please just double check that there's access for maintenance um, for the green roofs. I'm not sure why that's always forgotten. Many times it's forgotten. But Please double check that. Um, I think that uh, concludes at least uh, the comments that maybe I didn't uh, go over the first time around. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Miller. I, I'll reserve any balance of my questions for after I hear further from the public, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. So, so what I would like. Um, Ms. Matisse, is I have not seen a response to the Office of Attorney General's uh, submission. Uh, I would like for that. Um, and, and I too, I think I'm going to stop because I can go on and on about racial equity, but I do like the design. But my question to the applicant is, are people who look like me who don't make $1,960 or whatever the case, and I know some of this I would have to uh, talk to, we would have to at some point reach out to the interim director, uh, Mr. Hubbard, about this IZ, because I don't think we're getting to where we need to be. And I'm not just using this example. I mean, this this application, because I like the building. But will I will some of us who can't afford $1,960 be able to live there? That's my question there. I got a lot more about traffic. I'm sure we'll hear that. We do have some pictures that show traffic. And the reality is some of us stay out of that neighborhood for a certain amount of times a day because of the exact pictures that we've gotten. So, and I'm not faulting this, this applicant, but I, we got to start somewhere. This, we went through with this tonight and, and other cases we're gonna be doing exact, I'm gonna be doing the exact same thing. So I would like to see some of those things, Mr. Devin and Ms. Batiste uh, and, and go from there. I may have other questions at the end, but I do agree. Let's get to the public and, and let's hear from them and see if anything has changed. All right, um, let's go to any follow-up, no follow-up. Let's go to, um, a and C, Michelle and A and C six D. Ms. Kramer. Is Ms. Kramer okay? Ms. Kramer. She's become a regular. Yeah, I see you. every week. <laughs> right. Well, it's a pleasure. <laughs> Mr. Kramer, you may begin, and you can ask any questions. We're going to get to your testimony later, but any questions of what you've heard? Uh, or right. any questions? Thank, okay. thank you very much. Um, but let me say, first of all, thank you, uh, uh, Chair, Chairman Hood, for asking the question on the IZ, and we'll follow up with that 
um, uh, um, later on, on the racial equity issues. I do have um, some questions on, uh, let me um, say one of them on traffic. There was a long discussion about um, how they were solving problems essentially sort of within the site or as the site moved south. Um, uh, I haven't heard anything about what adjustments you will make to the, uh, or try to make, or try to work with, um, with uh, DDOT about to make with the intersection, which um, has been discussed as very problematic. This is, I'm sorry, the intersection at, at G and 9th. North, in other words, north, from, from, the, from the site north into that knotty intersection. I didn't hear a discussion about that. Can we, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, we are, yes, I just described them in more detail. No, my question is you, as I recall, Mr. Schissel, you described a lot about what you, how you were handling traffic essentially uh, around immediately around the site, but the problems that have been posed are the problems essentially north of the site as traffic comes into 9th and G Street and into the into the site. And I didn't hear any discussion of how you are either proposing yourself to for for your site to handle that or how you are working with DDOT to make that um, uh, adjustable adjusted. Can we go to slide eight, uh, in the applicant presentation uh, that the one that shows a side by side. Um, there's a there's numerous changes to the intersection. Um, um, the northbound um, right turn from 9th, 9th to G Street is uh, getting narrowed, um, reducing the amount of pavement um, so it is not a, a more of a suburban style design. Similarly, the southbound right turn off the interstate ramp up to L'Enfant is also being eliminated and turned into a more traditional right turn lane. Um, that um, will greatly decrease speed around that corner coming off the interstate. Overall, the amount of asphalt that exists between the two curbs on 9th Street is shrinking. Um, it, it's organizing it all uh, better, to, and it's um, end result. Um, we're able to fit in a lot more room for pedestrians and bicycles with ideally slower speeds for, for all cars traveling through the intersection. Uh, additionally, um, the group of um, the crosswalks that are used to get pedestrians through this area are getting reorganized and shortened. Um, right now, the crosswalk, um, there is not a crosswalk at that intersection. Um, it's kind of just, I uh, was at 50 feet further south, somewhat mid block. Uh, we're shifting that up um, so that it aligns in the traditional spot uh, normally where, where um, the approach in a crosswalk would be. Um, all those items, uh, the reduction in speed and the relocation of the crosswalk are there to um, increase multimodal safety um, and even um, go further, uh, crash severity. Uh, I, I could go into more detail on this. Uh, right now, the 9th Street and the, the I-395 off-ramp and at stop signs, they have to take turns uh, as they progress down. It's a very um, unorthodox configuration. It's probably not something that would get built today. Um, we're we're Looking at not just removing those higher speed turns and slowing traffic down, but the relocation of the crosswalk is designed as a safety improvement. Um, if you think about the distance from the stop sign where somebody is accelerating to where they pass that crosswalk, the idea of moving it closer would greatly reduce crash severity. If you think of the speed as the, the speed of a driver as it hits the crosswalk across 9th Street um, will be greatly decreased with this change. Could be literally a matter of life and death. It, it's one of the things we're trying to do is combine the, the locations of where the flow is and, and the reductions in speed that we're aiming to get to not only decrease uh, crash rate, but crash severity. Um, in addition, um, uh, it's, it's discussed in our CTR. We've explored that a potential long-term solution could be the installation of a traffic signal here. Like I said, the two southbound flows currently take turns. Uh, you could do the same thing in a different way with the green light, red light situation, take turns in a more formal way. Uh, we explored that. One of the issues we have here is that uh, Jire Lynch asked us, you know, what can we commit to as a benefit? Um, going down that path is not something to be committed to because of the presence of the interstate ramp. It means that we requires more extensive approval process that has to involve the Federal Highway Administration. 
So we didn't want to commit to something that we couldn't commit to as a benefit. Uh, but it is discussed and analyzed in the, 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 our, our traffic study. There's an analysis of it, and it shows a, a proof of concept of the idea um, that, that hopefully can get the ball rolling towards something and, and, the, and what the applicant is doing with these reduction in lanes, room for vehicles, and the maneuvering of the crosswalks does uh, fit perfectly as, as the initial phase of something that we're, we're down the road, there could be a traffic signal at that spot. Thank you. Um, as long as I'm, I'm on traffic, uh, just a clarification. Did you, uh, did, did someone say maybe Mr. Schissel or Mr. Um, uh, Shotoka, did you, um, say that the both re requests for the median strip uh, for the, uh, curb cuts have been approved. That's, that's a done deal. Concept approval has been. Granted, and I believe Commissioner Lightman was part of those discussions with the public space. Committee. She was part of the discussions. What I'm asking is what the level of commitment is now, whether those curb cuts are, are going to happen no matter what. That's what I'd like to know for the record. Concept approval has been granted for both curb cuts. For the, for the move of the curb cut westward on, on G street. The specific location. Has not and specific design has not been approved, but the two curb cuts in the general location on G Street and Main Avenue have been granted concept. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. The um, I I hear that the um, that there's a let me let me say it differently. Um, You talked about the break of the two buildings, and I think this is my question is mostly for the com the community to understand what this what this building is. Could you um, describe the portions of the what the break is in the middle? It's hard to read uh, the there and it's a kind of measure of the porosity of the building. the The drawings look like there is a um, there's a full open to the sky piece on Ninth Street between at sort of at the at the main entrance, the lobby to the building, but that's not really a that doesn't really go through. In fact, when you look at the the back of the building, the faces uh, faces the uh, the the Jefferson um, playing fields. It's basically a solid building. Could you just describe for the record what that means? We and we that would be helpful. So the the design um, it, um, well, I hope I have the wrong one. Try to find the appropriate slide to speak to that. Um, can you pull up slide twenty four in the presentation, please? Aerial view from Northwest. So what you see in the middle of the block um, is that break in the building um, length that we described in the presentation. This is that that. What we've described as an entry plaza is an open to sky break in the building from that entry level uh, up to sky. Um, it is not a through break from 9th Street to the north south private drive. Uh, this was introduced as a as as a as a design tool to break up the length of the building, but these are still this is still a single connected building. It was the goal is to reduce the scale of the overall elements and pieces of the building. That's fine. That's exactly what I wanted you to um to clarify for me. That's that's helpful. Uh another question for um uh Ms. Baddies. Um I'm not sure that I understand what the level of commitment is for the 
grocer and the uh, bank. Um, what type of, first of all, what what type of grocer are you looking for in terms of price points and who what 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 um, portion of the community it would serve? Any way you can describe that? Where is the actually where's the front door, which helps us understand how it's going to work? Um, and in terms of the bank, I, I, and so before I get to that, we understand you don't have, it sounds like you don't have a letter of intent. The, the community is very concerned about whether they're, whether and what they're going to get, whether they're going to get it and what they're going to get. And in terms of the bank, is this a commitment to a full service bank, not a, not a partial bank, but a full service bank? And could you please clarify what it is you are anticipating uh, in the final order that would, that would um, clarify and sort of concretize those two points, those two uh, asks. So um, the proffer from the applicant is not a specific or specific type of grocer. It is the a minimum square footage of 6,000 square feet, and that can it can be a 6,000 square foot grocer or something larger, depending on on the grocer that they're able to bring to the site. The second, uh, as it relates to the bank, it will be a full service branch. Um, and so how that looks in the order, and then I'll turn it over to Brett to show where the, the um, how the grocer will orient on the site. How that looks in the order, it would be um, under the decision section, we'd say, as part of the PUD benefits and amenities, the project will have A, B, C, and D, and C and D will include the bank, the gross, the minimum square foot footage for the grocer and the bank branch. And the way it will be written is prior to the issuance of a C of O um, for the project, they will have to demonstrate, or a C of O actually separately will be issued for the, the grocery store, um, but that will be a condition and the bank branch, but that's, those will be conditions um, to the approval of a certificate of occupancy. That's and can you, can you, is it in the order? Will it be in the order? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. And what is it for those of us who are lay people on this kind of what is the, I don't know what a 6,000 foot uh, square foot grocery or space actually looks like in terms of the kinds of vendors that you're thinking of. Is it a Foxtrot? I believe Foxtrot is one of the names, or is it a, is it a full, um, a full grocer? Can you help with that? Yes, Malcolm's gonna speak to that. Malcolm, if you can. Uh, Thank you. Um, just to, to answer as much as I can at the moment, we are in discussions with, uh, grocers for the project. Um, we, uh, just recently sent an LOI for a grocer. Um, I'm not privy to, to tell that just yet, um, because of the negotiations, but I'm, I'm pleased with where we are in that process. Um, but we are talking to several grocers, several are interested in the site, um, and they are ranging anywhere from. 6,000 square feet to above 15,000 square feet. But I don't quite know yet uh, where we'll be. The bank branch, um, also we have an interested bank and sent out an LOI uh, just this week. So we are hoping to bring both of them and they will be in the order as um, Lila mentioned. So yeah, it would probably be a letter of intent secured with each of those users prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy. If if the residential units are built first, those spaces still have to be available for the grocery store and bank branch. They can't put other uses in that space. They have to be dedicated for those uses. As Where is the, I know it sounds like a funny question. Where's the front door for this um, grocer? I'm going to ask Brett. So. Um, if it would help uh, Commissioner Kramer, we can have this slide pulled up. Uh, that's sh uh, slide number 18. It's the ground floor plan. Yeah. 
So you can see um, along Main Avenue, uh, we have that what's shown in red is the extent of the retail frontage on Main and wrapping onto 9th. Uh, there is a, a white carve out at that uh, southwest corner right at the intersection of Main and 9th. Uh, and that is where we are illustratively right now showing the primary, the main entrance for the grocer on that primary retail corner of the site. Um, as with with all retail tenants, uh, and particularly with grocers, I think the final configuration of that entrance and final location is subject to um, you know the the requirements of the retailer going in, um, and we do ask for flexibility uh, in the order on the ability to to locate those entrances um, along the frontage of Main Avenue uh, as required by the various retail spaces. And where is the bank this on the other triangle of the red triangle? Uh, Commissioner Kramer, this just shows the retail space. The actual configuration um, of the space will depend on the act the specific users. So we don't have the specific configurations um, for each use yet. I'm sorry, Miss Batiz. The gentleman to your right, what was his name? Malcolm Hate, H A I T H. Okay, he did not register to testify. So I need to give I'm him sorry. the oath. Would you please make sure that all witnesses register in the future? That's how they take their oath now. So, but I will go ahead and give it to him now. I was just checking, I could not find him. Uh, Mr. Haith, would you please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear from the testimony you've given and will give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Thank Ms. Kramer, are you still, or were you waiting? Sorry, I, I thought you were dealing with those. Okay, that, those are my questions for the moment. Thank you. Okay, uh, Michelle, um, probably gonna need you to help me with the parties. Oh, we only have one party, right? Just the just the one party, and uh, Aaron Berg is the was listed as the okay. president on the uh, application form. Okay, Aaron Berg, if you could, if you have any cross examining questions for the applicant, uh, you may begin, uh, Ms. Berg. You're still on mute. There you go. Can you hear me now? Thank you. Um, just for some procedural question, really quick um, Should I be doing my five minutes of testimony, or is this my opportunity to cross examine? This is your opportunity to cross examine everything. We'll come back to your testimony, but everything that you've heard um, uh, being presented, if you have any questions on any of it, any of our questions, anything that was presented to you, this is the time for you to do that. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, question for um, Helena Knight and Jared Lynch. Um, you list in your documents and have claimed to listen to community thoughts and concerns. What are some of the unfavorable impacts that Capitol Square and other opponents brought to you? You want to talk about the well, I can speak generally and we can explain as necessary. Um, there was concern about the height of the building as it relates to the townhouse development to the north. There was a concern about um, the traffic that would be generated by the project when um, taking into account the existing traffic from the wharf um, and, then, and and the shadows. Those were the three primary and the curb cut on G Street. But I yes, the curb cut and drive through on G Street. Well, Ms. Matisse, Ms. Matisse. I appreciate you answering that, but I think it, I think for the record, it would be better if a representative from the applicant uh, answered Ms. Berg's question. Okay. So, um, well, go ahead. Um, the height of the building, the shadows from the building, the traffic generally, and the G Street curb cut. 
Um, and that was listed in one of our the slides that I presented at the beginning of the community concerns and how we responded. And I would also just like to say, Mr. Chairman, for the record, we have we filed a full response to the um, full written response to the concerns raised by um, the Capital Square Homeowners Association, and that is filed in the record at Exhibit looking at Chris. Um, Fifty one. Uh, it's a seven page response to all of the concerns raised by the capital. Um, square homeowners. Yeah. Ms. Frazier, I, I appreciate, I mean, I'm sorry, Ms. Batiste, I appreciate uh, that, but I, I think that, um. While, while you all filed it here, I want to make sure that Ms. Berg and, and residents, um, who live in that facility, uh, and well, in, the, in that, uh, development. Uh, get more than three meetings. So that's kind of where I am. Some of this probably could be resolved and, and I'll just leave it at that, but we appreciate it. So, Ms. Berg, you, you heard what Ms. Batiste said about the exhibit. I don't know if you had a chance to review it, but continue to ask your questions. Thank you. So, you may, you noted that we met with your, you at your invitation 3 times. Uh, who set the agenda for those meetings? I believe the first outreach, I don't need, I think actually the first outreach was from the Capital Homeowners Association to Radica. But nonetheless, um, we were happy to meet with the Capital Homeowners Association. And as I, I typically do, I don't like to go into any meetings without an agenda. So since an agenda was not prepared by either the Homeowners Association or Jair Lynch, I took it upon myself to create an agenda that was circulated and shared with all the parties. Okay, and during those meetings, uh, how much time did Capitol Square have to discuss our concerns compared to the time that you spent presenting to us? I don't recall, um, I don't have the answer to that question specifically, but I don't recall any time limits on the meetings. Okay. okay, I have some questions about transportation. Um, what is your estimate for how many cars will be coming in and out of the building daily? Thanks, Rob. And I think we should do the comparison to the proposed use versus the existing office. Give me a second, I'll look it up. I don't know if we have it. We should have it in our response. No, she has daily. Okay. That's a different thing. I have a metric. Okay. okay. Um, the weekday total amount of cars in serving the site. Uh, 1,244, a net increase of 692 cars per day over the existing weeks. And that includes residential as well as um, trucks, any um, grocery or takeout, people visiting the PUDO site, the number of Lyft and Uber trips that are starting in the PUDO site. Yes. Um, does that number seem low to you? For 500 residents plus a grocery store, that would be, and now I'm hearing potentially as large as 15,000 square feet. And we know by the letters of support is uh, attracting DC residents apparently all over the city, as well as people from Arlington, as opposed uh, we can see in the letters of support that you have referenced. Our uh, the data is based on industry methodology supported by how, how DDOT. Uh, and their guidelines calculated. It's based on studies of other residential buildings, other grocers, other retail places, uh, and, and applies some data driven um, adjustments based on census data, how we expect people will travel from other studies of the area. Okay. So, uh, and give them a proximity to the map. Yeah, so that's, that's what I'm saying. Give you the giving, giving details about the area, uh, and which includes things like metro and, and mm -hmm. that have, yeah, I, I would say it's, it's the industry standard. 
And the pictures you included in your um, presentation about the streets, uh, what time of day did you come to visit the community to take those, um, those pictures and what day of the week? The majority of the pictures that were presented uh, as part of the, the testimony were taken on a Monday morning uh, between 9 a.m. Um, and 11 a.m. Did you observe traffic on different times of the day and the week, particularly evenings and weekends? Uh, I'm, I'm very familiar with the area, and, and yes, I've observed traffic and congestion in the neighborhood streets at various times. Have you can what types of things have you observed um, in terms of traffic and congestion in that particular corner, the northern corner? There's traditional traffic um, um, during the peak hours. There's also uh, a lot of traffic at nights and weekends due to the general activity, depending on what type of uh, uh, events are going on. How would Not, vehicles? Like, how would vehicles how would vehicles how would they, in the grocery store um, or residents um, get out if, for example, an accident happened there as it did uh, about two hours ago, where the police response blocked the entire curb cut on G Street? This seems to happen probably every other day. And it's the same in any urban condition. When when things happen, you know, it can disrupt the system. We design a system for. Um, you know, typical conditions, uh, not not emergency or, or different conditions, and then there's general standards, and we work with DDOT to make sure that the site access is appropriate. Uh, why did you eliminate the ingress curb cut on 9th Street? Would it make more sense to keep the ingress there as it has been for over 30 years and helps drive the traffic um, northbound instead of cutting through our neighborhood? The ingress on 9th Street? Yes. Right oh, now, there's mean, a curb cut on 9th Street. There's the existing curb that essentially works in tandem with the existing G Street cut. Um, eliminating that seemed like, a, like an easy thing for us to do because um, basically um, it's only used by cars going northbound on 9th Street and they, they, they would be able to then slip in. Instead, they would go around the corner uh, 50 to 100 feet later and turn into the G Street. So the benefits you get from removing that curb cut, it, it's not providing any redundancy or flexibility really for... Um, Cars coming in much, much to the point where it's worth it compared to just keeping the one curb cut on G Street since it's so effect functionally close by. So you have cars turning in and out simultaneously from one curb cut when one we could take some of them out of the way. Um, okay. Um, did it also allow you to move your building further north when you removed that curb cut? That I cannot answer. Um, you indicate a stoplight on 9th Street at the 395 exit ramp. Has that approved, been approved by DDOT or the highway agency? No. Um, in some of your aerial views, you show 807 Main Avenue with a height that's been proposed by Mill Creek in zoning case 2211. Has that been approved by the zoning commission or is that a false uh, representation of the current conditions and how your building would fit in? That shows the proposed building height. Okay, so it's not it's it's banking on another approval that you don't have and is uh, has not been made by the zoning commission. So you've presented documents to sort of show how your building is in line with other buildings on that side of the block, but that's not actually the conditions. So that's an inaccurate rendering at the moment. Correct. It shows the proposed building. So you say your building facing Main Avenue will have 130 feet, but that's counting from G Street. The actual height from Main Avenue will be 140 feet, excluding the penthouses, going up to over 150 feet. In your presentation, you mentioned that the wharf buildings have 130 feet height as well. There's also a slight elevation change across Main Avenue. Will 899 Main actually be higher than the wharf buildings? I will let Brett speak to how the zoning regulations require building heights to be measured. The, the height of the building uh, in, in all of our references to height throughout the package and throughout the testimony height is referenced off of a G street measuring point as is permitted per the zoning regulations. And so 130 feet is measured from G street. Um, 
and 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 that is resulting in the height of the building as it presents itself. I'm sorry, can you answer her question more directly than that? She asked if the building is going to be taller than the one across the street. Is it going to be taller? It's a yes or no yes. question. Yeah. Yes. I mean, we understand why, because we know how buildings are measured from a zoning perspective. That's that's all there is to it. You don't need to defend that. We know how it's that. Um, butters of opposition have um, indicated that there will be a tunnel effect that's specifically meant to be avoided on Main Avenue. Your presentation didn't address that directly. Can you do that now? Thanks. Uh, so we, we don't believe that there's a creation and a tunnel effect, and that is um, based off of how we have articulated the building along Main Avenue. Uh, we have not created a continuous length of building um, for, for the frontage of the, of the site. We have intentionally broken up that overall configuration to create um, breaks in the space and the massing and relief um, from the frontage along Main Avenue to um, avoid um, any potential tunnel effect that might be perceived. But the breaks in the massing are headed north, not on Main Avenue. No, there are breaks in the building on on both the 9th Street side of the building and a, and a very significant break in the building on Main Avenue. Um, regarding your letters of support that you've referenced, you referenced 21 um, in a one mile zone. How many, how are those uh, letters submitted for the most part? They were submitted through um, a electronic service uh, that I don't the It's an electronic service that the applicant used to uh, reach out to people or uh, apartment buildings within the immediate area. Because none of the residents in my community received uh, an email or a letter in the mail or anything um, asking us to visit 899main.com. Is that the site that you're talking about that solicited letters of support? Yes, and I have the, and the name and the uh, a map showing all the eight apartment buildings in the immediate area that were um, provided with the mailer about the project. Okay, so you, to confirm, you didn't send that to anyone in Capitol Square or any of the other townhouse residents. You just targeted eight apartment buildings. Well, we were we knew that the the residents in Capitol Square were aware of the project, and we have been in communication with the um, residents in Capitol Square. We were really trying to outreach to people that uh, we believe weren't aware of the project, specifically the um, retail uses that were being proposed. Okay. How many letters of support came in organically and not solicited through 899 main, main, uh, dot com? I don't know. Okay. Um, how many of those letters, uh, in those in the one mile zone, as well as that are coming from Northwest, Southeast, Arlington, Virginia, which is a significant number of them, how many of them were written by Jerry Lynch or Holland and Knight staff or friends and family members of such? So there were 38 as of today, there were 38 letters of support, 21 from residents that lived within one mile of, or worked within one mile of the project. None of the letters were, uh, those letters were written by Holland and Knight. And the, the website um, asked people to like basically identify elements or features of the project that were most significant to them. Were those visitors to the site able to click on something on that website to see the plans, to see the height, uh, to see the shadow study, the traffic study, to see anything in the case file for the Zoning Commission? I, I don't know, but they were, the case they was were. referenced. They weren't, and it's it's not referenced with any way for anyone to obtain those, all they were looking at was promises of grocery stores and banks um, and bike lanes and other things that I am also in favor of uh, in general in Southwest for the record. Um, we also um, wanted to know how did you substantiate that these letters are from people that 
our actual people. I recognize most of the names and the letters in opposition, as well as a number of names and the letter of support for area residents. How do you know that these are people that actually live in Southwest as opposed to work? Because I did notice several um, addresses of uh, commercial buildings at the wharf and including someone who used the um, address of your proposed 899 Main as their address, which has been included in your list of letters of support. Again, they're people, they provided their address and they, they in their statement said whether or not they worked or lived in proximity to the site. Okay. Um, does the zoning commission procedures allow for the auto forwarding um, of forms from a website or must legitimate letters of support be emailed to submit or directly to these commissions? Um, I believe the the zoning procedures, and I've worked on several cases, allows for um, professional outreach, um, outreach professionals to describe, get support for a project. Um, so that part is not unusual. There are plenty of projects that use professional PR communication firms. Some individuals not affiliated with our association, but happen to be tenants in homes um, in, our, in our association, people that rent their townhouse from an owner, um, started a petition that has over 200 signatures on it. Um, those individuals are able um, to know that their name and information will be public because they're entering it into a petition site. Did your website indicate to the submitters that their public and uh, personally identifiable information, including their name, address, and phone number would become public? To the zoning case file? I don't know the answer to that. It didn't. Okay. I think that's all the questions I have right now. Thank you. I probably went one over time. I forgot to start my timer. Actually, you were not on a timer. It was only oh. the commission members. <laughs> really time myself. But, well, thank you for, for letting me have that time. Okay. Thank you. And again, you we will be calling you back for your um your organization. For Procedural matter, um, because sure. um, because our party status was challenged at one point, that's why we had the two individual owners submit, just so that we would have someone able to speak to you tonight and cross-examine. Um, but will those two individuals still, they registered as witnesses as well, they'll still be able to speak, or should I be trying to incorporate their testimony? They'll, into they'll be, they will be able to speak uh, unless you all want to do it together. That's, that's kind of what we threw out there. Okay. I don't think we want. can do five minutes together. Because <laughs> we had five, three separate um, presentations. But you know, you get more than five minutes. Oh, okay. You get much more than five. You get, I yeah. think, you get an hour. Mich Michelle, yes. uh, yeah, yeah this is about fifty-eight minutes. So yeah, you get fifty-eight minutes between. Yeah, and they, they'll be you, just include them with you because you get fifty-eight minutes. All right, thank you. Not five minutes. No, that's a big, big misnomer. Now you get much more than five minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um. Let's go to the office of planning. I believe we have Ms. Thomas, Ms. Steingas, and Ms. Blondin from the District Department of Transportation. And Commissioner Kramer and Ms. Berg, don't go anywhere because um, you may have questions of either office cross examining either Office of Planning or DDOT. So don't go too far. All right, Ms. Thomas, you may begin. Yes. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair, uh, Commission members. Karen Thomas presenting the Office of Planning's recommendation for Zoning Commission case 2206 submitted this evening by the applicant 801 Main Avenue LLC. Next slide. The project at this location shown on the slide proposes a rezoning of the site from the MU-12 to the MU-9A zone at a building height ranging from 90 feet at the north at G Street to 120 to 130 feet along Main Avenue towards the wharf. 498 dwelling units are proposed with 15% of the residential GFA dedicated to IZ units at 60% MFI, where all three bedroom family size units are included in the 60% affordable category. 15% of penthouse habitable space would be dedicated to a family at 50% MFI. The Office of Planning recommends that this application as presented tonight be approved. Next slide. 
the property proposed to be rezoned to MU 9A is designated on the future land use map for medium density commercial. The proposed MU 9 zone is an appropriate option consistent with this comp plan direction. The MU 9A designation is at the high end of the density identified in the plan for medium density residential. But OP supports this density to allow for housing and affordable housing, which are high priority themes of the comp plan. The Office of Planning reports further describe how the proposal would generally further the direction of the policy map and the comp plan written elements, including the citywide elements, the lower Anacostia Southwest area element, and the Southwest small area plan. Where there are inconsistencies, including the policy to retain and remodel existing development rather than demolition, in this instance, remodeling would not be a preferred alternative since the current structure does not provide the height and density anticipated by the future land use map and as supported in the lower Anacostia Southwest element and the Southwest small area plan. These are weighed against other com plan policies and the merits of the project as a whole. In this case, bring in new market rate housing, affordable housing, and neighborhood uses to an underutilized underutilized site rather for this plan policy direction. On balance, this mixed use development would not be inconsistent with a comprehensive plan. With regards uh, to analysis through a racial equity lens. Next slide. The Office of Planning set down report includes a full analysis of the comp plan through an equity lens, as does the applicant's submission. In summary, one of the main ways the comp plan seeks to address equity is by supporting additional housing, particularly family size affordable units. There would be no residential or business displacement uh, through this development, and as stated, none of the three bedroom units would, would be market rate. The units would benefit lower income families locating in a neighborhood with schools, a library, recreation areas, and easy access to transportation for many services and to employment that would not be typically available to lower income residents. Such amenities also lead to better health outcomes. Next slide. The profit benefits and amenities package for this PUD includes the production of 498 new residential units on a site that currently contains no housing. This would include 75 units at 15% of the residential square footage at 50% to 60% MFI. This would exceed the number of units that would be provided under the site's existing MU12 zoning, both as a matter of right or through a PUD. The proposal also includes about 24,000 square, 24, square feet of retail space, which is being targeted for a small grocery use and a bank and would support employment for area residents with a variety of skill levels. The proposed infrastructure improvements include the reconfiguration of 9th Street, inclusion of a pickup drop-off area on 9th Street as requested by the community to accommodate recent uses um, in service drop-offs and taxis, and also dedicated bike lanes and, a wider and wider pedestrian sidewalks. This is a considerable benefit for the existing residents and neighborhood overall. The building is designed to reflect the nature of the site and generally use good quality materials and detailing. OP supports the proposed design attempts to adhere to the Southwest design guidelines including the varied height and massing on the site as it focuses its massing away from the townhomes on G Street towards Main Avenue, where it is more consistent with the other buildings in Southwest with, op with on-site open space features, particularly at the North End. The design is such that it, is, it appears as two buildings connected at the center with each portion responding to its immediate context. 90 feet height across from the 50 feet row structure, similar to other 90 feet buildings in the area, and the taller section facing the wharf buildings. 
Materials used are consistent with the development patterns of newer buildings, and the project has been upgraded to lead platinum. OP considers this a public benefit for residents in a high opportunity area, particularly for future low income residents. The leading rate, uh, the lead rating score sheet includes credits for use of environmentally preferable products, construction waste management and indoor environmental quality. The proposal for landscaped and art infused courtyards for residents and neighbors would enhance the pedestrian experience along the perimeter of the site, as well as the proposed facade treatment on the east side of the building. The applicant is also proposing monetary contributions of up to 100,000 to Jefferson Middle School and 75,000 to the provision of art in the neighborhood. While some of this may not be meet the requirements for being considered as part of the benefits and amenities proffer, However, they are all commendable and OP appreciates the discussion this applicant has had with community. Overall, OP supports the uh, proposed development as it generally aligns with the spirit of the regulations, including satisfying the Southwest Small Area Plans Design and Affordability Guidelines. The project site is located in a transit-oriented development where circulation is contained within the site, Near many neighborhood amenities, including schools, a library, the waterfront, and other recreational and employment opportunities. This project would ensure housing affordability by advancing diversity and equity in this high cost neighborhood within the planning area and would ensure preservation of affordable housing through the long term affordability restrictions afforded through IZ which is also desired under the Southwest Area Plan. OP feels that the benefits and amenities package intended to be read as a whole are commensurate with the flexibility gained through this PUD and would benefit future residents in the city as a whole. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, let's go right to DDOT and then we'll come and do our round of questioning. Uh, Ms. Blondin. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, cool. we can. Uh, I'll keep my thanks. I'll, I'll keep my uh, testimony quick. Uh, good evening. Um, as you heard from the applicant, um, they've worked a lot with us, and um, they have agreed to all of our commission, our, all of our conditions uh, identified in our report, which is Exhibit Forty Four. Um, and so, DDOT has no objections to the approval of the application with those three conditions um, listed in the final zoning order. Those three conditions are a transportation, transportation demand management plan, loading management plan, and the increase of long-term bicycle parking spaces to meet the DCMR 18 requirements. Thanks. Okay, that was, that was very brief and good, okay. Let's see if we have any questions or comments of either the Office of Planning or DDOT. Uh, let me start with uh, Commissioner Eva Moore. So I don't want Commissioner uh, May to take your thunder. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, no questions, uh, just a comment. Ms. Blondin, thank you for your succinct report. Uh, and Ms. Thomas, thank you for your thorough and very detailed report. Okay, uh, Vice Chair Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Blunden, uh, the applicant may have test testified on the um, on this, but I, I now forget what they said. The it's concept approval that the DDOT Public Space Committee gave to the two curb cuts on G Street. Is that that's correct? And and when when would final approval come when at the time that a building permit is being applied for or what, what, what what's the status of if your review sure. of, the, of the location of that curb that one curb cut to the west where the community wants it further away from those townhouses so um conceptual approval for curb cuts is something that we offer to um, developers because we understand that there's a lot that goes into designing a building after you've identified where the curb cuts go. So it kind of reduces the risk um, for, for applicants to go in and get conceptual approval. Um, they have to be heard by the public space committee. So 
So they have been heard and uh, approved for the conceptual approval. What that basically means is the general location and size of those curb cuts. Um, and so they'll come back once they are submitting their public space permit. So any other work that's happening in public space, including the improvements to the G and 9th Street, their streetscape plan, um, anything that touches public space, public parking, all of that, they have to come in for a public space permit. It generally happens around when they come in for building permits, um, but that's when the final, you know, they have to submit the engineered uh, designs for those curb cuts and, and everything um, gets finally approved. Okay, th thank you very much. Um, and thank you for your, your report and working with the uh, applicant to address c concerns that the community had about the project. And Ms. Thomas, uh, I think your report goes into this, but um, if you could just briefly reiterate um, regarding the 130 foot height along Main Avenue on this project uh, and its potential uh, con inconsistency with the comprehensive plan, medium density designation, could you uh, just reiterate why you think the public um, why the affordable housing and other um, aspects of the project uh, outweigh any potential inconsistency there in that in that height or density? Uh, um, if you could just briefly uh, reiterate that uh, for the record. Well, um, first of all, um, the starting with the existing density MU twelve, it is not consistent with the comp plan as it is for medium density commercial. So in proposing um, um, what the applicant did in, in proposing trying to get height onto the property, it wouldn't have been so much as, it's not so much as the 130 we're focusing on, but um, having to respect the uh, low density portion across G Street we believe 90 feet is appropriate and where they can push um, push additional height away from, from G Street, they needed some extra height, some extra bump to be able to, to do the affordable housing, to do housing on the whole, um, on affordable housing, provide some affordable housing. So we thought it would have been appropriate it, and, and not so much the height, but the way it is designed, uh, as it's seen as two separate buildings, almost with an attachment between uh, the, the 90 feet, we believe is appropriate to the 130 feet, which would be appropriate for the um, the main, main avenue. Now, with respect to the density, coming back to coming back to the MU9 that's being proposed, the when you look at what is being proposed at 7.99 FAR, it while it seems more than the um, MU12, which is which is not consistent with the comp plan, which is inconsistent with the with the plan as it is, it it falls within a medium density category. MU8 or MU10, the MU10 zone, which which is applied to the medium density category. It uh, allows for a FAR of about 8.64 with a pod. And this is well still well below the medium density category. So the site isn't using applying the full um, density, um, but is using the height afforded by the MU9 zone, 9A zone to be able to push that density away from the um, G Street. Does that make sense? Yes, uh, it, it does, because uh, it, do, it does to me, because uh, I, I read your full report, which, and I was just really asking for a summary of what was what was there. Um, can, can, can you just briefly also confirm what the applicant said in response to my question about the OAG written, I don't know if you've seen the OAG um, written submission into the record on this case. 
Um, but when you do see it, if you, if you haven't seen it, I maybe I think it might uh, the the chairman has asked the applicant to provide a uh, I think a written for, formal response to it, even though we haven't heard from them verbally tonight yet yet. Uh, but I think we may need off the planning also to respond uh, to it uh, specifically to the point that um, the applicant testified to in response to my question that. Uh, regarding IZ plus, if, if this if this were a, a mapping case with IZ plus, they uh, the applicant stated that you, that the Office of Planning would not have recommended the MU nine A zone. It would have been the MU eight or the M MU ten. And even with IZ plus mapping, with which requires up to twenty percent affordable housing set aside, I think it would be eighteen percent, maybe in this case. Um, it would have been less affordable, a lesser amount of affordable housing under one of the zones that you would have yet that the office of planning would have recommended if you were going with a, um, if you, if you had gone the route of recommending a mapping of IZ plus, uh, with a map amendment in, instead of the, your recommending approval of this PUD with, the, uh, with a map amendment at a high up with, with the MU nine a. I don't know if I, if I articulately answer, ask that question, but do you, do you get what I'm saying? Or maybe you can just make that a part of a written response to what. Yes, we would be happy to provide um, a supplemental with, with, with that breakdown of IZ plus um, for the commission to understand. Um, plus we, um, I believe also that looking at this um, development as a whole with the benefits that would accrue to with a pod as opposed to just a map amendment and you know they would have been able to develop it as a matter of right and the um traffic configurations reconfiguration of 9th street may still be a an issue um so when we look at um advising you know whether a map amendment or or a pod may be appropriate we felt that a pod would be more appropriate for this site but but certainly we can provide um a supplemental with some breakdown of the ic um and ic versus ic plus thank you I, and i appreciate your response off the top of your head here and uh, your your willingness to do a supplemental report if that's needed thank you Commissioner Miller, right if, I, if I could also add the issue of whether OP would support a map amendment or a PUD often comes down, as, as you know, the comp plan provides a range of density and zones that are applicable to a site. And when, when an applicant is interested in the highest zone or the highest density available, we typically prefer that to go through a PUD, not always, but our, our our general approach is that if they're going, if there's a request to maximize the density, we would rather see that through a PUD where we can look at the impacts and the and the design function of the site. That, that's what that statement was referring to. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Dungasher. I appreciate that. That, that, that. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, and Commissioner May. I want you all to know we went out of order, but Commissioner May. I noticed that. What was up with that? Uh, no, actually, I don't have any questions. Um, I think it's, everything has been covered in the questions of my fellow commissioners. Thank you. I would agree too. I, I probably have a lot of questions, uh, but not necessarily germane to, to just specifically this case. So I'll figure out another forum to ask that. Uh, but I do want to thank the Office of Planning and DDOT for their uh, um, reports. Uh, let's go to the ANC. Ms. Uh, Commissioner Kramer, you have any cross of either officer plan or DDOT? And if it's for both, just let us know who you're asking the question to. I have two questions for DDOT. Um, the, and I'll just ask them together. The first is, does DDOT support placing a traffic light at 9th Street uh, at the exit from the 9th Street tunnel? And my second, and if not, what else can we, is going to be considered um, to manage the traffic coming South out of I three three ninety five and um, and um, uh, the Ninth Street Tunnel, which essentially converge at that problematic intersection. My other question 
is uh, because it's it's come back to several times several times is um because the our testimony before the public space committee was very clear about the fact that we we only approved the curb cuts on condition that the the curb cut will be moved westward on g street um i i said and i don't understand the limits of conceptual versus what finally happens do we have anything to worry about <laughs> do we have to do we, can, should we understand this piece of it that's going to happen on the movement of the curb cut to, uh, westward on g street thanks sure um i'll answer your first one first which is uh i'm not an engineer so um i can't say whether or not uh you know, would support a, a signal there. What I can say is that um, we know that the stop sign there um, is uh, not ideal. Um, some of the changes that are proposed are definitely going to help because they are uh, not only narrowing the lanes, but also providing lane continuity through that intersection. Because a lot of the time a car where the crashes happen or where there's a side swipe or something, it's because the two cars are going at the same time into the same lane. And so the lane continuity is a big piece of that. Um, what I can say is that a signal will definitely be examined and we appreciate the applicant for providing that initial uh, study into looking at a, a signal there. Uh, because this is coming from uh, 395, there is a lot of federal coordination that has to happen. Uh, and the applicant and we understand that you know a signal there is something that will take some time to uh, study and to install, and so it's not something that can be a condition on this um, case, but but it's going to be something that will definitely be looked at and would um, work well with the improvements provided by proposed by this applicant. And the second question, uh, remind me, oh, the curb cut. Uh, so conceptual approval, um, they place some conditions on there. Um, and when they come back, uh, when the applicant comes back to public space committee for final approval, um, that is something that your public space committee takes into consideration a lot of different aspects. Um, I, I will say, you know, they have conceptual approval for the curb cut on G street, meaning there will likely be a curb cut on G street. Um, the final location of that and the size of that is something that there is some, some room for, for modification or um, changes on. So I think I, I'm now more confused and I'm sorry to press this. It may be just my ignorance, but what you just said is I thought they had that the conceptual approval was for the movement westward, not, not just that there'll be a curb cut, just having a curb cut opens up all the other things that um, have been talked about. So I, I want to understand whether the the, the move, move westward on the street is what you're talking about that has conceptual approval and we should assume that um, that is likely to happen. Sorry, the, the curb cut being moved westward from, oh, from where it is now. Understood. Correct. So when we look at curb, when we look at curb cuts, um, especially with a new site, with a site that's being redeveloped, we see them as completely new curb cuts. And so, um, what we, I guess, the answer is we don't look at the new curb cut compared to the old curb cut. We just look at it as one curb cut. So they, if they were going to have it in the exact same location, they would still have to go through this process. And we would still recommend them getting conceptual approval. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. Well, that, that, that means that, yes. I assume that you're saying <laughs> that the that you're approving the curb cut as as um, uh, as a new curb cut in location B. I, I that's what I hear you say. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. That's it's the be best best we can do at the moment. I appreciate your clarification. Yeah. Of course. Thank you. Uh, those are, oh, I don't, I've not, I've no further questions, uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Kramer. Uh, let's go to our party in opposition, Ms. Berg. Thank you. Um, a question for the Office of Planning 
and I know you touched on this a little bit a minute ago, um, but I am getting questions from my my team here. Um, but we wonder after all the community outreach and agreements that were made when the future land ma use map was created um, and the comprehensive plan was approved, it was um, zoned as M12. Why wasn't it made high density then? Because phase one of the wharf had already been built at that stage. Sorry. The the future land use land use map doesn't didn't rezone the site. It recommended what the site uh it's a it's the land use map is not a zoning map. So we unless somebody is going to rebuild the site or redevelop the site, then it comes into consistency with the um what the future land use map recommends. It's not a zoning map per se. Okay. Um, why does it um, not recommend or identify the site as mixed use um, and only as medium density commercial? I, I'm not sure what went into that thinking way back in um, 2006, as they, um, when it was. I, I can it add went, a little bit to that. When it went from that, I'm not sure. I can I can add a little bit to that. All commercial properties have an incentive for residential. All those all commercial zones permit residential. So there's no need for the mixed use striping in that location. Um, how did I, you mentioned some health benefits that you'd recognized from your review of the proposal? How did you determine that as there community health experts that weigh in? As part of the. Um, the 2019 equity um, report health health is also an important factor consideration, um, particularly in low income communities. Um, stress uh, for people of color um, is 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 a is a factor. A stress um, just daily living stress, transportation issues, um, create stress and, and poor health outcomes for for um, low income people. And it shows that where they live, where low income people typically live, uh, stress creators and uh, with poor out health outcomes for lower income people. So it was determined that this, you know, 130 to 150 at its actual height building um, wouldn't stress like the children at the school next door or the people trying to use the facilities. We look at it on in terms of access, so access to schools, access to housing, access to um, clean living in clean buildings, uh, healthy um, air, air quality buildings, and um, access to outdoor open space, but. That's that's how it's assessed. Okay. Um, I'm told the site is in a neighborhood conservation area in the framework um, and that states that development is supposed to conserve and enhance the established neighborhoods. We just heard a few minutes ago that this building will actually be taller than the wharf, um, which was considered distinct from Southwest and um, a variety of other documents and plans um, that have been approved. How does this building conserve the Southwest neighborhood? Um, the, well, a neighborhood conservation area doesn't mean that um, doesn't preclude development of an area of of any any area. Uh, what it means is that it must respect the context in which it is um, being uh, developed or redeveloped, and we believe that this proposal um, does does that. I have a few questions for DDOT. Um, could the applicant leave the curb cut on 9th Street um, or even create one further down um, on 9th Street to minimize traffic movement on the corner? Um, and if so, would that let them potentially move the G Street curb cut as exit only further west? Um, for example, we think that um, the in and out on the G Street contributes to the chaos there. Um, and then we think that if even if some vehicles, um, those pretty much all of them 
um, entering the building are able to turn into the, the parking lot or the, the garage before entering the intersection, it would re reduce some of the um, chaos that's there and get them out of the intersection before they um, even get there. Um, and we also um, think that making the G Street exit and the, the curb cut there exit only would help cut with some of the um, concerns that we have about people cutting through our development in order to, to illegally cross um, G Street into those um, into that curb cut. So could they leave the 9th Street curb cut where it is and or create one further down? So um, as I mentioned earlier, leaving a curb cut is still something that they would have to apply for because it's a redevelopment of the site. Um, and applicants are always welcome to be heard at public space committee um, for any curb cut. That being said, um, we as staff uh, would not recommend that. Um, we we try to reduce the amount of curb cuts on a site to as few as possible. In fact, uh, this site, you know, we would have liked to see just a single curb cut. Um, having two curb cuts is for one property is more than we would like to see, um, mostly for for safety and for um, fewer conflict points of cars turning in and turning out. And so, uh, having this one private alley with the two curb cuts. Um, we saw as as the best option for safety and for flow of vehicles through there. Um, has DDOT had the opportunity to look at any of the um, photos that we've sent into the case file? How would our community, um, you know, show you some of the traffic jams that occur there to help you make this decision? Sure. So, um, you know, we when we look at a development, we want to make sure that. It's working with with peak hours, but also with non peak hours and um, that type of that type of. Uh, accidents that are happening is not something that this this development can can fix or um, can address. That's something that, you know, we can work with the community on a separate note, not connected to this development. Um, we do have a system that's a traffic safety investigation that can look into. Things like that that have happened. Um, we do, you know, we're we're well aware that there is a lot of conflicts that happen there, and I do think that, um, you know, the improvements to that intersection of 9th and G will help with some of those those crashes that have occurred. Um, has you not considered this project individually, or are you considering it in um, conjunction with other developments, such as War Phase Two or the 807 Main Avenue proposal, which is zoning case 2211? Yep, we we do look at them um, in conjunction. So, um, with with the developments that are planned, those are all taken into consideration when we look at growth uh, for the future um, traffic that we anticipate. And so, you'll see in the report. Um, a list of the other developments that are um, considered for those future, the future numbers, which includes War Phase 2 as well as some other developments. Um, and then, you know, I, I'm also the case manager for the 807. And so, you know, I'm able to look at them at the same time and examine, you know, what they're doing to our network as a whole. Um, Dita asked for a curb cut entrance on Main Avenue to be right in only, which is all you can do because of the median. Um, for grocery trucks larger than 35 feet in length, have you considered whether there's enough space for those trucks to turn on G Street or will we be losing significant parking on G Street? You'll, you'll be losing the parking um, as required by the curb cut, right? So wherever the curb cut is plus five feet on either side, um, but the turning movements show that, that that is able to occur on G Street. Um, we noticed that the applicant study didn't take into account our streets, um, our community at all in their traffic study. Um, has DDOT looked at cars coming and going through our streets and how they contribute to the traffic patterns into the site? We So we do look at it as a holistic uh, network, which does include your community and, and the houses and the traffic that's caused by that. Okay. Um, so a question about the um, potential signal. So we keep talking about the 8395 exit ramp, but that is also the 9th Street Tunnel um, coming south um, where people can get on to 3. 
and the sense of the overseed. If the applicant put a symbol there, um, they tell us there. We're certain that, that it would encourage or discourage people from turning air to our into our development. Is that something that would be mitigated by this traffic signal or um, and DDOT study would continue um, consider the impacts on us and actual human factors when people are driving and confronted with backups? I'm sorry, you you broke up a lot during that. I don't know if that was on my end. Um, could, could you summarize your question again? Yeah, you just. Yeah. You just broke up on me too, so it might mean um, my bandwidth. I'll uh, turn my video off. Um, so, will you consider that sort of human factors um, where people disobey um, sort of traffic laws and do not enter signs when you make your recommendations on curb cuts and traffic signals? You know, that's that's a great question for for all of traffic, right? Human behavior is something that um, we always take into consideration and we try to design um, ways that, you know, human error cannot get somebody hurt. Um, and so that's why, um, you know, when the applicant was talking earlier about reducing crash risk and crash severity, that's all about slowing vehicles down. And so that uh, improvement to that intersection is really about reducing the speeds of those vehicles so that if there is human human error involved and a car you know hits another car or hits a pedestrian that crash severity is lowered uh, and so it's not going to be something where somebody gets killed um, because we we can't design out human error that's not something we can do but we can slow it down to make sure that um, we're not getting people hurt, hurt, hurt worse. And what does DDOT think of the traffic estimates that the applicant has provided, the number of cars that they think will be coming in and out of the, the site with the proposed uses? We, we think they match the, the um, uses and the proposed parking. Um, you know, we, we encourage them to go uh, with the mode split that they have identified. Um, so the mode split is the amount of people that will be driving versus walking or biking or taking the metro, um, and that's all based on our um, our recommendations for our CPR, um, our comprehensive transportation review, based on their proximity to metro and um, bus services. Okay, um, I think that's it from us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, now we will go to Commissioner Kramer. Uh, oh, wait a minute, hold up. Does the applicant have any? Um, I can't get thoughts? my video on. Hold on, sorry. Where is that? Don't worry. It's not working. And he froze. He froze. Shit. Hi, I just wanted to clarify. One thing that um, Ms. I can't get the uh, no, 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 this video. Is not, this is this, oh, Everything. Ms. Commissioner Kramer. Oh, sorry. We, we actually can hear you. I'm sorry. I, I, I my thing froze and I can't get it on. Or right. I'm so sorry. That's all right. Just it'll catch up. Just don't get yeah. frustrated. Cause okay. Sometimes when I, I say certain things, I try to make sure I'm mute. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> um, Ms. Batiste, this is not a time to. Uh, Go back and forth. Do you have any cross to officer plan? No clarification right now. DDOT. Okay, you have a question for DDOT. Okay, Ms. Blondin. The African has a question for you. There it is. Oops. Hey, Ms. Blondin, can you just um, please confirm that when we started this process, that DDOT really was just in support of a single curb cut off G Street? Um, when we started and we were able to work with DDOT in the community to get that second curb cut on Main. Correct. We um, did not want a curb cut on Main Avenue because that's an arterial. Um, but with the uses that the applicant wanted, uh, specifically the grocer and needing access for 35 foot trucks, um, they showed us that that's not feasible for them to get in and um, Basically, turn around in the site for head in, head out movements only through the G Street curb cut. Um, so they wanted one on Main Avenue, which is why we recommended conceptual curb 
curb cut approval because uh, those two curb cuts is not typically something we recommend or support. And then just also um, Chairman Hood on page four of our report to address Commissioner Kramer's concern. We have agreed, we listed specifically in our um, response to the community's concerns that the, we're shifting the G Street curb cut as far west as possible. Thank you. Okay, and I apologize for the afternoon because I don't, I should have called you all first and I didn't. Uh, okay, so Ms. Michelle, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Kramer, now it's time for your uh, testimony. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I'm so sorry I had a glitch, a te technical problem. Um, so good evening, long evening. I'm Frederica Kramer, vice chair of ANC 60 and authorized by ANC 60 to testify on case 20. 206. I and Commissioner uh, Litsky have been on the uh, together on the negotiating team for uh, 2206 um, with Commissioner Lightman, uh, in whose uh, SMD this lies and who chaired, the, chaired the, those negotiations. As you know, ANC 60 voted on, on September 21st to oppose the project, but I want to recall to you that this our commission has largely supported developments like this one. But that support has always rested uh, on the proposals demonstrating a respect and understanding of the unique character of Southwest, delineated and incorporated into law in the Southwest Small Area Plan, and a recognition of substantial community benefits that will contribute to enhancing the long term well being of our community. In this case, the applicant has, post has purchased a relatively to what they're doing, very small parts of land on which they want to build a very large building. The project is on an extremely challenging site, as we've talked about, a very odd triangle bounded by major traffic arteries, fed by the traffic existing from I-395, exiting, excuse me, from 395 and the 9th Street Tunnel, and a major route to events at the wharf and at, at Nats and Audi uh, Stadia. On the north side is the community of 90 townhouses. On the east, the playing fields of Jefferson Academy Middle School, all together requiring a much more fine-tuned approach to any development on this parcel and responsive to the complexities of the site and the context. Recognizing the challenges, we met repeatedly with the applicant to remedy some of our concerns. Commissioner Lightman has also met several times with interested community residents potentially impacted by the project. We thank the applicant for their willingness to continue to the discussions uh, on these knotty problems. But I want to point out that although the record seems to, from the applicant, seems to suggest that we met 25 times, I can't imagine us having met 25 times or what they're, what they're uh, counting. Uh, it certainly, the negotiating committee certainly didn't meet 25 times with the um, with the applicant. That includes other um, uh, perhaps pr presentations to the full ANC. I don't know, um, but I'd like to clarify that. Um, we obviously hope to commit to continue to meet with the applicant and um, and try to still work on these problems. So despite our, our continued effort, efforts to find uh, some solutions, our commission still finds that the proposal is unchanged in ways that might minimize the significant impact on the adjacent homeowners that you've just heard from, that it'll exacerbate uh, the traffic challenges that we've spoken to, that others have spoken to, and it will continue to contravene the small area plan and proffer no meaningful and substantial community benefits, which is what we had hoped for, what we continue to hope for. Let me first turn to the to what the ANC finds as violations of the small area plan. We recently testified to zoning on the importance of respecting a community small area plan, which with the comprehensive plan creates this overall uh, vision of the city, but also integrates the character and sensitivity of, of individual communities and their and um, how they function. Equally important, the small area plans represent a compact between the government and citizens. These become foundational documents for ANC's neighborhood associations and public authorities to understand a roadmap and the legal and moral basis upon which DC residents rely for fairness, equity, and accountability in development. We noticed, we noted uh, that the Southwest Small Area Plan is one of more, of more 
more than a score of small area neighborhood plans throughout the district. So residents across our city will pay close attention to how their visions of their own neighborhoods encoded in law are going to be upheld by development decisions, contravening the guidelines of one without irrefutable benefits of the community and Rose, le Rose legitimacy of all. It's the proposed development in this case violates the, both the spirit and intent of the small area plan and the vision of Main Avenue in that in that plan. First, with regard to height and density, the application applicant's justification for the requested increases continues to reference the wharf on the south side of Main Avenue, and we've heard that again tonight, in order to propose that the portion of the building bordering Main Avenue be equal in height to the buildings of the wharf. In fact, we just heard that it'll be higher than the buildings on the wharf. As the ANC has reminded the commission, the wharf was specifically not included by the Office of Planning in our small area plan. The plan has always without conditions included the north side of Main Avenue and disavowed the creation of Main Avenue as an alley of tall buildings. Main Avenue is a Maginot line for Southwest, a border between the residential neighborhoods and the mass of buildings on the wharf. If the wharf were to set the standard, it would prove perilous for, for residential development in Southwest going forward. The height requested in the PUD on the north side is massive, at least twice the, the current zoning, which is depending upon how you count and what, what you're included, 65 feet. Except for the buildings in the town in the southwest town center, nowhere on the north side of Main Avenue in the immediate area of the PUD or the res or rest of residential southwest are there buildings of height and density comparable to the wharf. To provide some visuals, on the parcel, just so we can sort of see it in its own context. Um, what's proposed in this PUD at the corner of Main and 9th is currently a four story building. You've seen it in the pictures. Next to it is open space and several, and the playing fields of Thomas Jefferson. And at the other corner on 7th and Main, another fourth four story building. And that whole block makes a low rise open space area for the entire block. Across 7th Street is Riverside Baptist Church, then a cluster of two-story soundhouses between the church and Arena Stage. And on the east side of 7th Street, across from Jefferson, is 707 7th Street Condominium, less than 100 feet high. So this is this is completely out of that palette of, of, of this, this uh, south side of Main Avenue, uh, north side of Main Avenue. Most important, is that our small area plan recognizes the intention, intentional variations of height and density, high and low, built area and open spaces, so the town set, the townhouses are nestled in mixed, mixed mid-rise and eight to nine-story apartment houses and surrounded and interspersed by green and common space. A second central tenet of the small area plan is maintaining Southwest, Southwest's extraordinary demographic diversity among the most successfully successful socially and economically diverse communities in the district. Southwest has already achieved what the Zoning Commission's racial equity analysis is attempting to achieve in all of its zoning actions. That's a big point. Visible testament to Southwest's demogra demographic diversity and strikingly successful social integration are the users of the Duck Pond and Landsberg Park and Jefferson Playing Fields and the Farmer's Market and the Channel Promenade and our many religious congregations. For Southwest, diversity is not just a numbers count, but active social integration in our amenities and neighborhood institutions. We function that way. We don't just count the numbers, we function that way. Many of the critics of ANC's, ANC 60's opposition to this PUD have cited the need for more affordable housing, that any new housing with some component of below market rate must be supported. This misses a crucial point. As density increases, a new building of nearly 500 units with only a minimum of affordable units would reduce the number of low and moderate income families to a mere sliver of the whole. It keeps going down. That's a kick in the shins for social diversity. 
There's no shortage of market rate housing in Southwest. In fact, vacancy rates and new developments seem to reiterate the need for more below market rate, not market rate housing. So rather than redressing the severe shortage of affordable housing in the district, a development of this size with an extreme disproportion of affordable to market rate units would intensify the polarization between low and high income strata with not much in the middle. The threat to future economic diversity and continued social integration and the threat to the stated goals of both the Southwest Small Area Plan and the Zoning Commission. The challenge for Southwest is to protect what affordable housing we have, and as density increases in new developments, ensure that the, that new development continues to reflect demographic diversity that we've memorialized in the plan and the community cherishes. Once density and height limits are ignored, everything, mixed height, mixed income, mixed demographics is up for grabs. Southwest, in fact, has a large number of rent-controlled apartments and buildings constructed before 1975. Other low-income and public housing units and new buildings built under PUD agreements that include significantly higher than required numbers of below market rate units. Moderate income housing is scattered throughout Southwest if risk, if, at risk if height limits are eased to permit denser development. As an example, the waterside townhouses that back directly onto Main Avenue and with their eight-story buildings in the same complex sit on very valuable land and open space between Arena Stage and the Riverside back Baptist Church. They house a range of tenants in rent-controlled units and are easy picking if height limits are eased. The five-story low-rise apartment complex that, that we so-called commons are mixed in amongst the individually owned row houses between G and I and, and fourth and sixth. They're home to lower and moderate income renters. They may also be at risk. Surely the iconic palette of low and high townhouses and apartments built in green space is at risk. Even the district owned storage building that sits at the corner of the Jefferson playing field is potential fodder for another high rise above the parameters of Southwest current height limit. AEC's a AN60 considers this not a hypothetical, but a realistic outcome of disregarding the height limitations imposed on current development, Southwest development. Let me turn to traffic issues. The applicant's proposed design will ex exacerbate traffic problems that already exist at the intersection of 9th and G at the north corner of the project, one of the most dangerous intersections in Southwest. Traffic coming southbound through 9th Street, eastbound from the exit of I-395, I and local and east, uh, eastbound traffic on 9th Street all converge at that intersection. ANC regards it as completely irresponsible to approve any, any PUD that doesn't address the intersection specifically and adequately. Currently, these streams are controlled by two stop signs, one at the end of 395, uh, and the second uh, at the intersection of 9th and G. Our commission and the residents of townhouses along 9th and G have repeatedly voiced their concerns to DDOT. DDOT hasn't acted or indicated that when it would act to alter the intersection substantially. We've talked about that a lot back and forth this evening. Although the applicant shares the ANC's concerns and has proposed modifications along N Street in front of the building, the applicant offers no alternative solutions to the intersection, and despite the obviously obvious increased pressure that will be brought by traffic generating by the proposed building on this already dangerous intersection, they have in fact refused to undertake a leadership role with with financial equipment uh, a commitment to secure DDOT's installation of a stoplight. I noted earlier in my uh, I didn't say it uh, that. Uh, that Mr. Schissel said that there's going to be an increase of almost 700 cars a day. That's not trivial. That's enormous. Um, and this is the building that's created. There is also currently only a four-story building with no at, the, at this site with no retail space on the site. A building with nearly 500 units, several proposed commercial venues, including a grocer, will cr create a substantial increase in traffic from private vehicles, large trucks delivering groceries, moving tenants in and out, and the smaller vehicles delivering now constant uh, stream of Uber, Uber Eats, and all those kinds of personal services. 
all those vehicles are now going to empty onto narrow G Street facing the Capitol Square townhouses. The traffic studies that the applicant has included are not sufficient. They measure traditional rush hour traffic when the major majority of commuters have still not returned to offices, and they may be entirely different when new post-pandemic work patterns set in. And they ignore the inadequacy of the stop signs that control current traffic, let alone the additional traffic that will flow from a bigger, higher, and larger mixed-use building. Most important, they fail to account for the traffic flows at the intersection and on G Street, when there are events, this is a big one, when there are events at the Wharf or game days at Nats and Audi Stadium. For those who don't live in Southwest, it is difficult to appreciate what extended gridlock really looks like when traffic events for one or more of our entertainment venues are not properly managed, as they very frequently are. Then there's the issue of the curb cuts we've been talking a lot about. The new alley will, will require two new curb cuts, one on Main, one on, on, on the G Street to be moved farther west and close to the intersection. Commissioner Lightman testified at the, um, the, the DDOT Public Space Committee on May 5th to share our support for the movement of the Main, of the, of the main Avenue curb cut, curb cut, but if and only if it includes moving the existing cut on G Street closer to the intersection. This is why I've been pressing uh, with with all of my questions to understand whether that's actually going to happen or there's um, or we have to worry about it some more. Um, as she explained, not moving the curb cut westward as we we're hoping for uh, will exacerbate an already untenable uh, traffic situation affecting the 90 townhouses. The current curb cut allows cars to enter the private streets of the townhouse community off 7th, speed through that small and unprotected roads in their uh, community uh, to exit opposite the entry of the of the current structure's garage, which is now used by patrons of the wharf. It's not just a nuisance. Cars barreling through the townhouse community threaten the lives of residents, of, of pedestrians, and children playing around the townhouses. The community has uh, employed numerous tactics to, to, to discourage the use of their private streets, but none have fixed the problem. The applicant is not going to apparently allow public parking in the new building, except for patrons of a new grocery store. Uh, in the large uh, ground floor retail space. But as we've seen with other pu public parking dedicated to retail operation and discounted for a limited time, we see this always, always in our Safeway lot, those spaces are inevitably used by other patrons and we would be a particular lure when compared to high priced uh, and limited parking at the wharf. So the problem could continue, although at a lower volume. Moving the curb cut would alleviate the problem, but it'll create another problem. The exit on G Street will be used by all other traffic exiting the building's garage or using the alleys for deliveries, including large trucks, especially if the grocery store comes to, to fruition. G Street's not wide enough for large grocery delivery trucks to make the necessary turn in an, in a, in an already overburdened street. And apparently, as has just been questioned, as, as the um, uh, other witness has just questioned, um the applicant they will lose the only thing that they can do is lose parking space on that street to accommodate that that turn um finally the new alley and the curb cut on main avenue may create an escape route going north when an event at the wharf creates congestion or gridlock on main avenue so even if the if the garage is ostensibly not mostly for public use some number of poachers will continue to use the garage for visiting the wharf but others may use the new alley to escape Main Avenue gridlock, creating additional traffic. Our last point in the ANC concerned the lack of community benefits. We've concluded as a commission that the proposed project offers no public benefits that warrant an extraordinary exception to the small area plan. It could proffer a grocery store, as it has suggested, but only at a price point that would serve a broad section of our community and provide me a meaningful alternative to our one grocer on 4th Street, and only if it didn't create delivery issues that added to the traffic, uh, to the challenges that I've noted. What we've heard doesn't meet these standards. Um, what what we also heard, one of the reasons that I have pressed this this evening is that if we don't hear 
that we have, if we don't understand what either 6,000 or 12,000 feet actually, uh, um, actually gets in a grocery store, we may not be getting what we really need as a, as an alternative to the one as an addition uh, and an alternative to our run grocery store. It could proper same thing with the bank, although the bank I'm, I I sat, it sounds like in the testimony prior to, to this one, we are being assured that we will get a full service bank. It could proffer significantly more affordable housing, but only if that increase didn't also come with the increase in, how in, how, in height and density that carries all the other ills just detailed. And a proffer of 15% IZ doesn't come close to the target suggested by others, including the Office of the Attorney General, who have studied the extreme lack of new units at affordable housing prices. Another 500 rental units does, does nothing to address the racial gap in home ownership. We also understand that $150,000, the one proffer um, offered, seems like a lot of money for a school, which undoubtedly could find ways to spend uh, to augment its educational resources, but it doesn't come close to what would be needed to remedy the harms that might be caused by the plan as proposed. For instance, the building will shadow part of the playing field of Jefferson, particularly the tennis courts for most of the after school activities that they're in use. And even the whole pot would not would not correct that problem. Um, as ANC 60 recognizes the extreme interest that this project is proposed has provoked. But we question why the applicant has used Nextdoor and a website to solicit support from all over the district and beyond, as others have testified, but not from residents of Southwest who are directly impacted. We would be remiss if we didn't point out that simple numbers don't tell the story honestly here. A review of the records indicates that most of the letters and support arrived three days ago, only after the applicants started pushing out the website, urging folks to weigh in in favor of their project, and after it was promoted on Nextdoor. Among the letters, each with an exhibit number, are several coming from Mount Pleasant, Corcoran Street Northwest, 15th Street Northeast, New Jersey Avenue Southeast, a few from Shore, Hamilton Street Northwest, 15th and H Northeast, Upper Ward 4, Crittenden Street Northwest, Capitol Riverfront, Capitol Hill, and even, uh, as somebody else has pointed out, Alexandria, uh, Virginia. These are not exactly the folks who would be regularly concerned about uh, what would be to them an obscure project at the far reaches of Southwest. What compelled, compelled them to tell their stories in precisely the same language? language? Who knew? The most egregious letter of support is exhibit number 83. It's from a respondent named Beep Boop at the given address, 800 9th Street Southwest, the very same spot where the applicant is constructing this project. If you have any questions about this, call the telephone number attached to that entry, 202-555-1212, which is Verizon information. ANC 60 would like some information too, exactly who ginned up this, this disinformation campaign. As someone, someone suggested, not totally facetiously, Roger Stone. The opponents are Southwesters, on the other hand, who live immediately next to the site or in the Southwest community. They care passionately about their community and about preserving and bettering what makes this community unique. We support the notion that any district resident has a right to weigh in on any zoning matter. That said, we urge the commission not to grant them equal consequence because numbers don't tell the whole story. ANC is more than disappointed in the tactics of the applicants in this regard. In sum, ANC 60 has not much here to celebrate and very much to generate concern, great concern. Our commission understands that we and the applicant are very far apart and they are intending to go national in their development plans and that's terrific and we wish them great luck with that. But they need to do the right thing by their own citizens first before they convince others to buy the model. And we importantly look forward to continuing to work to improve this submission. Thanks for your considering, consideration and I look forward to questions. Thank you, Commissioner Kramer. That, that was quite a bit. Uh, I will tell you that what I've noticed Sorry. about 6D is that you all really give a lot of information. And 
I would appreciate it if we get just get right and even in the submissions. And I appreciate all the work you all do. You all have done an uh, excellent job over the years with all the development. But we knew this was coming. I've been here 24 years, and some of the, your predecessors, we were excited. I mean, when I say we, the city was excited about redoing Southwest. And it may have taken off to a point that now we need to slow down. But we were really pushing fast, and, and a lot of the commissioners who worked on this, I still remember some have, have gone on to glory, but I can just say that a lot of people worked hard to get to where we are, but it took off. I remember telling Andy Altman, our former planning director, that he, we did a, a walkthrough down in Southwest, and he was telling me all the things that was planned. I said, I'd be dead and gone before this stuff is uh <laughs> <laughs> But guess what? I'm still here, and it took off fast. And now the support that comes in from the ANCs has now went from supportive, concern, slowing up, to now opposition. So, you know, and I hear this across the city. Sometimes we ask for stuff, and then we get ourselves in something. We got to try to, okay, this is not exactly what we planned. Even here on the commission, this is not exactly what the outcome should have been. But what I would ask for 6D, and there's a lot of stuff, and I would, I have to, when I read your submissions, I have to kind of find out exactly what your recommendation is. Um, if we can get kind of get right to the point, I think I saw it. You did well for me uh, on the first, is it the first page? Yeah, yeah, like what you just, he says, in summary. And that that was very helpful. Uh, and, I, and I appreciate all the work. And I'm trying to say it was awesome because I want to get to the points, to the points of what you, what you, what the issue is and what you're recommending. That would be very helpful to me because we have to read a whole lot. And the other thing I, I will say is uh, they can put all the stuff in the record that they want. But from my standpoint, and I've always said this, everybody, you're right, everybody can weigh in. But if I put my address in, in the record and I live way over here, we balance that. This commission is, this ain't our first rodeo. Uh, we're not going to, you know, if somebody lives in, we've had people that, that had nothing to do with things and they live in other areas of the uh, country and not the city but the country and and we balance that because the people who are most affected most impacted are um commissioner kramer you and your commission ron collins and all you all the ones most impacted so i just wanted to put that out there so what i'm trying to do now with all that being said is find out first of all is there opportunity i always believe in collaboration and continuing to work. And that's what I'm going to recommend. Not that we're going to get everything we, we want, but I think that uh, we need to specifically try to push for what we need for our community because the, the developers are going to develop and they're, they'll probably be over my neighbor, well, in another neighborhood at some point doing something else, which is fine. But we are always supposed to look at the need of the community. So for me, if we can streamline and if these are just the issues that's on page two of your report, uh, one through five in summary, then let that be the issues. Um, but and and then also what I would like to see in future presentations, those are the issues. And here's exactly, exactly what we believe the recommendation is. I can work with that because I have to, you know, I I have no problems, but I have to read through as ANC sixty has recently testified that it's on the comprehensive plan. Our augmented by a community small area plan so so i want to know what exactly give me give me straight to the point that's all i'm asking but i i want you to know that the work that you all do is greatly appreciated uh and the only other question i would have have is is there still room for engagement you might not we might not get everything but is there still room for continued discussion and to try to come closer together i i can i respond Yes, yes. Correct. Okay. So so I appreciate the admonition for um for get to the point. Um I'm I'm trained as an academic, so that's a that's always a problem. But I I, I um I'm happy to be I'm happy to be retrained even even at my old age. Um the um the the point is um the 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 ANC and the community care desperately about <clears throat> what we consider is iconic social diversity in Southwest, and so we want a way to way to preserve that. We also want we do not want to raise the height and density of a building which then threatens other 
other parcels and other low and moderate income and rent controlled uh, building in the rest of uh, Southwest, but especially on Main Avenue. So that's our problem with that and our, our problem with the big building. People can say different things about who likes the building and who doesn't and what kind of materiality it is it has that's good or good or or not but the, the bottom line is we are we are seeing that that the heightened density as proposed uh puts at risk other parcels in the and, and other and our other ways of preserving um uh uh, uh moderate income uh housing um and we don't want canyons of course on on main avenue we want to respect that the last thing is we want to ameliorate a, a, something that we consider to be an extremely critical traffic problem. So it's a combination of all the things we talked about. It's a combination of dealing with um, with uh, the intersect, the, this dangerous intersection at the north end. It's a problem of dealing with um, traffic flows that will um, that are are constantly being pressed to their limits with with real gridlock when people call me and say i i, I was in my, sitting in my car for 45 minutes i couldn't get home because there were two games or an event at the wharf i can't we can't deal with that so those are the things that we we need to do we can and hope to get back to working and discussing with this applicant a way to deal with that but the way it's proposed now we 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 have to um we have to frame our problems the way we did. Thank you, Commissioner Kramer. And let me just um let me just go back to what I was saying about sound bites. It's not necessary for you to read <laughs> okay. the sound bites are for me <laughs> because I oh, oh, my <laughs> colleagues are at least for me. Because I can tell you today we're doing this. Next week we'll be doing something else. So I want to make sure that I capture things easily for me. It has nothing to do with you. It's all about me understanding exactly what your specific. Oh, that's the that's the best criticism I got. So I'll make you sound bites. I'll make it. I'll re reframe everything. Not tonight, but I'll reframe everything in sound that bites helps, that, that you me. take away. That you can take away. It's my, would be my my challenge and my pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see if we have any other further questions or comments, Commissioner May. Yeah, so I'm I'm struggling a bit um, with um, Commissioner Kramer's testimony because it you know the chairman was asking you know is there still room to discuss and come to some agreement and your first concern or your first response seemed to be about the building's height and density and so I I it it, it makes it sound like there really isn't any room to negotiate unless they were to reduce the size of the building. And I don't think that's actually on the table from the applicant at this point. I don't think that they're, you know, in these discussions, they, they, what they've done is they've moved density around so that it's less problematic for the neighbors to the north. But I don't think they're, you know, that re reducing the size of the building is in the cards based on, you know, what, what we've seen so far from the applicant. I mean, do you think that, that it can stay at this density and still you could come to some agreement if they're, you know, if they dealt with the, you know, the G Street, the, the ninth and G intersection or something like that? Well, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to that until we sit back and sit down at the table again, clearly. But I um, I do think that you're dealing with similar problems in the in the building at the other side of, of Main Avenue. And I do think both impact what we have been talking about, about putting putting all these other parcels at risk, particularly, I mean, the poster child of this is, is the townhouses but next door to, uh, to Arena Stage. So I think that has to be addressed in some way by by the Zoning Commission. And I think that the, I mean, you're the, you're the final arbiters, we're just advisors. Um, right, but, but I mean, again, uh, you know, the, the chairman is trying to see if there's a way to get to agreement with the ANC. And it sounds like at this, level of density there just just can't be an agreement you're not going to because of your concern about impacts to other properties do i understand that correctly i i i don't know how to i don't know how to respond to that i don't know until we sit down at the table if what if 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 the question is nothing can be done we have our position and we and we that's where we are if we sit down again and say or if the zoning commission says they are they are um uh, we have been somewhat persuasive in the fact that we do put other 
other parcels and and future development at at risk, uh, future development that would follow the the um, the, the tenants of the plan as it as it is, um, then then the applicant has to respond in some way. I mean, I, I you know I it's it's really a zoning commission question. It's not a it's not a it's not a question that I can figure out how to answer. Well, other than so just, we, I mean, you're basically yeah. saying we're going to have to put pressure on them to reduce the size of the building if you're going to in order to get you on board. Well, you can you can have to be persuaded that what we've offered is a uh, is a um, is a, is a set of serious concerns. We, we we can put the traffic off the table for the moment because because you've you know we we all agree there's a real problem and and you'll have to be the again you'll have to be the 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 final um, uh, deciders on on whether it's whether the the mitigation strategies that they have are 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 sufficient to not worry about them or not worry about the problem but the um the question of of whether we have appropriate wh whether whether this plan has um reached the an appropriate level of of income diversity social diversity that 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 um that uh, honors the the community this 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 community profile um i i don't i don't i i don't know again I, again it's until i sit down at the table well, with, I, I, I with think our I side and their side yeah I, I i think i have my answer thank you uh commissioner may you finish yes oh thank okay you. all right um uh, commissioner even more any questions or comments uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple comments. Um, Commissioner Kramer, your testimony uh, is always well rehearsed and reflects a lot of work and it's written probably with a, a stream of consciousness. So thank you for uh, the effort that you put into it. Um, I do just want to remind everybody that uh, Ms. Blondin, I think, made a pretty important comment in terms of traffic that uh, this particular project, I think everybody is aware that traffic is certainly a, a critical and important issue uh, in that area, but that this project uh, is not going to solve um, the traffic issues for the entire area. So it's just something that I think it's important to be mindful about that. Um, and I think uh, Commissioner May and his question, um, I think brings up a, a fair point. Um, so I will uh, yield the rest of my time um, and look forward to hearing uh, Vice Chair Miller's comments and questions. Okay, uh, Vice Chair Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're, you're probably the other one, Commissioner Ramora, who looks forward to my comments. But um, <laughs> I, thank I thank Commissioner Kramer for your very uh, thoughtful, uh, thorough comments. Um, since you just brought it up a few times, uh, you wanted to understand what the size of a 6,000 square foot grocery store is. So I went to all of our best friend Google just to see, because I, I, I don't know either when I go into all these stores. So your, your Safeway DC, apparently, according to our best friend Google, is 60,000 um, square feet, if you can believe what it. Is it. 60, what is it? 60,000. 60, right. The size of right, what right. minimum would be proffered here in this case right um the Wegmans that just opened up in my neck of the woods and I think is one of the largest grocery stores in the city is 84,000 square feet compared to the Whole Foods that are on either side of it in Glover Park and Tenley Town which are 24,000 square feet um the yes all these ridiculously hard, large volume of grocery stores in up, up in Upper Northwest. Uh, the yes down in Cleveland Park is 8,500 square feet. So that's probably in the range of selling space. Um, and the Magruder's up in Chevy Chase, DC. I don't know if you've been to any of these places, but you might have. Is 6,000 square feet. Um, so. The Wagshaws, which is probably not the price point you're looking for, 
in Spring Valley and in uh, Fox Hall is 4,000 square feet. I mean, a lot of, you can get a lot of choices in the smaller range. You might not get the price point you want, but I think if you get more stores, you got more competition, which I think will help the price point. So anyway, I don't just on that point, I just wanted to illuminate you and myself on what all these square footage is amounting to. So we should ask what Rodman's is with a narrow, the lie, just one floor of the Rodman's. Right. All right. We'll Google that later. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> that's pretty. That's pretty spacious. So I, I assume that's that's getting up there. But anyway. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Okay, let's see if we have any other questions. Not seeing any going on. Let's go to uh, the applicant. Does the applicant have any cross of uh, Ms. Kramer, Commissioner Kramer? No, we don't. Okay, and um, Ms. Berg, uh, from, do you have any cross of Ms. Kramer? No, we don't. Okay. Can All I right, thank you. Yes. Can I add one more thing? Because it, it's really, it's really uh, Commissioner May's um, question is, you know, what do we do? Or, you know, you're just, you know, you're just stuck where you are. You're going to be stuck where you are. Um, I mean, I think this is a, this is sort of a challenge for the, for the, the commission. There, the applicant is asking for a PUD and they're asking for a P so that, so the, the floor is open in that sense. And they're asking for a PUD, which has to be based on substantial community benefits. And now to add to that, or to be part of that is what the, what the zoning commission is properly concerned with, which is racial equity. And so it seems to me we have to demonstrate rather rather than me figuring out and responding to you to 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 you immediately off the top of my head about saying whether asking whether we we have room to move the question is um have they is there room for this whole project to move to respond properly to what a pud demands of of uh, demands of of the what the what the decision demands from PUD. But that's the way I'd answer it. Um, our 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 commission, I can assure you, is ready to sit down at the table again and sort of understand what parameters are are movable. But it needs the the context in which this this happens is where is whether this decision for development is going to be is going to respect the um the demands of a pug i think that's the way i would answer it i, I appreciate the additional answer i think the challenge is that the density that's being proposed here is consistent with the comprehensive plan the flume you know that designation uh and this is not as aggressive as they might have been um in order to to develop the property so this is that that's why it's 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 kind of hard because it's you know council's already weighed in and said yeah a certain level of density is is acceptable um you know and and then they, then we have to deal with all the other guides and the, all the other concerns that we have but that's that's what i struggle with is that this is not um not outside the realm of possibility and and in another circumstance, this might have been a map amendment, in which case we wouldn't get any of the the, the potential benefits that come with the PUD. So I think that's 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 what I'm struggling with. So anyway, that's it. Thank you. Okay, so I also think, uh, Ms. Kramer, um, I believe there is room. I, that's why I'm really pushing it, uh, because as Commissioner May alluded to, and what you were saying, we we have to go by the comp line, we have to go by the regulations, and and it basically is a fit so it's better for you and the community to work together to try to even if you, you don't get any lesser density or, you, or the height remains the same there are other things that you can come close on of, of put mitigation factors in place to help you because we can decide it but the people who are going to be impacted are the people who live right close around there because i can avoid it which I do, especially when it comes to a lot of traffic. <laughs> so I, I try to avoid it, and I'm sure others do that as well. And here's the other thing. The problem with traffic over there, especially with the pictures that was in the submission that we'll probably be talking about shortly, that goes on even now, and it's been going on for a while. Uh, so it's a bigger problem than, than just this project. So that's why I'm trying to kind of push it back to you all, Commissioner Kramer, because you all are the ones who want to endure whatever's done there. 
and but you know we got to go by the rules this and, and some of the rules i'll be frank on some of my help right and some of them i don't even agree with but it's a compromise among my colleagues to try to balance it so i really hope you all could come closer together so that's that's where i'm going to push and let's and let's see what happens so who all do we get thank you commissioner Graham. oh let's go the african said no um berg you didn't have any cross did you or did i do that already not for the ENC, no, thank you. Okay. Okay, so I think we're good. Let's go now, Ms. Shellen. Ms. I think we go to the party. Do we have a party in support? We do not. So we're going to go to the individuals in support. Okay, and Ms. Ms. Uh, Berg, we'll be coming back to you shortly. Am I pronouncing your name, your name, your last name right? You are, thank you. Oh, okay. I, I finally got one thing right. Y'all, y'all take that down and remember for when I mess up the next couple of times. <laughs> All right. Um, Michelle, could you help me with the list of support? Yes, I will go down the list very quickly and find that, uh, Matthew Bell. I don't know if he's actually going to testify or not. Uh, he might have, he might be part of the applicants team. Yes. He is of, part of. Yeah, sorry. he would have been part. Yeah, he better yes. be in support. Okay. Okay, he's part of the applicants team. So in that case, we have um, uh, none in support. Uh, actually, um, Ivan Fishberg. He is here to testify. I believe from one of the schools. Um, I think he's in support. Okay. Can we just bring okay, him up, up just to see? Yeah, he's up. There he is. Mr. Frischberg, you can go right ahead. And first of all, let us know if you're in support. Opposition undeclared. And if you're in support, you can go right ahead. If it's one of the others, then we'll come back to you. Great. Um, thank you. My name is Ivan Frischberg. I'm the secretary of the Jefferson Middle School Parent Teacher Organization. And we have submitted a letter to the commission uh, in support of the development. Um, uh, Chairman Hood and, and uh, Commissioner Mays, good to be before you again. It was a long time I'd having PUD flashbacks uh, as I sit here <laughs> uh, and throughout this process, to be honest. Yeah. But um, as I said, we've offered our support uh, for the, the building here. Um, a little context, obviously, Jefferson Academy sits really at the intersection of the high density residential communities, a very high end mixed use developments that are going in. We, we have another PUD that's in process on the other border of the of the school, um, and we're in the middle of all the traffic uh, that that you all have been discussing. Um, but since its beginning in 1939, uh, this historic building has been uh, a school, and it's been in many ways the center of the Southwest community. Um, and uh, we <laughs> we've gone through our own modernization and renovation in the last few years, courtesy of the of the city, uh, and are kind of attempting to kind of grow along with the neighborhood. Um, so with all of this in mind and, and a clear understanding of the the impacts of development um, that it can have on sort of the daily operations of the school and the educational experience of the of our students, the the PTO has taken seriously our interest in you know mitigating the impacts that we can. Um, the you know, we are centrally focused on a construction management agreement. Um, this, you know, over the next few years or however long, in fact, these two developments take um, noise, dust, any any number of issues, act, you know, have a, a real impact on the, the experience in and around the school um, for our students. And so um, a part of what we've agreed to with the um, with the, the applicant here is uh, agreement uh, mutually agreed to uh, on a comprehensive construction management agreement. And uh, the way we are asking the commission to handle this is that it would be a condition, a condition um, and required prior to uh, construction permits being issued. Uh, we don't have a construction management agreement in hand, uh, but we think and we want to retain some leverage to be able to get to an agreement on that uh, before construction starts. Uh, and we have um, 
been very pleased with the applicants or sort of willingness and understanding of the issues and um, uh, agreement to, to address uh, that all through a construction management agreement. Now, uh, in additionally, uh, we, in addition, we have an agreement from the applicant to support $150,000 worth of um, uh, contribution to the PTO to help fund field experiences in curricula uh, support uh, for the students at, at Jefferson Academy, um, particularly on the um, field experiences. We we don't have a we were a Title One school. We don't have a lot of opportunity to take kids off campus without um, some financial support uh, or putting burden on uh, many of the families. Um, and so, uh, you know, especially during construction or key periods, we want to be able to um, take folks off campus. The final piece, which is uh, we don't imagine being in any kind of zoning order, but uh, we have a, a the developer, the applicant is signal a mutual interest is the Department of General Services building that sits in between the school and the uh, Department of uh, Parks and Rec uh, playing fields. Um, it's a storage facility mostly used for snow equipment, salt. It is highly inappropriate to be in the front yard of a school. You have heavy equipment coming in and out. I, and so, but DGS has been very reluctant to ever discuss doing anything with that, uh, despite council efforts. Um, and so we think with uh, developer support, community support, uh, the school uh, and uh, uh, Council Member Charles Allen, we have a better chance of taking that uh, that facility and turning it into something that can really be uh, an amenity and a benefit for the for the community. Um, so, with that, uh, happy to answer any questions and um, appreciate your your service and your work uh, in taking on this case and all the others that you do. Thank you uh, very much for your testimony, Mr. Frischberg, and. I'm going to have to remember that. I won't use it tonight, but one of these other hearings, I'm going to say PUD flashbacks. So thank you. <laughs> uh, let's see if we have any questions or comments for you, uh, Commissioner May. Oh, my God. We have flash chat flashbacks all the time. Um, <laughs> yeah, I remember uh, Commissioner Frischberg uh, when you were before us uh, for that PUD down the street from me. Um, but I don't have any questions for you. I appreciate your testimony and your um, your approach to the this project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Eamon Moore. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, no comments. Uh, Mr. Frischberg, thank you for adding uh, PUD flashback to my vocabulary. So thank you. <laughs> and um, Vice Chair Miller. <clears throat> Uh, no questions. Thank you very much for your testimony and for your work with uh, Jefferson. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Does the applicant have any questions? Questions, but I want to thank Mr. Fishberg for his testimony this evening. Thank you. And Commissioner Kramer, you have any questions? No, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thanks. Okay, Ms. Uh, Ms. Berg, you have any questions? No, I also think uh, Mr. Frischberg, as the parent of a potential for future Jefferson student, I appreciate you uh, meeting with the developer on this. Thank you. All right, Mr. Frischberg, again, we all thank you for your taking the time out to come down and give us that side of the story. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Have a good night. You too. Have a nice evening. Ms. Ms. Uh, Shellen, anybody else that we have? No one else in support. So next we have the um, party in opposition and um, they are, um, they do have an expert witness that they want to proffer. Ms. Berg, do you want to name your expert? Uh, Patricia Giorno um, should be elevated to a speaker as well as Gustavo Pinto is, um, you know, part of the committee. Um, and is on our witness list, Corinne Carroll and Gail Fast as well. But our expert witness is both a, a member of the association and a trained architect who will be speaking in an expert uh, capacity in her testimony. Would you like her to go first? What the commission like needs, to, we need to need accept to her as an expert. Do we know what exhibit her, her 
Is it in? Is it with your exhibit? Uh, it should be with our exhibit. It's, she has her own um, testimony that she's uploaded as well. I can. I know it's in that as well. Um, um, their yeah. exhibit was twenty two. Two grand. Okay. So it should be in there. Uh, commissioners, we have a request. Um, oh no. Do we have a resume for the expert? I, I wouldn't I didn't see that. I don't believe so because I looked at this. I saw the articles in the corporation. Um, it should be in 22. And is it at the end? It must be at the it end. Be towards the end. We had to put our bylaws and all the other stuff in there. Yeah, I saw, I saw that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, her resume is the exact last page. Oh, got it. Okay, thank you. 3D designer architect. AutoCAD, SketchUp. Uh, so I'm, I usually depend on uh, Commissioner May and Commissioner Amy Moore on these statuses. Yeah, um, so the, the question that we typically ask when we qualify someone as an architect is whether they are licensed, and I don't see indication in the re resume that. Um, this. I have a group chat. It'll either come. It'll either come through the group chat, or she should be in some. Um, I don't know if it's. Yeah, able she's on to screen. Her. Is yeah. She on screen? Okay. Yeah. So, can you ask that question? Are you are you licensed? I'm not licensed in the U.S. I'm licensed in Brazil. Okay. All right. Well, that's good enough for me. Um, that's 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 sort of the typical minimal minimum threshold for us licensure if you're going to be called by architecture. That's the terrible rule. Okay. All right. Um, any, yeah. Any, any, any other questions or comments? All right. Uh, so unless I hear some objections, we will follow uh, Commissioner May's lead and Commissioner even more. Unless I hear some any objections. Okay. So you will get expert status. For most. Thank you. All right, um, Ms. Berg, you may begin, or however you all want to set it up. How much time do they have again, Michelle? Fifty-eight minutes. Fifty-eight minutes. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, thank you, commissioners, for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, excuse me. Excuse me. One second, uh, Vice Chair Miller. You need to take a break. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I was just waving to uh, Archie. He was going to bed. Oh. <laughs> I apologize. I should have stopped my video. Well, good night, Archie. Okay, so Ms. Berg, I'm sorry, you may uh, begin. I may be interrupted by a young one too, um, <laughs> uh, but I hopefully not. I can make through this a couple of minutes here first and I'll go back off camera. But um, as uh, the record shows, my name is Erin Berg. I'm the president of the Capital Square Homeowners Association. Um, I'm a Southwest DC resident of over a decade. And I'm the parent of a child who uh, attends a Jefferson Middle School feeder elementary. Um, I just want to take a minute to say that I wrote my testimony um, prior to a lot of the discussions tonight, so I don't mean to be repetitive. I'll try to cut out what I can. Um, but I just want to let you all know that I'm supported here in my role tonight, not only by our board of directors, um, but also by a committee of association members who put in many hours of personal time to research and respond to this PUD, including surveying our membership of all 93 townhome owners for their thoughts and identifying consensus on certain proposed elements. Um, and it's also of note that a good portion of time, many, many hours have been to research the PUD process itself. Um, how to submit documents and testimony and party status. And so being a novice to the process, I apologize in advance if I misspeak to anything. Um, we are unusually affected um, because of our location. Um, and we know that many visitors to the wharf, including those who park currently in the existing 809th Street, um, speed through our private roads to access the wharf without having to de deal with the main avenue traffic. Um, we also experienced swells of foot traffic using sidewalks um, that we um, pay to maintain uh, because we are, um, you know, homeowners association of townhouses. Um, and we would expect that both types of traffic would increase um, as residents of 899 Main travel to and from um, Lenfant Plaza and other places. Um, we mind that foot traffic less. We believe in the activation of spaces, keeps it safer. 
Um, it doesn't usually endanger our residents the way that the car traffic does, um, but we have had issues with public urination, with people um, having property damage and theft, um, people coming and going from the wharf um, late at night. And while we accept um, that living near a great place like the wharf, which we wholly supported um, and enjoy um, uniformly across our development, we know that comes with trade-offs such as noise, traffic, crime, and the like, and we've done whatever we can to mitigate the negative um, impacts with our limited resources. And that includes um, going for party status in this process in order to make sure that our voice is heard and can be considered by the Zoning Commission and any approval. Um, we have many concerns with the 899 Man Avenue project. Um, my testimony should adopt most of what you've heard. Um, you'll hear further in depth from my neighbors um, or that you've seen in the case file being um, written submissions and letters of opposition. Um, but in particular, we are concerned with building height um, because of the small area plan, we want the conservation of the Southwest character, um, as well as to minimize the number of people being drawn to the site due to the number of units and the density. Um, the affordable housing component, we think 15% is um, way less than is appropriate. Um, and we do actually oppose um, the concept of the retail use because we feel that will drive more traffic and trucks to the site um, where there's, as you <laughs> well know now, and you'll see again, um, that uh, it's completely unsustainable at the moment. And we don't feel that the developer has um, adequately addressed not only their own impact, but we do feel that if they're requesting such a significant variation from the current zoning, that they do have some responsibility to at least um, work on mitigation of the entire um, area. It just feels like that should be a public benefit that we expect from them as well. Um, We've also benefited um, in our work, not just our committee, um, with other parties in the neighborhood, um, Southwest DC Action and um, our ANC. We um, adopt all of the positions that the ANC is described in Exhibit 84. Um, the applicant's PUD violates the spirit of the community residents and it's um, articulated by the community residents in the Southwest Small Area Plan. It violates the vision of Main Avenue that is incorporated in the Small Area Plan. It would deleteriously affect the social and economic diversity of the community. Um, it will create unsafe traffic conditions detrimental to the community and provides no adequate plan for their amelioration. And that it doesn't, we don't feel that the benefits that they're um, offering, which uh, admittedly I put that in there um, prior to learning that they did make an offer to Jefferson, um, but we still feel that the majority of what they're calling benefits don't warrant such an extraordinary exception to the small area plan um, in the current zoning. Now, some of the letters that you've received have called us NIMBYs, and they've emphasized that we in Capitol Square live in a low density, high property value development, and we acknowledge those characteristics. Um, but I assure you, we do want a building in our backyard, and it's front yard for a majority of us, including some of my neighbors you'll hear from today. They look at it every day. Um, it's possible to live where we do and still care deeply about what happens around us, including wanting that Southwest area plan to be followed. Many of our owners um, decided to live in their home based on documents like that. We have a lot of people that are interested in urban planning and in the neighborhood, um, and they knew that this was um, the characteristics that they could expect. Um, as I mentioned, we surveyed all of our members and we didn't receive anything other than a consensus to see the site redeveloped including into residential. We want the pro project to have a measurable amount, that means beyond the minimums of affordable and family size units, um, because we want more people who will live here for a long time. If you can find a family size affordable unit, you're probably gonna live there for a while. It's hard to find in the city. There's gonna be, I think, testimony to that fact that there's very little um, rental uh, family size units. And these are people that will live in the community and become invested in it in the way that our owners are. Um, and we want to see the development at a minimum mitigate its impact on the traffic situation. So as I heard the chair's comments, um, these are the things we want. <laughs> Lower height to keep this block related to Southwest, not the wharf, as well as to reduce the number of people coming and going through our property. The density is a problem. We want more affordable workforce and family housing, again, to encourage long-term residents. Um, and we can do the math. <laughs> we understand that reducing the building height and the number of units means an overall reduction in the number of affordable units. And that's unfortunate. Um, but we can have two beliefs that may be slightly contradictory, but that is how it is. And we also want to hold developers to a precedent for future projects. If they are allowed to 
have lower percentages of affordable housing, then it will continue to be what they ask for and it will be continued to uh, exacerbate the problem. And we also do not want a grocery store or any kind of retail that draws significant car traffic. I think that the developer, um, the applicants estimates of car traffic is, um, especially in the, the early stages when it's new and exciting is woefully inadequate. Um, we think that there needs to be more work on the intersection, including adjusting the curb cuts. <laughs> How many? It's, it's good that we're not doing a drinking game on curb cuts tonight, but I think that this will make it much worse um, having the grocery store there. I think there are other retail uses that the, the area needs that will not necessarily require a car to shop. Um, so while we knew this building would be redevelopment, uh, redeveloped, we expected something more along the lines of a, a true mid-rise residential building that has recently been built, like the banks which is over on 7th Street, which is shorter than what is proposed here. We wanted an appropriate retail or a restaurant uh, on the ground floor. Um, some community members threw out the idea of a Wawa, which I'm not even sure if that's um, feasible there, but like something that people aren't necessarily going to drive to, but that will fulfill a need for lower cost food options down at the wharf so that visitors of all income level can enjoy the experience of being down there without necessarily having to pay $9 for a Shake Shack hamburger. We thought that um, the developer would um, be uh, open to changing the curb cuts to help funnel visitors to the south side, not include uh, encourage the flow to that corner. And we also thought that the, the applicant would want um, to come and observe from our vantage in their traffic study um, so that residents and visitors can safely come to the building without increasing their burden on our private roads or the traffic situation. Um, these hopes never materialized. Um, we got this giant building 130 feet at its actual height, 150 if you want to count those penthouses. That's more than triple the current zoning. That's not a variation. Um, there's this promise of a grocery store, which again, we're kind of against in concept, but again, there's been no nothing concrete offered to show that this is what actually will be there. Um, and they're attracting letters of support for their entire building based on these promises that are not certain. Um, this is probably the worst part of the quadrant to put such a grocery store. So I'll, I'll stop talking about that. Um, but again, the case file demonstrates that people from quite far away from Southwest are super excited about more grocery stores in the area, especially if we do do a specialty retailer that you can't find in other areas. So to summarize our feelings, again, we want to equivocally state that while we do expect and want um, to work with the developer and work with the applicant on this building, we feel that this PUD is not just a variance, it's a radically massive departure. It makes assumptions and promise of things that may not deliver. Um, the applicant says that they don't think that this is part of a, the wharf, but they want a building that will feel like part of the wharf, and it's not the wharf. The anchor of this block is not District Square, the Anthem, the Fish Market, it's Jefferson Middle School Academy, which I know they are in support of that, but in terms of a feel of the block, this will radically depart from the Southwest feel that's here. We're not compared, com compelled by their drive to profit as much as possible from this development. They gambled to purchase a tiny parcel and to force an enormous building on it with tenuous benefits to the community is not something that we should have to bear the costs of. So aside from those rational considered concerns that we have, I want to raise the issue of, of the applicants and their council's conduct in this process. They cite many community meetings. It's important to know that the meetings that we attended, they invited us to, including the first meeting where they said, you probably have party status. Um, they set the agenda. They told us what they want to do, and then they were uh, the, this, the tones of their voice were dismissive and indifferent to our concerns. We asked for documents such as the traffic study in advance of its filing so we could provide feedback. We did not receive that. We asked for plans and documents to form basis for statements that they tried to tell us, such as that their site was grandfathered into the wharf, and that's why they could do a map amendment instead of propose the PUD. We also have asked to be party to a construction management agreement. Nothing to that effect has been offered to us. I keep hearing Jefferson talk about that, and I understand why they feel that that's probably the most important part of that. None of that has been offered to us. So we feel that this is a minimal effort that they've made to engage with us to check a box, um, and then they've refused to see what they can change um, in their scope. This complete lack of effort to hear our concerns has manifested in a couple of disappointing actions, including trying to silence us by rejecting our party status application. Um, 
And, you know, as you can see, not only is it frustrating to us, but it's confusing to the zoning process. It took you a couple minutes to figure out what was happening with our party status applications because we felt like we needed to go beyond to be able to be heard. Um, the latest tactic is this website that we've talked about. Um, you know, it's 899main.com. Um, a PDF of the website was included in testimony from another um, Southwest resident. And now we've heard that that um, website was only disseminated to eight apartment buildings, not us, not other townhomes, and I assume not residents of public housing or uh, renters that are in, um, in our townhouses. Um, a neighbor uh, was curious and Google some of the letters of support, which include at least two Jerry Lynch employees. Um, and we also, as you've heard, a number of the residents live quite far from Southwest. Um, the site that they've been soliciting these letters of support for has no content beyond some pictures and these promises of unnamed grocery stores, banks, bike lanes, and it creates a form that auto sends the information directly to your zoning commission email. Um, we also have uh, members associated with us, not members of our association, some tenants that created a petition that was included in the case file. Um, over 200 people um, signed that. We do know that there are some addresses in those that look um, outside of the area, but it uses IP address. So even some of our um, residents that were traveling when they signed it, it looks like they're out of the area. Um, well, maybe we'll claim credit for 100 of those folks, but that's a lot of people that um, signed that petition. In that petition, it links to the Zoning Commission's website. It tells you how to find all of the documents you can use to make an informed decision. 899main.com has none of that. So it makes you wonder how informed those submitters actually are. And based on their comments, if you take a minute, you can tell that it's folks that are just one offing sending you um, a comment such as Main Street is a mess. I don't understand how that is substantive or useful to um, the commission's deliberation. It just feels like it probably weighs um, down your time taking to, to look at things. Um, and also, I happen to notice that the procedures that you've set for submitting letters of support by email require it to be sent by the writer to ZC submissions at dc.gov. So I hate wasting your time <laughs> discussing this website because I know that you will weigh the letters with substantive concerns from Southwest residents more than these. But it makes my point as to why, if the applicants are so convinced that their project offers these benefits to the community, why do they feel the need to silence the community in these ways or to cover up the opposition in the community in these ways? Why must they be disingenuous to get support for their project? This conduct has its concerns not only about the final building that will come up, but whether they'll be responsive to us during that construction period when we have concerns. It'll be a long couple of years for us if they don't reverse their course of ignoring us. And yes, to answer the chair's question, no matter the outcome that the commissioner's careful consideration of this PUD um, it occurs, I hope that the applicant will take our testimony and, and communicate it to, uh, to heart and reapproach us, as well as other, welcome other community stakeholders into the process. So thank you again for the opportunity to provide this testimony. I am joined um, by Corinne Carroll um, and Gustavo Pinto and possibly also Gail Fast, who is with Town Square Towers, um, but she is also registered to represent them. So maybe we can shorten it by just having her um, go later. So uh, Corinne, are you, are you on? Has she been admitted? Hi, Corinne. Great. Um, thank you for the opportunity tonight to speak with you regarding my concerns about this proposed development. <clears throat> I'd like to shift gears a little bit and perhaps speak from more of a personal perspective. My husband and I are homeowners at Capitol Square Place. Our property is on that famous corner, 9th and G, within 200 feet of the proposed development. We chose our home as a place to live in our retirement. We were seeking a vibrant, walkable community that had a strong sense of history, a diverse demographic, resources for us as we aged in place, and opportunities for us to volunteer in service to our community, which is something we value. We might be new to the neighborhood, but we're not strangers to the district. We both lived here as kids and as young working parents. Our only child was born here, educated here, and resides here with his young family. Her granddaughter attends public school here, as will her younger sister. 
we were very much aware that the former office building located on the proposed site for 899 Main was subject to redevelopment, and we welcomed that. However, we researched the existing zoning regulations that governed this future development and redevelopment there and throughout Southwest, and we felt confident that the regulations in place would guide the growth and development in a sensible and constructive manner. Bottom line, we trusted in the process that was used to develop the comprehensive plan and the small area plan. We also supported the development, redevelopment of the Southwest waterfront as a regional center now known as the wharf. We are both old enough to know what the waterfront was like back in the day when other than the fish markets and hoe gates with their famous rum buns was the only reason to visit here. We understood that the PUD for the wharf was approved as a one time plan and was never intended to encompass the entire Southwest area or specifically alter the zoning regulations for the neighborhoods and public school adjacent to the proposed building. It was not intended to encompass self-proclaimed wharf-facing or wharf-adjacent projects. Under this special one-time plan for the wharf, the density across Main Avenue as you transition into the adjacent neighborhoods would maintain their current designation as having reduced density to be more compatible with the existing structures and character of Southwest. The small area plan specifically calls for keeping the Southwest neighborhood diverse and inclusive. It further states that Southwest's most defining characteristic is its people. We join with our neighbors in Southwest, including the more than 200 residents who signed the locally initiated change.org petition that Aaron mentioned to raise our concerns about the proposed development and ask that the zoning commission support us in challenging this development in its current form. We're not opposed to new development or redevelopment in Southwest that maintains the character of the community and contributes to building a viable, inclusive, and supportive community for individuals and families as outlined in the comprehensive plan and the small area plan. All of these factors that have been discussed tonight that we have raised as concerns are detrimental to the quality of life for the current residents of the Southwest neighborhood. Adding additional high rise buildings along Main Avenue does not create an urban gateway to the Southwest neighborhood as the applicant has suggested. Instead, this type of development will further divide the community and endanger the diverse and inclusive nature of the neighborhood. The applicant has indicated the proposed building will house a full service branch bank and a grocery store. Banks haven't enjoyed much success in the nearby Navy Yard. I'm hoping that this project will be more successful. And while a grocery store might be welcome, it's important to note that the applicant has committed a minimum of 6,000 square feet. And Mr. Miller, you stole a little of my thunder with all your facts and figures about the grocery stores, but I have a few to add. Currently, the average Trader Joe's is about 8,500 square feet to 15,000 square feet. The smaller Trader Joe's um, typically are not able to sell alcohol or another type of store to sell tobacco products given the close proximity to this middle school. The new Whole Foods in Glover Park, which features the just walk out technology, measures 21,500 feet. Deliveries made to this proposed store will be next to impossible due to the fragmented nature of the collector and local serving streets in this area. Another question I might ask is, will a new grocery store in any way conflict with low or no local competition agreements that may be currently in place with the existing grocery store in Southwest? Finally, our community-wide focus on maintaining the integrity and character of Southwest cannot be dismissed as some loud NIMBY effort to block the evolution and growth in the area. In addition to the legitimate issues that have been raised by numerous community residents, we are also extremely concerned about the precedent that will be set if any variances from the existing zoning regulations are allowed. Every empty lot 
or redevelopment opportunity for aging housing units, outdated public facilities, and underused publicly owned land will likely seek the same type of variance to existing regulations. Random zoning variances throughout Southwest will create high rise canyons along the few major streets of Southwest and exclude all but the most affluent of residents. I thank you again for your time. Gustavo, are you here? Yes, I am on. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, good evening, Chairman Hood. Good evening, commissioners, and to all those watching this hearing. Thank you for your time and for the opportunity to speak at this meeting. I prepared a short PowerPoint presentation that I shared with the commission on Monday. Would it be possible to put it on the screen? Gustavo, I think you can present it, or do you want me to do it? Uh, my share content button is not working. Okay, okay Paul is sharing. Uh, it should be a different PowerPoint. It's, it's a different one, Paul. It's actually exhibit uh, Maybe I can get I can get started uh, while Paul is searching for the presentation. Uh, so my name is Gustavo Pinto. I live at 817 G Street Southwest. I've been a resident of the Southwest waterfront area since 2017. My house is located in the Capital Square community, more precisely on G Street Southwest, across the street from the proposed development on 899 Main Avenue, and adjacent to the private driveway entrance into Capital Square Place on G Street Southwest. Yeah, that's the one. Thank you, Paul. I was asked to provide this testimony uh, because of the location of my house, uh, which allows me to experience firsthand the challenges brought on by the new developments in the Southwest waterfront area to the traffic on our neighborhood, particularly on G Street Southwest and within our Capital Square Place community. Can you turn to the next slide, please? Thank you. I submitted a written testimony as Exhibit 63 of the case files. My testimony includes a detailed explanation of the grave concerns that I and my neighbors have about the traffic impact of this project, including several pictures of the traffic incidents on G Street Southwest and 9th Street to support my testimony. I don't need to repeat my whole uh, written testimony here, but I would like to highlight some key points for your attention if you allow me. Since the conclusion of phase one of the wharf, it has become routine to have traffic on G Street Southwest, not only on weekends, but also during weekdays. I frequently see traffic jams on G Street Southwest, stretching all the way from 7th Street to 9th Street, effectively blocking the whole street. These traffic problems become worse when there are events at the wharf or shows at the Anthem, which as many of you know, occur almost every week. We're now facing the possibility of having the situation aggravated even further by the proposed development. I believe this high rise and high density development will exacerbate the already chaotic tra traffic situation on G Street Southwest and surrounding areas. In order to better illustrate the gravity of the current traffic situation in the area, I'd like to show a few pictures. Next slide, please. So as the saying goes, uh, a picture is worth uh, a thousand words. So this is what I wanted to show you. You can see here the chaotic traffic situation at the intersection of G Street Southwest and 9th Street, precisely where the project is located. That three-story building that you see behind the tree, the trees is the, the one that the developer wants to demolish. You can also see here the curb cut entrance to Capitol Square Place, which is almost directly across the street from the PUD area. Next slide, please. This is a picture of the same intersection from another day and from a different angle where you can see Jefferson Middle School in the back. Next slide, please. This is a picture from my living room window so that you can see what do I mean when I say that I have a firsthand experience on the traffic issues of G Street Southwest. Sure you can imagine how delightful it is to come back home and try to watch a movie or have dinner with this mess happening outside your house. Next slide, please. 
This is a picture from a regular Wednesday afternoon. I wanted to add it to the presentation show to show you that the traffic issues happen not just during evenings or weekends, but also during regular weekdays. Next slide, please. In addition to regular traffic, the development is also problematic because of its location, which is prone to accidents, as many have already mentioned. As you can see here, the area envisaged for the project is located at the intersection of 9th Street, G Street Southwest, and the I-395 off-ramp. Next slide, please. The I-395 off-ramp is frequently used by cars having mechanical issues, such as overheating or flat tires. These cars will often stop as soon as they enter G Street Southwest and sometimes have to be towed, blocking the street and causing traffic jams. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, Paul, I think it was split into two files. So the next exhibit should have the remaining slides. Yeah, perfect. Okay, uh, so I mean, these are two two other pictures of uh, cars that uh, had flat tires or mechanical problems as they exited uh, the I three ninety five off ramp. Um, Paul. Do you, do you have the next uh, pictures? All right, let me continue. Yes, that's the one. Thank you. Can you turn to the next slide, please? Okay, so having lived in the area for five years, I have also witnessed several traffic accidents caused by cars coming off the tunnel on 9th Street heading down to Main Avenue and cars exiting I-395 trying to enter G Street Southwest. These accidents often require blocking the entrance of G Street, which quickly leads to a chaotic situation as cars heading north on 9th uh, Street Southwest have nowhere to go, causing a traffic standstill. Next slide, please. So this is a car that was overheating and caught on fire after exiting the I-395. The picture was taken from the building that is currently in the PUD area. You can see my house uh, and the curb cut entrance to Capitol Square Place in the back. I wanted to note that these pictures represent just a limited sample from my records. For the past couple of months, I was able to record several other occasions of traffic or incidents on G Street Southwest and surrounding streets. I'm not going to show everything as I would probably be banned from ever presenting in a zoning commission hearing again, but I would be happy to share the full records with the commission, including more than 100 pictures and videos if you would like to see them. Next slide, please. Now, it is exactly in this very chaotic area that I have just shown you that the developer proposes to include a curb cut for the building. We believe this location is very problematic since the area is already susceptible to traffic and accidents. This is aggravated by the fact that the building's curb cut on G Street Southwest will be right in and right out, whereas the curb cut on Main Avenue will be right in only and limited to grocery trucks larger than 35 feet in length meaning that all the vehicles coming into the building will exit through the G Street Southwest curb cut, including all these large semi trucks. By adding more traffic, including from large semi trucks to an area that already experiences heavy traffic and is frequently used by vehicles with mechanical problems, we risk having mayhem on G Street Southwest right next to the Capitol Square Place community, Jefferson Field and Jefferson Middle School. Next slide, next slide, please. The location of the curb cut also raises significant concerns for our Capitol Square Place residents, since it is located almost directly across the street from our curb cut entrance. In the past, we saw employees from the US Department of Agriculture, which used to be situated in the building currently located in the PUD site, cut through our community to access the building. We are worried that the development will cause the same issue and probably in greater magnitude than before given the high density of the project, supply trucks for the building's planned grocery store tenant and delivery drivers and other service providers for the building's residents. The increased traffic of outside vehicles in our community is cause of great concern to Capitol Square Place residents as they are often not mindful of speed limits within the private driveways, posing a safety risk to residents, particularly children and pets. In this slide that I'm showing you, you can see how vehicles going to the building or exiting the building may try to cut through our community. This is not a speculation. This is based on past experience. 
just picture someone leaving the building who needs to go to Main Avenue. They can only do so on G Street, since Main Avenue, uh, uh, the curb code on Main Avenue is right in only. That person exits the building and finds traffic on G Street South first. What do you think they're going to do? Wait patiently to go all the way around the block sitting in traffic, or just cut through Capitol Square Place and take 9th Street South? I think the answer is clear. Um, the same goes for people coming off the tunnel on 9th Street and facing traffic as they approach the intersection. And that will be particularly the case if they install a traffic signal as they're suggesting. Do you think they're just gonna sit in traffic or are they gonna cut through uh, our capital uh, square place community to access the building? Um, we have had some opportunities to interact with the developers, legal and technical advisors to express our concerns. They took note of our concerns as said that they would aim to address them in an amendment of the PUD. However, the revised PUD does not address our concerns, particularly the location of the curb cut on G Street. The proposed reconfiguration of 9th Street also does not address the increased traffic on G Street Southwest, nor the related risks, particularly those arising from vehicles experiencing mechanical issues when they exit the I-395 offering. Regrettably, our community is not mentioned even once in the developer's traffic study. The situation becomes even more egregious when, can, when we consider that 899 Main Avenue will be adjacent to Jefferson Middle School and Jefferson Field. It is astonishing that the developer plans to build this high-rise, high-density building right next to a public school and a public park. Schools and parks should be surrounded by open space and tranquility, not buildings and constant noise from traffic jams and construction trucks. Now, let me finish by saying that we understand the applicant's business interest and, as residents of the D.C. waterfront area, we welcome the development of our neighborhood. However, this needs to be done in a careful and planned manner. Redesignating the zoning of the PD area from MU-12 to MU-9A would almost triple the current height limit for the area and more than triple the density limit in terms of floor area ratio. Having such a drastic change in the zoning of the PD area, particularly in light of the upcoming inauguration of phase two of the war, entails significant risks and sounds borderline reckless. The decision on the developer's request will cause a significant and permanent negative impact on the traffic and living conditions in the southwest waterfront area, particularly on the well-being of the neighboring communities, which include Jefferson Middle School students and Jefferson Field visitors. For this reason, I respectfully request that the Zoning Commission does not approve this project until the traffic and all the other issues with the project are satisfactorily resolved. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Gustavo. Um, and then we have our uh, expert witness and neighbor, uh, Patricia Giorno. Hi, I'll start uh, introducing myself. My name is Patricia. I'm an architect and urban planner. I have a 16 year uh, experience in design development, construction administration and 3D designs. I'm a part of the committee formed by the Capital Square uh, Homeowners Association to assess the impact of the new development in the surrounding areas. And I'll make some <clears throat> technical comments. And I'll start uh, talking about the different heights of the building. So next slide, please. As mentioned by Erin, uh, they mentioned in the PUD materials that the maximum height of the building will be 130 feet. But it's important to note that they are using G Street as a measuring point, not Main Avenue. And if the building height is measured uh, using Main Avenue as the measuring point, the height will be 140 feet, excluding penthouses. And if we add the penthouses to the total height, we'll be more, uh, it will be more than 160 feet on Main Avenue uh, Southwest, not 150, will be 160. Uh, <clears throat> giving the height of about 100 feet of uh, the wharf buildings across the street, this will create a corridor or a tunnel effect on Main Avenue. Uh, with high rise buildings on both sides of the avenue and with and with a higher uh, building than the wharf buildings. Right in the pod. Uh, <clears throat> following uh, initial discussions with the developer, they have lowered the height on the side of the building facing G Street uh, from 100 to 90 feet to step down to where the PUD uh, site confronts the townhouses uh, on the north side of G Street. But even after lowering the proposed height by 10 feet, the building height is still almost twice as high as the Capitol Square Place townhouses and twice as high as the maximum height under the current uh, MU-12 zone. We still don't agree with the proposed new height, and we think the step down is not even close to an acceptable height transition. 
Uh, and also uh, their shadow study uh, provided uh, provides an incomplete picture of the impact. Can you uh, move to the uh, the slide number five? So the shadows, uh, the shadow study included in the BUD only shows the static image of the shadow in three different times of the day and the year in order to have a complete picture of the true shadow impact of the building of the surrounding areas. I uploaded my presentation to the Zoning Commission exhibited records showing an animation of the shadow trajectory uh, throughout the day uh, during winter solstice. Is the last, uh, please, can you move to the last uh, slide? It's slide number six. And can you uh, hit play? It's like an animation. You just move. Yeah, it's. You just need to hit the play. Teddy, unfortunately, I think it turned it into a PDF file. Uh, no, no, no. It's a it's a video. Yeah, okay. Oh, it's a PDF. Oh, that's weird. I can share. Can I share my screen? My my. My my presentation is a PowerPoint presentation. No, you're not going to be able to share your screen, uh, Mr. Young. Is there anything we can do with that? Yeah, if you give me a minute, I can bring up the PowerPoint. Okay. okay let's give him a moment, please. Okay, so I'll uh, just uh, talk about the the fact that they are using a non-existing building uh, in all this, their uh, 3D models. Uh, the, the, the building is the A207 PUD, the case 2211, that the Zoning Commission refused to even hear on September 15. And we don't have uh, another building with the same height in the block. So this is a misleading information. And I will just finish with if we can just uh, show the last the video. This is all I have. Yes, perfect. So if you hit the play, you can see the shadow like moving. This is the winter solstice. So it's the 8, 9 a.m., 10, 11. Oh, yeah, so you need to hit the play. This is the morning. And then noon. 1 a.m., 1 p.m., 2 p.m., 3, 4. And five and the Jefferson field, you can, you can see the impact on the Jefferson field the whole afternoon and also in the uh, capital square uh, townhouses. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patty. Um, and thank you commissioners for allowing capital square to, um, to recognize our party status. And to speak with you all tonight, um, you know, I, we don't take your time for granted. I know that this is what you do. Um, and I also appreciate your tolerance of us being uh, novices to this process and explaining things um, when needed. Um, again, we just want to reiterate that we welcome the development of the site, um, but that the density and height is a problem as well as uh, the traffic that it will draw. And then we want to be good neighbors um, by ensuring that we um, uplift the small area plan and other district policies the, to uh, Aaron, Aaron, emphasize. I'm, Aaron, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but we still have Gail. Oh, that's right. Is Gail ready to go? I'm sorry. She said she was going to testify on her own. Oh, I'm sorry. We do have one other party um, in there as well. So, um, Gail, are you there? I am here. Um, Thank you, Gail. Uh, I apologize, everyone. No, sorry. Um, uh, Chairman Hood, I just want to make sure that um, I'm testifying in the, the right realm. So I, I don't live at Capitol Square. Um, I've submitted written testimony. I'm here on behalf of Town Square Towers. So if you want me to wait and just do my five minutes, um, I'd be more than glad to do that. I just want to make sure I do it in the correct vein. 
Ms. Fast, you are an expert in front of us. So uh, <laughs> I guess my question, I, I'm gonna ask you a question. Are you part of the, this party in opposition or, or is your, are your issues, are you different? So, well, my issues are, are very similar, um, but Town Square Towers is not a party. We, we're not uh, within 200 okay. feet of the of the development. That's why I want to make sure that I do this. Yeah, I think, like I said, you're an expert. Why don't you hold up for a moment? Let us finish sure. with uh, town, town, uh, Capitol Square, and then we will. Um, um, that sounds wonderful. We will come back to you. That sounds okay. wonderful. All right. Thank you. All right, Ms. Bird, we, we may have some questions of you and your party. Um, Absolutely. Let me open it up to my colleagues. Well, let me let me start off, Ms. Bird. Um, you heard me probably been saying for the last how many hours has it been there <laughs> about continue to collaborate. It's and I'm gonna go back to the question that Commissioner May uh, asked of um, the ANC. This in height. If that's not the if that's not the fix all, say if that doesn't change, is meeting with them a non-starter. Well, we would we absolutely love to continue to meet with them um, okay. if we were able to have compromise on some of the elements. I guess that's the thing is we'll sit down, but they have to come to the table with willingness to listen and, and see what they can do. Um, we know that it would reduce their profit on the building and, you know, but if they want our support, which supposedly they do, there are some compromises that would need to be made. Okay. So, so you heard me, I'm pushing, uh, I don't live in the neighborhood and I'm sure the city is pushing for more affordable housing, not exactly as we see it now. Uh, I know there are other neighbors who want to see affordable housing and it comes to a tipping point where it does not, fe it's not feasible. You know, we get to that point. So in those negotiations, let's keep all that under consideration. Also, I got to refresh my memory on the small area plans. We've been through this before. Uh, we're bound to look at be not inconsistent with the comp plan. You know, I've always said this, we got more plans in this city that contradict themselves, but I'm sure that they're in place for a reason. I'm not the, uh, some of these things have been out there for years and they have worked. Um, so the question is, and I'm, I'm gonna ask our legal counsel, do we look at this? I've been, I think I've been, well, I don't wanna get into which plan I'm supposed to look at the most, what's not being inconsistent, uh, whether I'm, uh, be holding to the small area plan, I get confused and that changes uh, for me every so often, but I, I get that. Uh, I'm gonna check with our counsel and make sure we're in the legal realm of what we're supposed to be doing. Um, but I will say that I wanna make sure that when you all go into, if, you, if you're gonna continue to have those discussions, that you go in there with an open mind, knowing that like in any case, I don't even on the commission. I don't get everything I want, and, I, and I'm the chairman. But I got one vote, <laughs> and sometimes I don't get everything I want. But uh, and that's why it's five. Well, it'll soon be five of us. But I'll just leave it at that. So let me open it up for any. Uh, did you want to comment, Ms. Berg, on what I said? Just that um, I know Gail's testimony does touch on the small area area plan a lot, discussing the elements and the process that went into it. Um, okay. Maybe okay. Briefly yeah, I get maybe, that. Yeah, okay. I get it. All right, well, thank you. And I, I want to also thank the, the panel, the party in opposition, and all the work you all have put in. But let's open it up and let's go to uh, Commissioner May. Uh, I just have one quick question for uh, Mr. Pinto, who provided photographs of cars that had broken down on G Street, have, I guess having come off the, the freeway. I'm just curious, if, I mean, you, you showed us a few pictures of it. I'm curious about what the frequency is. Is that a daily occurrence, a weekly occurrence, a monthly occurrence? Or do you have um, any sense? It's, it's, uh, it depends a lot, uh, Commissioner May. Uh, I would say that uh, an average may be once every two weeks. Okay, thank you. I know you didn't ask me that, but I actually used to work in 800 uh, 9th Street. Uh, I worked for the USDA and the picture of the car fire I took when I worked there um, and I would actually say that between breakdowns, uh, breakdowns are less frequently, but I would say there's at least an accident a week that either happens on um, the gridlock in 395 and they pull off there or it happens there. And today, literally, as I was walking home to get ready for this meeting, there was an accident that happened right there. Um, and like I said, um, MPD came in the wrong direction on G Street to get to it. Um, and then 
I don't know what else happened, but they were blocking the entire um, curb cut. Yeah. So, uh, so it's, it's, it's helpful. It's helpful to know the frequency of accidents. I didn't ask that, but that's helpful to know. But the details of the anecdotes are, are, are less meaningful than understanding what the, the you know, the, the overall frequency of it. So I appreciate that. Thank you. That's it for me, Mr. Chairman. OK, thank you. Uh, Commissioner even more. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think a, a great deal of focus has been uh, put on the uh, traffic issues, and I think everyone can probably agree that any level of development on the site will increase traffic. Um, what I will say is that uh, I, I am certainly sensitive to the height issue and the massing. I get it. Um, I have so it, it gives me some heartburn a little bit, uh, a little bit of pause too. So I, I'm certainly compassionate with that. Um, uh, back to, and the reason why I bring that up, it sounds like um, the, the two issues here are, are the height massing and traffic part. Uh, even if they reduce uh, the height of the building, as I, I just stated, right? No matter what level of uh, development happens there, it's gonna increase traffic. But my point is, is that this is like a what's called the vignette exercise. Essentially, there's only so many, there's only a certain few number of solutions to that traffic uh, situation, especially for the curb cut on G Street. There's just no way, just because of the way the site is configured. So my point is, is that even if you reduce the height, you all will still, um, there, there will still be the traffic issue. Um, so what it is, is it's just a volume issue. And so I think, that's just important to, to distinguish there. Um, and I just wanted to put that out there. So, um, you know, I know people have talked about moving curb cuts here or there, but at the end of the day, the design team goes through a number of iterations to see what works and what doesn't work. And there are only maybe one, two or three solutions at most. Um, and, and that's probably even a stretch for them. So based off of just the way uh, the building is configured, in the program of the building, that's probably a limited number of solutions there. So, um, you know, it, I agree that uh, continued collaboration is good uh, and important, but I also think um, for both parties, uh, it's important to get to yes. So in addition to Chairman Hood's um, good neighbor policy, my policy is what can we do to get to yes? So um, I just wanna put that out there. That's all I have to say, Mr. Chairman. You're back. Okay, and Vice Chair Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, very uh, valuable comments from Commissioner Eamon Moore, as usual. Um, I thank you for your testimony. I thank you for your uh, engagement, um, your involvement in the community, and uh, trying to keep your um, well, trying to uh, better your neighborhood and keep your neighborhood, keep the good aspects of your neighborhood and work for improvements in the neighborhood. Um, specifically, I, 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 I guess I need to go back and look at all the shadow studies and understand that a little better. Uh, but was it Ms. Ramos who, had, who showed us that video? Uh, Went of the shadows on the field. What, what what time of year was that happening at? You probably said it, and I missed it. Uh, winter solstice. When? Winter. Winter solstice. Winter December twenty first. Okay. Well, that's a lot of time when there's a lot of shadow. Unfortunately for all of us, and there's been a lot of shadow for all of us the last week until today, which is depressing until today. <laughs> but um. That was disturbing to see. Uh, the, as someone who uh, gone to many uh, soccer games with my kids uh, 20 and 30 years ago, uh, and we'll be going to future soccer games with my grandkid, who I waved to uh, an hour and a half ago when he was going to sleep. Uh, I don't want to see a shadow at that hour, uh, but in the winter time. It's understandable, but um, I don't know what's happening in the fall. I, I kind of need to compare that with the, uh, maybe the applicant can, I, I need to compare it with what the applicant has submitted and, and understand if there are any discrepancies. Um, 
but that was uh, that was concerning. Um, although winter time, as I said, is it, 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 a difficult time. Uh, the, in terms of the grocery store, it's it, there's the applicant seemed to be responding to the ANC's request for a grocery store. Although the ANC made it clear that they wanted a small, a smaller, and a price a value a value a price point grocery store that can is affordable. Um, you all mentioned, or I don't know if it was you all or 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 somebody else who mentioned the Wawa. Have, did, was there a specific discussion with the applicant of the type of grocery store that you want? I, 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 I've never been to a Wawa, but I know that uh, one of my daughters loved the Wawa coffee for some reason. I, I don't know if I, I want to put it on the record of us advocating for a certain type of yeah, I, I'm sorry to mention but, names, but yeah, um, but yeah. You know, we, we surveyed our, our, our members and some of them like the concept of a grocery store, but their primary concern is the traffic and we can't support a grocery store, especially on this edge of the neighborhood where if it's a real grocery store, people are going to drive to even, even, you know, neighbors in Southwest, it's so far over here. It's not like, you know, the safe they might be. Let me speak. They, they might be less likely to drive to the safe way if they can get the essentials right across the street that they need, you know, People in our neighborhood for sure. Yeah. Our, 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 so we would benefit from a grocery store there. Our folks would not have to drive to the grocery store anymore, but I'm thinking about the neighbors that we're talking about that find the safe way to be, um, not offer what they want or price points they can't afford. Um, they're over in the Southwest. The, the massive Southwest um, east of, of 7th Street, we're sort of a little outlying neighborhood that was built in 2001. So we're not um, urban renewal or anything like that. Um, but, you know, we've been here a while. Um, I'm I'm thinking that, you know, the folks in the apartment buildings by the Safeway that hate the Safeway, they would end up coming over here or if it's a specialty real tailored, um, like a Trader Joe's or something, they would potentially be driving over here. And then we saw in some of the comments that were solicited by the applicant that, you know, a Trader Joe's gets a lot of traffic, um, no matter what neighborhood it's in from people who don't live there because they're not in every neighborhood and people love them. So, um, you know, our it seems contra contrary um, that our our actual development would not want a grocery store. It's it's mainly the traffic impacts that we're worried about with a grocery store. Um, if it was something like the Foxtrot or a Wawa or something that is. I mean, we have a CVS down at the wharf, though, too. Um, but if it's something that offers some essentials um, that people would get on foot and could carry home on foot, that would be fine because um, they're not necessarily going to drive to get that. I leave it up to the applicant to figure out what right. so an there appropriate needs to, there needs to be continued is. collaboration because we they they yeah. want it to work for the neighborhood yeah. and not, and, not and not create a problem. For that, for the, the, where people don't want to go there because they can't get there because it's too much traffic. You know, That's first moved in, I went first into move to my neighborhood before there were the twenty grocery stores uh, that are now here on the Wisconsin Avenue corridor between Frenchers Heights and Georgetown. There was the signs that when we moved into, they would stop the giant giant, which is. Uh, that giant need to be renovated. <laughs> and all those people who wanted to stop the giant giant, my neighbors who wanted to, they, they're all there, uh, but they, they were concerned about people driving from other places when there weren't so many grocery stores. The traffic is just inevitable that it's gonna happen no matter what's, it's, it's kind of inevitable. Um, anyway. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just uh, rambling at this hour, but uh, I, I think food options are good for and choices for you, for the people who are there. Uh, I, I, and, and if, if the city's doing something, doing it, doing what I think we're doing, what we're beginning to do right in trying to equitably distribute more food choices throughout the city, there won't have to be that traveling from other neighborhoods to, to, to another neighborhood to get 
the food options they want. So uh, I just I think there needs to be that continued collaboration. There just seemed to be a a little bit of a, a discrepancy between I thought the applicant was responding to community requests for a food option and you seem to be open to some kind of food option that just doesn't exacerbate the traffic problems. And the traffic problems are a pro are a problem in Southwest. I don't go as often to the wharf as I want to because it's, I will have to cut through your neighborhood because I don't want to make that Title base. If I'm driving, I don't want to make that title base in that horrible one lane thing next to the fish market with that light. And at any time of day, was that was that uh, Mr. Um, the neighbor across the street? Um, you, Mr. May, Commissioner May, asked about the frequency, and it was once every week or a couple of weeks. And you saw something today. Is it mostly during? Is it is it rush hour that that's happening? Is it the school pickup? Drop off. Nope. Certainly, I, I, I've learned uh, in my uh, that you. I don't. Uh, I have the option of not. I don't drive when the school pick up and drop off happens anymore because that's that's worse than the rush hour. So the eight hundred seven Main Avenue project is going to be the one that deals with them. The school pickup. We're we're on the other side and we're we're right by Banneker Overlook and like the Spy Museum and Lenfont Promenade, and so. Most of the middle school kids live in the neighborhood, so they're coming west to Jefferson, and the cars are coming to the the east side of Jefferson for the drop off and pickup. That's where theirs is, or on the um, the north side. Our we see traffic accidents. It it makes there's only a little rhyme or reason. If there's a motorcade on the highway, if there's an accident on the highway, if there's the State of the Union, something like that. If there's a Nats game, because people will get off the highway, it backs up to Navy Yard. They'll get off the highway at Main Avenue and then sit in G Street trying to work their way over. Um, but it happens in the morning because it's the highway. People change lanes there. There's that weird ton when you're trying to get out of the lanes to get onto the 4th Street Tunnel, coming over the bridge where that merge is um you end up going over to East Potomac Park if you're not careful. You have to go over to the second lane. So there's a lot of accidents that occur right at that spot on 395 and they exit at, at Main Avenue um, to call the police. Um, and then there's also ones because we have that stop sign. I don't know if you ever come down the 9th Street Tunnel. We have a stop sign that you can turn left into somebody, uh, turn in front of the person next to you on your left. Um, I don't know how my camera looks, but so we're pulling up to the stop line. People can turn like this in front of you. And these people that are trying to go straight down to the wharf, they're eager for their fish or whatever they're going to get down there. And they slam into people. Or we even had somebody um, do that and get scared and they mistook their gas pedal for a break and ended up in one of our home's front yards, literally, um, because they, they were trying to stop and they floored it. Um, so having lived in the neighborhood for a decade and having had that window office um, at the USDA, I've, I've seen... It's 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 everything. It's event related. It's random, you know. I mean, I mean DDOT is listening. Uh, I hope they're listening. I, yeah. I think they're listening. I think they're trying. I think with the. I think there are a lot of mitigations that are in this plan. I hope that we all hope that they work, and and that the ultimate the, the signalization happens and and eventually. So. Uh, I think we'll get there, but it's it, it, it's going to take a lot of work. Yeah, we accept that there would be more traffic no matter what. We're not trying to say we don't want any. We don't, you know, the Bard. I'm sure you guys are familiar with the the parcel over where Southeast University used to be that is now a rat filled um, empty field. We don't want a situation like that where we can't come to an agreement and it's not profitable enough for the developer. Um, but I think that there's more that can be done to do that. And I also think building at the maximum density that you guys would probably even ever consider. I don't know if they can go higher. I'm not, I've looked at the different MUs and they don't go in order by number. So it's confusing to me what could possibly go there beyond the 9A. Um, but we just feel like with all of the other factors that that height causes, the shadows, the not looking and feeling like the rest of the neighborhood, making that tunnel effect on Main Avenue, um, Decrease coming to a compromise with a moderate height building um, somewhere in between. Because, you know, they, they stepped down the back part, but then they just recapture the density by making the front part taller. 
And so just making the whole thing slightly shorter to at least hear what we're trying to say, like they're calling it hearing what we're trying to say, but they're also not listening to the full of things that we're saying. Um, well, so thank you. Uh, okay, I, I hear what you're saying, and, and I, I commented on the tunnel effect in another case, um, and I don't usually do that on height issues, as Commissioner May knows, with all of our discussions about height for many, many, many years. Um, but I, I would encourage the applicant and you all to try to rebuild the trust that obviously has broken down, which is unfortunate. Um, and try to get to as many uh, as many compromises as you can get to uh, uh, in, in in the weeks and months ahead. So, um, thank you for your for, thank you for your work. Okay, I am. Um, I don't like putting anybody on promise land. I, I heard this whole conversation and everything you mentioned, Ms. Berg. It happens in my neighborhood. We have Costco. Everything you just talked about happens in my neighborhood. It's just in a different area of the city. So that I don't see any situation where we're unique. That's the price I think of living in the city. So so for but for me, and I know that's not the ask you want, I'm not gonna sit here and and patent it because I know all of us go through certain things. There's some things in my neighborhood I would like to go somewhere else, but I have to deal with them. <laughs> and one of them's trash. So I will I will just tell you that all of us have unique things in our in our neighborhoods. Uh, I have many years of working at Waterside Mall, uh, working at US EPA until we moved downtown. So I'm very familiar with Safeway and I watch how people walk from the different neighborhoods to come to that Safeway. I'm very familiar with all that. Very familiar with the banks, how they, a couple of them didn't survive. I'm familiar with all that. But it goes back to my initial point. You might not get everything you want either side, but I think it's good you close together because then again, we have a large cons constituency in this city pushing for affordable housing, especially down in the waterfront area. People want to be able to live down there. People want to be able to get down there. So when you start cutting back and cutting down, guess what? People that look like me can't come down there. We probably can't come down there regardless, but I'm just saying we have a better opportunity. If, if and, and that's what I'm hearing loud and clear with, about this racial equity. So we have to balance all that. We're gonna go. I'm gonna go by the regulations. Uh, I, I hear you loud and clear. Even if we do put some mitigation methods in place, I'm not sure if it's gonna solve any of the problems. I'm not really sure. So I'm not gonna sit here and, and toss around. And I know it's getting late, but, but I'm not gonna sit here and, and act like this stuff doesn't exist because I live here too. It exists, but I think if we continue to have conversations. All of us together can eventually, eventually get to a better outcome. Because guess what? Uh, uh, to to party, Ms. Berg and others, you all live there, Mr. Pinto. Y'all gonna have to endure it. I can leave and go out the Beltway and go around to do so. Well, that's probably even worse. I shouldn't say that, but I'm just <laughs> saying. Uh, let's let's try to see if we can work around. I'm saying this for not just for us. I'm saying it for the applicant too, because you're gonna come develop and you're gonna go over to Arlington and do the same thing. So work with us here in this city, and let's try to let's try to make this work. And and I, one thing I will say about Miss Batiste, I'm gonna give we're gonna give Miss Batiste a charge, and my colleagues agree. And I will have to say this: she has not. She's always come back with something that brings people closer together. Now I went out on a limb and said that because I've seen her track record. So I believe she can do that. I believe Miss Batiste will do it as she's done in the past. There's that a promise is. land. There's a promise land. I said, I said, I believe that. I put the pressure on her because she's done, she has done it in the plans. Now I'm not putting on promise land. I just I want them to put us on promise land and make it work. Okay. Um, that's that's all I've soapbox. I, I do have an issue uh that I need to deal with, something I just I probably have not done done correctly, but I need to consult uh with Miss Shellen. So give me three minutes. And we'll be right back. I know it's late, but I need to do this so I can make sure I'm doing the procedures correctly.
Okay, so are we ready to come back? So I, I made an error and hopefully uh, for the end of the year, beginning of the year, that error is gonna be corrected. But I did not call our former counsel, Attorney General's office, and uh, they are listed as other government agencies and it's new to me, uh, it's new to us. And some of this we're gonna have to resolve and get it taken care of. And that that is on my agenda. Uh, so what I'm gonna do now is to call Ms. Kane, but I'm gonna ask Ms. Kane to yield to Ms. Fast and then I'm gonna bring Ms. Kane up. And I would also ask if, cause there are times when I see stuff in the record for OAG and they don't testify. And this time they wanna testify and I can't read. I don't know, you know, I, we, my our staff may have missed it, but I, I definitely can't read your mind. So I, I need to know when you wanna testify. Uh, and I do call other government agencies. Most of the time it's OP and DDOT. But if OG wants to start, OAG starts wants to testify, they need to let let us know uh, until we get used to how this works. Because there's things in the record they don't testify tonight. They want to testify, so I'll leave it at that. All right, Miss. Uh, any other? Let me do this. Any other questions of the party in opposition? Uh, Commissioner Eben Moore. Uh, thank you. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll be brief. This is a question actually for Miss Romo. So I'm glad that she's on screen. Um, just real quick. Uh, I, I really value uh, shadow studies. I think they're really important. Um, and I know the one that the animation that you put together shows the winter solstice and it really covers uh, a significant portion of the field. But do we know what activities are taking place um, in December on that field? I don't have this information. Ari, do, do you have this information? Just anecdotally, we haven't studied it, but um, there are still, um, you know, some sports. It's not always that cold in December. Um, there's a tennis courts that are there, and I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know if um, Mr. Fishberg is stuck with us, but um, there's tennis courts and pickleball courts that are right there. And then the community uses it for kids to run around and things like that. Um, and then kids after school will also spend time out there as well. Um, but if, if Ivan's still here, maybe he could say. Um, or maybe that's something the developer can ask them to provide that information for you. But it is in use all year round. Um, Certainly, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, I just know, at least if you think about football and soccer, those are fall sports that end mm -hmm. far before December. So no doubt maybe the community uses it in the afternoon. But I didn't want to, um, I don't want shadow studies to mislead anybody, just as I don't. You know, I, the, the photographs that the applicant showed earlier, I thought were, I, at least in my opinion, um, weren't very helpful or meaningful either. So, um, and this is just to speak to uh, Vice Chair Miller's comment about um, looking at that shadow study. And it, it does, um, it is a very impactful image, but um, I also just want to remind everybody uh, the time of year and what's actually uh, taking place out on that field. If that were to take place perhaps in the summer or in the spring, um, you know that it would be a different story. So uh, we will have some all... shadows uh, on some um, spring and fall too. Certainly, uh, probably not as significant as uh, the winter solstice as as you showed. So I certainly appreciate that. So uh, that's all I have to share uh, or say, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from my colleagues? Okay, let's go to the applicant. Any questions of the party of the party in opposition? Uh, Okay, um, Commissioner Kramer, any uh, questions of the party in opposition? No further questions, thanks. And the party that was in support, who was the party in support, Michelle? No party in support. I think oh, it's been okay. a long night. <laughs> okay, I don't, I don't know. I just thought we had a party. Just, the, just the A and C, just the A and C, the applicant oh. and the party in opposition. Okay, uh, I got you. Thank you. It was it was Jefferson, um, Ivan Fishburne. But oh, that's there. right. Uh, but he he's not a party. No, he's not a party. No yeah, party. He's not a party. Okay, okay. I I, I appreciate. It. Well, Ms. Berg and, and to her um, colleagues who who helped in the opposition, we appreciate it. Again, stay tuned. Let's see where we go from here. Thank you very much for putting together your presentation to all of you. Um. Okay, Ms. Fast, and then I'm going to end with Ms. Alexander Kane. Okay, Ms. Fast. Oh. I'm sorry. What did I say? Yeah, Miss Fast. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I, I thought uh, I thought Miss Kane was going, but uh, good evening. 
uh, I had my testimony as good afternoon, but I guess it's good evening now, Chairman Hood and members of the Zoning Commission. Uh, my name is Gail Fast. I'm here today, though, on behalf of Town Square Towers, Council of Co-Owners, uh, we're the Board of Directors who have asked me to testify on behalf of our 285 residents. Um, while we are not a party, um, nor are uh, we within 200 feet of the applicant, um, our community is concerned because we use the G Street um, exit to get into one of our parking garages, and it is a route that many of our um, residents use to get home. Um, but I'm, tonight I'm going to um, talk to uh, Chair, Chairman Hood and, and sort of give you my key points um, for this quickly because it's been a long night. Um, Aaron is right. I am an uh, I would like to say an expert on the small area plan as I sat on the advisory committee that created the plan. So certainly I know it like the back of my hand, but I think the ANC has, you know, talked about the small area plan and certainly the commission is well aware of it. What I want to talk about is some of the proffers and um, how we are concerned with those and particularly in the affordable housing realm. And I know as an expert or having done negotiations before and having come before you on different PUDs, there is a trade-off between height, flexibility, and affordable housing. However, what I want to say is this building, again, is at 60% of MFI. And I think that's something to be really conscious of because there has never been affordable buildings so far going in Southwest in the last few years other since the wharf where there has been deeply affordable 30 to 50% MFI. And I really think that in negotiations, if we continue the community to work with the developer, I would really like to see us get to a point where we would have units at that really deeply affordable level. Because as you said, Chairman Hood, I'm concerned about the folks in my community. I want them to stay here and I want them to be able to live in a brand new building on the corner of 9th and M Street across from the wharf. And so we need 30 to 50% MFI. Someone at 60% MFI who is eligible for a three bedroom can make up to $114,000 to qualify for that three bedroom unit. So is that really targeting folks that look like you, Chairman Hood? I don't think so. Um, and that's not how we developed the small area plan to keep that racial equity. So I wanted to just bring that up as that point. I'm then gonna talk about the traffic and the mitigation. Um, I just think it's important when we were developing the wharf in phase one, we did meet with DDOT, we met with the federal government. They will not put a traffic light at that intersection for fear that traffic during things like game day or whatever would back up onto 395. So that isn't really a proffer that can happen. However, I do think though that the community can have a meeting um, with the applicant, with the ANC, with DDOT to come out and figure out what is the best solution for that intersection. Um, Town Square Towers was not one of the eight buildings that the developer reached out to. So we have had no conversations with the developer. Um, and, you know, by right, they don't really have to. But again, we are part of this community, and I think that that is important. Um, I understand that the curb cut on Main Avenue is going to create sort of this um, not two-way, but entrance in from Main Avenue and then a two-way coming out of G Street. Um, what I just want to put on the record um, for DDOT is we have a private drive. What happens is that becomes a throughway. So while those cars are going to be coming off of G Street, they will try to exit out on Main Avenue. And so I think that that is something that also needs to go back to the drawing table and look at to see as uh, the best thing it possibly can. For my short little time, I just want to talk about the grocer. Um, I appreciate uh, Vice Chair Miller's discussion on what size grocery stores need to be. The average grocery store is about 38,000 square feet. Um, smaller ones range from 12,000 to 25,000 25, square feet. So this is not, this should never have been proffered as a grocer. If you wanted to proffer it as a bodega, I'm all for it. I think bodegas are amazing. They don't require driving traffic and you can get a hard roll with butter and a cup of coffee for $2. 
which is the price point that really should be in this neighborhood to allow all South residents um, and Southwest residents to be able to use this store. So um, that's sort of what I'm gonna hold on as my testimony. I think that we can get to that um, if we talk with the developer. Um, I do have a concern that the view and the view shed of the building will be higher than the view at the wharf. I think that's problematic. Um, the wharf was developed, um, you know, to have a certain height. I think the developer can work so that the view shed for this building is equal to that of the buildings at the wharf. That's it for my time. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Fass. Let's see if we have any questions of you, uh, Commissioner May. No. Commissioner Even Moore. No. Uh, and Vice Chair Miller. No. Thank you, Ms. Fass, for your testimony. And and thank you, Ms. Fass. And I'm hoping that you'll be included if we continue those discussions. Uh, I know you have a lot of expertise on the on the um, ANC, as well as the um, ANC office, and now in your capacity uh, uh, where you are able to spot. So I, I, you know, we always need to make sure we tap that. So hopefully, uh, when that happens, that you will be involved as well. Um, if 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 everyone agrees, um, does the applicant have any cro uh, any cross in this in this fast? No. Okay, and Commissioner Kramer. No, thanks. And to the party, Capitol Square, Ms. Burt. No, we just thank Gail for her time and for her advice in this process. Great. Okay, thank you, Ms. Fast. We appreciate it. And let me bring up Ms. Alexandra Kane. Uh, let me let me first of all apologize for not calling her earlier. I got to get used to this new style. I, either I have to get used to it, or I don't. Have it. I, mean, I can't figure it out yet, but I'll I'll know soon. Uh, but let me get used to this new style. I'm supposed to call her. She's of the government now. So, uh, Ms. Kane, you may begin. Thank you, Chairman Hood. Um, I will just note quickly following up on your earlier point, we did follow the normal procedures for signing up to testify. Um, if there's some other step that the commission would like us to take, we're happy to do so. Um, if you were the Office of Zoning, could just let us know what that would be. Um, I could ask. I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you know right now what I think it would, could be helpful because there are times when you, and you may have followed with the staff. So I'm talking about me now, me only. It'll be good to let us know, let me know, because uh, if the staff misses it, that happens. Uh, you staffed this as well, so we miss things. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't. I would have called you all a lot earlier if I had known you all wanted to testify. And, and I'm talking about just me and me only. Not a problem at all. Um, I will ask if Mr. Young can pull up our PowerPoint. And while he's doing that, um, thank you, Chairman Hood, members of the commission. My name is Alexander Kane. I'm here tonight on behalf of the Office of the Attorney General's Equitable Land Use Section. Um, our presentation is in the record at Exhibit 93A. Um, I will just quickly ask, um, since the Commission has asked the applicant and the Office of Planning to provide written responses in response to some of the issues that we have raised, um, we would request the opportunity to respond in writing to those submissions as well, given that there has been some information introduced tonight that we were not aware of before, um, including you know, the potential for the MAP amendment to the MU8 that was discussed between the applicant and the Office of Planning. Um, with that up, I just note that OAG is currently testifying in opposition to this case, and that is based on the applicant's affordable housing proffer, which we believe is inconsistent with the comprehensive plan and does not satisfy the PUD balancing test. Next slide, Mr. Young. So in looking at this case, what we followed the key sort of question before the commission is what should the minimum affordable housing proffer for a PUD be? There's no specific requirement in the zoning regulations that sets a baseline for IZE for a PUD. It is left to the discretion of the applicant. So looking at recent cases, applicants have provi been providing about 15% across the board. That's applied to a variety of PUD cases, providing a variety of different scales. Um, and there's not really been any explanation as to how that number has been reached or why it is considered, you know, inappropriate for that specific PUD. What OIG believes is that a better method would be a formula that is tied to the specifics of the specific PUD and that is directly proportional to the height and density being gained through the PUD application process. Next slide, please. So as the commission is aware, the zoning regulations require that a PUD be better or superior to a matter of right project. And what renders a project superior to matter of right is the provision of public benefits. And that is the only thing that renders it superior to matter of right. 
Those benefits need to convey a meaningful benefit to the surrounding community, and they need to be proportional to the flexibility and additional density that the applicant is gaining through the PUD process. Next slide, please. However, we also need to bear in mind that not all PUD benefits are created equal. There are only two benefits in the entire comp plan that are specifically called out by the comprehensive plan, and that's the production of affordable housing. So new affordable housing units above and beyond the existing legal requirements and anti-displacement measures. Now, not only are these specifically identified, but they are prioritized in light of the acute need to preserve and build affordable housing. So, we believe that this provision of affordable housing units really is the key benefit that all PUDs across the board should be providing as part of their benefit package before and above anything else. But the question is still, what is the appropriate baseline for that? Next slide, please. So, as we noted, the regulations require a PUD to be superior to a matter of right project. Now, in this case, the applicant is seeking a map amendment to the MU9A zone. Had this map amendment been requested separately, it would be subject to the IZ plus program, which would require a higher IZ set aside for a matter of right development in that zone. Given that a PUD is getting even more height and density than would be possible through a map amendment, we assert that the IZ plus formula should be applied to the application, specifically to the IZ and PUD bonus density to establish the threshold of an IZ proffer for the project. Next slide, please. Now, in looking at the ways to calculate IZ plus, the IZ, the sort of second method of calculation results in the higher yields in this case. And as the reg state, the applicant is charged with picking the higher of the two. In this case, you come out to a set aside of 18%. This would act to about 78,000 square feet, which is about 12,000 more square feet than the applicant is currently proffering under their 15% proffer. I will note, we have made one change to the original proffer from the regs and that we have increased the set aside for the non-mechanical penthouse from 8% to 18%. We did that to capture both the value of the penthouse space and also honestly to sort of keep the, the math simple. It's also what the applicant is currently doing, only they're doing it with 15 and 15%. That doesn't result in a huge increase in terms of square footage. However, it does increase the amount of square footage that is being dedicated for a housing unit at the 50% MFI level from 420 square, 427 square feet to 960 square feet. We think that that's a relatively minor burden on the applicant, but results in a huge benefit for the district because you now have a unit that is a much larger size and can house a larger family at that lower income level. Next slide, please. So having established that 18% is sort of the baseline there is an issue of comp plan consistency with this project. As has been discussed throughout the hearing tonight, the FLUM designates the property as medium density commercial. This designation was supposed to serve as sort of a buffer between the high density um, development on the wharf to the south and the lower density development to the north. Now, the applicant, as we noted, is seeking a map amendment to the MUNIA zone. That is a high density zone. And this is a conscious choice on the part of the applicant as you can see, going through their slides where they dedicated, you know, this is how much density we get, how much height we would get under the MU10, which is permitted, versus the MU9A. So why is it that they chose this zone? It is because it allows 130 feet for a PUD. Next slide, please. So as we've gone through tonight, we've seen the renderings. You can see that the additional height allows the applicant to match or as we've heard, potentially exceed the height of the wharf development at the south. And it also affords them with unobstructed views for four stories to the west, north, and east. That is a huge benefit to the applicant, um, but it does directly contravene the direction of the FLUM, the GPM, and the small area plan to focus that high density development on the south side of Main Avenue, along the waterfront, and out of the lower density residential areas to the north. Next slide, please. So, an inconsistency with the comprehensive plan is not inherently fatal, but it does have to be specifically identified and addressed by the commission who has to specifically identify how it is outweighed by other policies, whether from the comp plan or other public policies. Next slide, please. Now, given the value of the additional two stories and in light of the comprehensive plan's prioritization of affordable housing, what OIG recommends is that there be a set aside of 33% on the GFA of those two additional stories that the applicant is gaining through the map amendment to the MU9A. Those two stories are inconsistent with the comprehensive plan, 
and 33% reflects the goals of the mayor's 2019 housing order, which says that roughly one in every, out of every three units developed in the district should be affordable. This would result in an additional 18,000 square feet dedicated for IZ. Next slide, please. So when all of this math works out, what we wind up with is 96,228 square feet that would be dedicated for affordable housing. That's roughly 22% of the applicant's total proposed residential GFA, approximately 30,000 more than the current proffer or about 30 additional units, depending on how many square, how many square feet per unit. Next slide, please. So finally, to conclude, we believe that this is consistent with the various elements of the comp plan, specifically the housing and the area elements. And given the long history of displacement and gentrification in the Southwest neighborhood, as been discussed in other filings and in testimony tonight, we feel that the provision of affordable units, additional affordable units, may help to stem the loss of current residents from the area and result in a more diverse and inclusive neighborhood as envisioned by the comprehensive plan and the small area plan. With that, I will conclude my testimony and welcome any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kane. I have been waiting to ask you all a question for a while, and one of them is I'm looking. I looked at your uh, submission today, and looked at previous ones, and also uh, remember the advice that you all have given us when you were our counsel. And I'm just curious. All these cases, many, 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 many many, many cases you all have advised us on, this kind of information was never presented. We could have done something about some of this that you all believe now is so wrong long ago. Why Why now? And all of a sudden now, what happened in the last few months that you all are now able to show up with these kind of analysis when I think as a commission, me personally, who depended on you all, should have gotten that then. So help me understand how we get here now and, and this stuff is, I think for me, that's a disservice, not just to me, but to the residents of the city. I mean, Chairman Hood, the role of OAG has changed in the past year. We are now advocating on behalf of the public interest. So we are just in a fundamentally different position than we were when we were advising the commission. So what, what I, I, see the thing is, you all know how we think, how we move. You know definitely how I think and how I move. And if this was an issue, these were things that we could have looked at. Then we probably could have solved a lot of these issues. We wouldn't have went so far down the pipe and just basically uh, just going through with things. We could have stopped some of this then if we had gotten some of this advice. I have some serious problems. This is not the last time you all going to hear this because there's some other things that are in the pipeline, but I can just tell you. This is a disservice to the residents. Now you're all on an African road, which is great. I have sent people your way, and I'm not getting on you, Ms. Kane. You can take it back. I've sent people your way, and they call me back and say they can't even get a phone call back. I've sent people your way to help them advocate because they don't know zoning, and they don't get a response. But anyway, uh, I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm, I'm not. You're not the person that I probably need to be talking to, or or the city needs to be talking to at this time, but. I'm like, if, if this was true, how come I didn't get this until you all made the change? I have a problem with that. I don't know um, how my other colleagues feel, but I feel like I was not given the best legal advice that I should have been given when you all represented me. And I'll leave it at that. All right, Mr. Chairman, you have any questions? I mean, uh, <laughs> Commissioner May? <laughs> You can I, I go to so many meetings. I do have a, I do have a chairman too. I got a couple other meetings I go to, and I have to say, Mr. Chairman. So, <laughs> so yeah, I do have a couple of questions. So, uh, Ms. Kane, we heard testimony earlier tonight that um, if this were just done as a map amendment, that the Office of Planning would never support MU nine A. The only reason to get to MU nine A was to give flexibility on height, and so it, it, i mean they would they would not i forget what the what zone it was but did you look at that at, at a, an actual uh zone that in its in its essence is consistent with the medium density commercial designation for a map amendment i'm sorry mr may can you give me that question one more time yeah. So, I mean, when you, you you're you're trying to suggest that if this was done as a map amendment with IP IZ plus, it would get, it would yield more 
affordable housing, but we could not do a map amendment to MU 9A. We simply could not, and the Office of Planning would not support it. I don't know what the next step down is that would get it to uh, medium density commercial, but it would not be the same density. Uh, it would not be the same allowable height. Well, it might be the, a similar density. I don't know, but did you look at that to see so, whether how it would? Yeah, it was an eight or it was an eight or ten. It was an eight or ten, Commissioner May. Eight yes. or ten. Eight or ten. Did you look at that? So we did look at those. Um, I will note that the MU10, which is specifically called out, does provide the same amount of density. The only difference is the height. The MU8 is lower. Um, you know, at this point, we're not viewing this as an issue of what can be approved. It's a matter of what is required to do that. As a map amendment, the only standards are consistency with the comprehensive plan, specifically the FLUM and the GPM. With a PUD, there are different things that can be considered. So, okay, I so you're going beyond my question. I was just asking you if you compared it. And you said that you did, um, and I get that MU10 is mm -hmm. is comparable. Um, I'm not sure that that office planning would actually support that either. Um, it would be interesting to know. It would have been interesting to know what IZ plus for MU8 would have been. That actually would be very helpful information to understand, because uh, you know MU9A was simply not going to not going to happen. Now, um, the comparison to the wharf, and you point out the heights of the wharf. So do you understand the nature of the zoning on the wharf that in that circumstance, the PUD called for greater heights, but not the same density that that goes with 130 foot buildings? Do you, do you, do you know that? I know that that probably predates when you were with the Office of the Attorney General, but do you understand that principle? Do I understand that principle? We're looking at it as a matter of the flum, and the flum does designate the wharf. I'm not asking you about the flum. I'm asking you whether you understand what happened with the wharf. What happened yes. with the wharf is that we approved 130 foot heights, but the the maximum density was much lower than would ordinarily be associated with 130 foot buildings, and that was so that we could have development that was, um, if not, you know, immediately compatible to the rest of Southwest. Um, in other words, it wouldn't necessarily fit north of Main Avenue, but it was intended to have buildings that could be taller, um, but also were not as packed in, right? So there's a big difference between what's happening in say the Navy Yard area, where every building is going up to the maximum height and going out to the, to the building front, and there's very little kind of manipulation of the building form. And this, and it's, it really is, they are like canyons over there. But the wharf was always intended to be different from that because of that, that zoning approach. Now, so having explained all that, did you know that about the wharf? I did know that about the wharf. You did know that about the wharf. So if you know that much about it, it seems to me that, that the advice that you are trying to give us is inconsistent with having that broader knowledge. Um, I don't think we need to be, um, lectured in, in the way we we have been lately from the Office Attorney General in this sort of corrective fashion where we're not doing enough. I mean, we understand the comprehensive plan. We work with it all the time. We know what inconsistency means. And, you know, you, you made the statement that this proposal is blatantly inconsistent with the with the uh, with the flum. And yet you're advocating that we consider this as if it were an MU-9A 130 foot building site, which would be, I mean, if it was just a map amendment to MU-9A, that would be inconsistent with the flum. But this is not because the flum is based on densities, not heights. And there's nothing in the in the flum that, that, that seems inherently inconsistent with this. When you consider all of the other things, that's what we have to balance, right? We have to think about all the other policies and we have to think about the small area plan. But you know, you made the statement that it's inconsistent with the flum. I don't see how you can do that. I guess that wasn't a question. That was just a statement. So I have my own issues. Mm. Um, I think I'm done, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Even more. Any questions? Uh, no, I will leave it on the explanation point of uh, Commissioner. All right, and Vice Chair Miller. Any questions, comments? Uh, I don't think I have any questions. I, I thank um, 
Ms. Kane and the Office of Attorney General for your uh, work in your new role, uh, advocating uh, 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 and I and I, I welcome any supplemental comments that you might want to make in response to the questions I asked of and the chairman asked, I think, of uh, the applicant and I asked of Office of Planning to respond to uh, your testimony, your, your, your written testimony um, and verbal testimonies to come when I, when I made that statement. Uh, so I welcome that, but uh, you asked that you be able to respond to whatever they respond to. Uh, I don't think you get the last word. Maybe you maybe you do because you get you you can appeal our cases and you can while you're simultaneously in another division somehow defending our decisions, which is a whole nother conversation to have. Uh, and maybe OAG wants to separate themselves from that role as they have done with other independent agencies, which maybe is what's about to happen. Um, because it's a very it's a very unusual uh situation here and um but i mean i i i i appreciate the information that you bring forward i i watched your um training sessions uh or uh that you that you personally gave to um ancs and to empower dc when on the case that was uh, uh this isn't relevant to this case, but you're here and we're, we're having a candid conversation. Uh, I watched that. I watched that. There was a lot of good information that you provided, but you questioned uh, in those sessions um, the intent I felt. I, I, I don't usually get defensive. I mean, I've been participating in the Zoning Commission for 10 years. I've been in the DC government for 40 years been on the receiving end of a lot of criticism. I, I can take it. Uh, uh, it's fine. It, it's welcome. It's usually deserved. But you, you were questioning motives of, uh, of us in those uh, uh, that case, which uh, of our rules and procedures that we were that we somehow were purposely trying to uh, uh, and the Office of Planning was trying to, in, in their proposal, uh, avoid, reduce, not avoid, reduce public participation. And I, I don't think questioning motives as part of a, uh, a public discussion about a case where you're trying to educate people about issues is appropriate. Uh, I think it's divisive. I, I found it divisive. I found it inflaming to the, the, the audience that you were uh, delivering to unnecessarily. I mean, I, you, you would throw out, oh yeah, maybe it was an oversight that they left that out or like, really, it, it, it just, it was presented in a way that questioned motives and intent uh, and, 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 and unnecessarily divisive. And I think that your office needs to, uh, Look at how you're how, how you're advocating uh, in this new role. And it's an educational role. It's an important role, and I and I applaud you for taking on. I applaud the attorney general for taking on the, 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 this this role. But it can be done in a way that is inclusive, where we're all participating together, trying to get to the same goal. We all we all want a more inclusive city. We all want more affordable housing. You know that based on your being our in-house counsel for years. So I, I just think it can be done in a, with a tone and with a with a understanding that we all want to get there together. Uh, and uh, we don't have to have a kumbaya moment where we all agree on every rule and regulation, but I think we need to try to work more collaboratively together as one government, one city, even though we, you're an independent agency, we're an independent agency, that's appropriate. We, we all play our roles, but 
I think I think we can do it in, in a more positive way. And I would just encourage you, you to do that. You, I welcome supplemental comments you want to give on what Office of Planning and, and applicant might have said. But in the, in this case, on the record, I, the chairman uh, will make a decision on that, uh, or we will on the record at the end. But you're not going to get the last. You, you don't get to always have the last word. I bet maybe you will in your new role because you'll you can appeal. And then you're going to be somehow in another division defending our decision or not. It's weird. Um, but um, I thank you for your testimony. It's late. Uh, I probably shouldn't have said anything that I said. Um, I, 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 I value the information that you provided. It, 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 we can always it's always we can always get there with. But I don't think we have to be questioning that we're trying to uh, be to be inconsistent with the comprehensive plan or, be, or to be uh, reducing public participation in another case. When, when that's not the goal, that's that's not what it's all about. It's, it's, it's obviously what it's not all about. So. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm I, 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 uh, sorry for rambling, but you kind of got me on off on this tangent and. Uh, um, I think we can move forward collaboratively together and, and, and get there. Uh, but we, 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 we need to do a little bit more work on working together. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair. And I'm, I'm just going to say this, Ms. Kane is not where this is going to stop. Uh, it's going to go far beyond Ms. Kane. But, but at some point, and it's, it's, it's all about timing, uh, but I will say that um, I, I applaud the advocacy I've always, I, I actually mentioned to them when they were our council that the residents of the city, this happened with Gerald E. Crest, this is nothing new, Levin and Planfield. Residents who don't do zoning need assistance, but we got to come up with the right procedure and the right process. I don't mind this, nope, and, 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 and Mr. Racine said that I was worried about, I'm not worried, not one bit, not one iota, because I've always tried to do what's right for the city. And it, to the point where, and I'm, I'm just saying this for my colleagues, not to you, Ms. Kane. To the point where I have been sending people their way who have been calling and needing help. I have been sending them business. And the results come back to me negative. But I, those people will, will show up. They will make their decisions of how they're going to proceed. But let me just say this. When you do right, you go up, up, up. When you do wrong, might not be in my time. I might not see it. You go down, down, down. Trust me on that. But I will tell you that I appreciate this. I just want to know where this advice has been. That's all. I probably could have used this 10 years ago and we probably could have stopped some of this. And some of these groups that, that we are here talking to now, I talk to them as well. Not about cases, but about things in general, trying to help them. People in this city want to help. They don't do zoning all the time. And I'm still learning. So again, Ms. Kane, you showed up. I want you to come back. I want you to come back and bring us with you. But I will say this, Ms. Kane will not have the last word because it's not in our procedures. I'm going to leave that, Vice Chair Miller, and I'm just saying this on the record, up to uh, our council to advise me on that. Just like I used to depend on them, I'm depending on our council <laughs> to, to advise me how all this works. This is still new. And all I ask Ms. Kane, even though our staff or, or whoever missed it, I apologize again. I should have probably called you all when I, right, I guess, right after DDOT. I got to, I don't know if we, I don't know if we, I think it's already in the regulations, other government agencies. So I, I will deal with that on my part, but let, let me know, or let somebody in the office know when you all are going to testify, because you all do submit things and then you don't testify. So I, how am I supposed to know? Chairman Hood. Any closing remarks? Um, if I may, we do not need to have the last word. We are fine if the applicant and OP want to respond to anything we put in. Um, we would just like to have the opportunity to put something additional into the record. So we are perfectly fine with having those additional responses come in. Um, we also, you know, do actively want to work with the commission. Our intent tonight was to try to provide, um, as you said, some information and option for the commission. Um, but as you said, we are all trying to work towards the same goals of equity and affordable housing. So I will leave it at that. Okay. Thank you very much. And, and, and again, we, we're not picking on you. I don't want you to go over here with that uh, because you're not the one that, that, that we will be looking to do uh, to come to come and talk to, to get this done. And that's, it's all about timing. All right. So thank you. Um, 
Miss Kane. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Miss Kane, you got to come back. Oh, now you know the rules better than I do, and you gone. You got to come back. <laughs> How are you going to leave me? Y'all used to tell me the rules. Um, let me see. Does the African have any cross? No cross? Okay, I guess I'm supposed to see your head doing that. I guess you okay. Does Miss uh, Commissioner? No, I know. No, we don't have any. Thank you, Miss Kramer. Do you have any cross? No, thank you. And Miss Berg, do you have any cross? No, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Kane. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. All right, let's go to uh, any rebuttal. I hope it's short and <laughs> short. Uh, and then closing. Um, Ms. Matisse. Yes, so um, uh, Chairman Hood, just for our closing or rebuttal, well, I'm, I want to respond to some of the comments raised by Commissioner Kramer and the Homeowners Association mm -hmm. about project impacts. Um, Mr. Detman is going to address some of the um, comments by Commissioner Kramer regarding the Southwest Neighborhood Plan. And then I'll go to closing remarks, but I have one question. Um, initially, you said you wanted us to provide something, a response in writing to the Office of Attorney General's report. Shane is prepared to do or, a re rebuttal. Um, and, and this is, this is not a good time. This is not a good oh. time at night. Uh, it's 10 o'clock. Okay. We want to be fresh. We want to be able, and you can do it in sound bite. Just like, <laughs> let's do it in sound bite. And, and it shouldn't have to be a long drawn out. But I would also ask Ms. Batiste that anything that you say, or you might want to get somebody else to say it because it can be crossed, it, it can be uh, crossed on rebuttal. So we want to make sure yes. we have compliance. Okay. I I understand that. So you'll right. speak to me. To... All right. Thank you. Okay. So I'll I'll be very um, brief. So first, I want to start by saying that the applicant um, doesn't feel any um hostility or toward the homeowners association or we don't feel like we um have like parted ways in any way um we we are uh want to reiterate that the height on g street was reduced in direct response to the homeowners association and the anc 60 subcommittee also we've said it several times we have agreed to relocate the curb cut west in order to address the homeowners association's concerns and the ANSI's committee's uh, 60s uh, subcommittee concerns about cut through traffic. So those issues we have uh, are in direct response to the comments and concerns we've heard from the, the HOA and the subcommittee. The last meeting we had with the subcommittee and we have a full list of all of our meetings in exhibit 38 but the last meeting we had with the subcommittee was on july 28th and at that time uh, we were prepared to discuss the final parts of our benefits and amenities package and the subcommittee said that we can no longer like continue that discussion because they were opposed to the height and density of the project so i agree with what has been suggested by Commissioner May and others that a meeting again on the height and density um, as it relates to height and density probably is not going to be particularly um, useful at this point. But following your advice, Chairman Hood, um, the applicant is happy to meet with the HOA and the subcommittee um, to see if there are other areas where impacts can be mitigated. We're especially appreciative of their concerns about and your concerns about diversity and affordable housing in the community. And so we're prepared to revisit uh, that part of, of the application. Um, and then lastly, I just want to note that um, the applicant has provided in the record at Exhibit 38, A4 and A5, a complete shadow study that includes the impacts from the existing buildings. Um, surrounding the property. And so that is something, uh, Commissioner Imamura, I know you specifically discussed. That is in the record at Exhibit 38. And so with that, I will turn it over to Shane. Um, and then I'll just have closing remarks. Thank you. 
<clears throat> Thank you, Lila. Uh, Mr. Young, I, I believe um, we had sent uh, just a small PDF of a couple of rebuttal slides and um, <laughs> bringing that up. Thank you. And if if, uh, if you could, I could take you right to the slide. If you if you show the panel that shows where all the slides, kind of like thumbnails of all the slides, it's at the end. Right there. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, Commissioner, I just wanted to have a couple of talking points about some of the comments around uh, Main Avenue and, and kind of the, the canyon effect and, and, and whatnot. And um, uh, Commissioner Kramer talked about how talked about the existing conditions along the north side of Maine, uh, talk, you know, characterizing a, a low rise assembly of buildings. Kind of that's the palette of the block. Uh, and I would say that in some of my earlier testimony touched upon this. I would say that if you look at some of the changes that were made to the comprehensive plan in 2006 and even further back, the, the AWI framework plan, I don't know if that's the palette that current district policy envisions for the north side of, of Main Avenue. Um, the, the site was zoned MU-12 back in the 1990s. Prior to that, it was, it was redeveloped under urban renewal. And again, in 2003, and you see here, this is a, a sheet from the 2003 AWI framework plan. Um, and, you know, it, it talks about the redevelopment of the Southwest waterfront. It also touches upon Main Avenue as a, and it characterizes it as a gateway boulevard. Um, and it shows, you know, a, a cross section of, of, you know, it doesn't get any specific, like a specific design. It doesn't prescribe heights or dimensions. Um, but that section does show um, development on the north side of, of Main Avenue opposite the wharf. Um, and consistent with the, the vision in this plan about Main Avenue being a re reconstructed as a monumental boulevard, um, kind of similar to a lot of the other avenues, state named avenues that you see in the city. Um, Main Avenue is 110 foot wide, at least. Uh, and so what that section is showing is that there is development. There is a contemplation for additional height and density on the north side of Main Avenue uh, to kind of frame, you know, this new monumental boulevard. Um, in 2006, as I mentioned, the comp plan was amended to not only upflum the wharf to reflect high density commercial, high density residential, but our site was also changed to medium density commercial. So again, kind of as a way to help implement that vision in the AWI framework plan, they changed the council changed the designation for this site to facilitate greater height and density. Next slide. This is. This next slide is um, this is an excerpt from the Southwest Neighborhood Plan, and I know there's been a lot of comments about height and height along Main Avenue. I, I've searched the small area plan numerous times. Every time I actually see a comment about height along Main Avenue, it's just not there. Um, Main Avenue is described in the small area plan in just a few places, and there's there's it, it just talks about Main Avenue being a gateway boulevard. It doesn't talk about height. Doesn't talk about got to be you know low density commercial or anything like that it just talks about main avenue as becoming this this gateway boulevard consistent with what was talked about in the 2003 awi uh, framework plan um, what it does talk about is this main avenue should ensure should ensure a an attractive transition between the wharf and southwest and i think um, if you look <laughs> at the presentation you look at how the massing of the building was moved around how it was sculpted in response to comments, how it was sculpted in response to what the small area plan is sort of envisioning. I think what we, we, we think we are providing a very attractive and appropriate transition um, that relates to the wharf. It's not part of the wharf, but it relates to it. It's consistent with this vision of Main Avenue as a gateway boulevard. And then as you move north, it steps down to 90 feet, creating that relationship on G Street of 90 feet and 50 feet that you see throughout Southwest. Um, lastly, Commissioner Kramer a couple of times expressed concern about if the commission was to approve this project, 
allow the greater height on the site, that it would put the townhomes that are near Arena Stage Riverside Baptist Church at risk of developers swooping in, building great big buildings. Um, and I would say this is again, and you can see it's on this section of the future land use map, which is, although it's the old future land use map, but um, if you knew where those townhomes were, you would see that those townhomes are designated on the flum as moderate density residential. So as a matter of right, you're probably looking at 40, 50 feet. A developer would not be able to swoop in and, and seek an MU9 or MU8 or MU10 for where those townhomes are. The comprehensive plan simply does not support that. And the commission would easily find that proposal to be inconsistent with the comprehensive plan. Um, Mr. Young, you can take the slides down. Um, I just have a couple of bullet points on OAG, uh, OAG's testimony, it's specifically with the, with the future land use map. And, and Ms. Commissioner May touched upon it already, but just to add a little bit, um, you know, the, the future land use map, um, you know, if you look at the framework element in describing the future land use map, it specifically says it's not a zoning map. For, mod, for medium density commercial, it says MU8, MU10, but it says other zones may apply. Um, again, the framework talks about density, not height, and we are well within the medium density commercial density, um, a medium density commercial density that's that's envisioned to be consistent with a medium density commercial PUD. Um, we did not seek MU9 to increase our height. We sought MU9 to give us the flexibility to move that density around the site to respond to the context of the entire site, which is exactly the type of flexibility that you get through the PUD process. Um, and if you look at the McMillan order uh, that was quoted in OAG's um, slides, you would see that the court acknowledges that flexibility. It agreed with the with the commission about that type of flexibility, pushing all that height to the north side of that site so that you can uh, spread out and have some more open space on the rest. Um, my my last point was is that, <clears throat> and at the risk of appearing as if I'm kind of piling on, and I don't mean to do that, but there is a good example of a site recently approved in 2020, PUD. The same future land use map designation, medium density commercial, and it sought MU9 and it was approved. It was deemed to be not inconsistent with the future land use map. And that order was authored by OAG. I even looked at the applicant's draft order and the future land use map section was completely changed. Um, and I have that section of the order and it says, the application is not inconsistent with the FLUM's medium density commercial designation. Unlike a zoning map, the FLUM is intended to be interpreted broadly. Although the proposed MU9 zone is described as a high density zone, its additional height and density would allow the redevelopment of the PUD site to concentrate density so as to allow greater sight lines to the river uh, and the site more, more dedication of open space. This was a site that was down by the waterfront. The project's overall density will be within the permissible. Uh, density uh, within a density permissible for a PUD utilizing IZ in a medium density commercial area. It would be below the maximum densities permitted in the MU8 and MU10 zones uh, that the comprehensive plan expressly identifies as consistent with the FLUM's medium density commercial. It would be well below the maximum 9.36 FAR permitted for a PUD utilizing IZ in the MU9. And I only wanted to read that excerpt is because the, these words that are on this order with the same set of circumstances with the FLUM and the MU9 and pushing density in one place in order to free up some space or, or respond to the surrounding context, that's exactly what we're doing here. There's, there's no difference. The only difference is the site. Um, and so I, I think what this section of the order does is it reiterates that what we're proposing to do with our MU9 zone is clearly not inconsistent with the future land use map designation of medium density commercial for the site. <clears throat> That's all I have. Thank you, Shane. And so just briefly in closing, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Ms. 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 Before you close, let me see if it's in cross. Um, Mr. Deadman. Mr. Mr. Deadman. Y'all can give you for a second. Sorry. Mr. Deadman, that, Mr. Last, Deadman, that part, last the last part that you have, I want you to supply that. To the to the record, if it's not already in there, I, I really appreciate that, and I want that to be labeled. Uh, that is a response to what OAG, uh, and that's my point. 
And I, I appreciate you bringing that up. It worked then. Man, if things have changed, now it's not working. That, that's that's something I need, not just for this case, but just period. So if you could send that um, to the to the staff, I really appreciate it. Uh, but before Ms. Batiste, before you um, go into closing, let me see if there's any cross on rebuttal, um, Commissioner Kramer. Yeah, I do have a, a question. I'm glad that uh, Mr. Detman brought this up um, on the uh, small area plan quote that the ensure that Main Avenue provides an attractive transition um, for the from from for the Southwest neighborhood to the wharf. I think that's the, the slide's not there anymore, but that's approximately how is this an attractive transition rather than a replication of the wharf from all of the testimony that we've heard this evening the um this is this is the same as the wharf except actually higher in terms of site this why is this a transition to the southwest neighborhood as opposed to a replication of the wharf i think when you're looking at transition you have to look more broadly than just you know what's happening immediately after the wharf i think you have to look at the entire block and actually if you're thinking about the transition from the wharf to the uh town square the capital square townhomes, you have to look at that entire cross section. Um, and I think a replication of the wharf would be uh, a proposal that would seek MU9 in order to go to 130 feet on the entire site. Uh, I think what we're proposing, and again, we're, we're also trying to balance certain other things like, like this idea of a gateway condition uh, that's talked about in the small area plan. And it was something that was requested by the Office of Planning. I think the transition as you look along that cross section from the wharf all the way up to G Street, where you have the wharf at 130 feet, 110 foot right of way. You have a building that is consistent with the scale of the wharf. Uh, and then as you continue to move north at a certain point, it drops down to 90 feet and then continues to the north end of the site to G Street, which I think has a right of way width of 90 feet. It's, it's pretty wide. It's 110 feet. 110 foot wide G Street, and then you have the 50 foot townhomes. I think when you're talking about transition, at least in my mind, I think about what are the two extremes of where what that transition needs to address, and you look across that entire sort of transect. And I think what's being proposed that step down to 90 feet and that relationship on G Street is appropriate, especially when you look at the different relationships throughout Southwest. With with due respect, we're talking about Main Avenue. We're not talking about a vertical pass to G Street. We're talking about Main Avenue, a building that is at Main Avenue. That's what we're talking about. That's what you brought up. That that piece is a replication of the wharf. I, that's um, but I, that's my question. That's that's uh, that, that's as I would uh, I would, well, I would clarify, ask you the question. Can... Why is this an appropriate transition? I understand uh, that, and we're only talking about why the main avenue choice. We're only talking. You brought it up. We're talking about main avenue, and so so it's the main avenue, the north side of main avenue that is in question here. So going back to G Street's not part of the discussion. You're talking about a section of the of the um, area plan which specifically talked about the wharf. That was the right nature of my question. The transition, the small area plan says transition from the wharf to the southwest neighborhood. So that's what we need to be talking about if we're going to talk about transition. Okay, thank you. Any other um, is there any way on the, the second question? Is there any way you talked about the the, um, the waterside uh, townhouses that are on, on Main Avenue? And um, is there any other way that they could come? You said that's they're not at risk. So is there any other way that they could come in with a PUD or anything else that would, would actually put them at risk? I think the first thing that would have to happen is that that site would have to be uh, significantly upflumed uh, through a comprehensive plan amendment process, council hearing and everything like that. I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Berg. Do you have any questions? Um, no, uh, Commissioner Kramer asked basically what I would have asked, except that I would just like to remind you that they're proposing a building on the southern part of the parcel that is 
taller than the wharf. And so I don't understand how a transition zone starts, goes up. And is that is that a question, Ms. Bird, or the, no. is that testimony? Is that a question that you want to frame to them? No, sir. Thank you. Okay. We, we well your statement. I want you to know we 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 get that. We 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 understood that. Gotcha. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, Ms. Batiste, can you give us your closing? So I would just um, note that the applicant has demonstrated through testimony and documents in the record how this application complies with the standard of review for approving the PUD. Um, I'd also like to note that there are 21 letters in support of the PUD from people who reside and work within a mile of the site. And those letters noted a couple of things. First, that the PUD is, a trans, is transit oriented because of the location within a half mile of the metro, the need for additional housing in the neighborhood to lower demand, uh, the need for a grocery store to serve the southwest neighborhood. And one person that works at the wharf noted that while there are several restaurants, it's hard to find basic healthy food options like carrots and apples. Um, that's a quote. And then it was noted in the um, these letters of support that the improved um, they noted the improved biking, pedestrian, and vehicular experience on 9th Street with the uh, trap transportation improvements. So, I'd like to close by just reading a few sentences from a letter in support at Exhibit 82 of the record. And this letter is from Ryan Quinn, who lives at Potomac Place Towers at 800 4th Street Southwest which is just a half mile from the site. And he wrote, he writes, I support this project or these projects, both main avenue projects, because um, it creates urgently needed housing in our neighborhood and the city and will help encourage public transportation and will increase housing affordability. Study after study has shown that uh, redeveloping older low density buildings with new high density buildings is one of the most direct ways to reduce housing costs. It saddens me that some of my wealthiest neighbors, many who live in affluent, low density, single family homes, continue to use their financial and political resources to block new housing. Zoning changes that open, our, open up our neighborhood to a new apartment building would substantially increase the supply of housing while also making our community more financially accessible to more family. And so I'll close on that note, um, Mr. Chairman, I know you've asked for certain items to be put into the record and for us to meet with um, the HOA and the ANC. We're happy um, to do that. And so we respectfully request, um, you know, date certain for that, for the information and those meetings to take place so we can get, um, those items and the summary of our meetings into the record. Thank you, um, Mr. Teach. Let me ask you: Is Ryan Quinn related to somebody that used to work at Holland at night? I'm just curious. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. All right. Um, let me ask uh, my colleagues: Do you have any follow-up questions or comments? Okay. All right, Michelle. 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 <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm here. I couldn't find the button fast enough. Oh, okay. I, I know it's at 10. I was hoping that didn't happen. Okay. <laughs> uh, Michelle, could you come up with some dates? So yes, I have not fallen asleep yet. I'm pretty close, though. Um, okay. So, Ms. Batiz, you know everything that you uh, need to supply. And um, so, I'm going to ask you. Uh, is two weeks enough time? Um, yes, and I say that understanding that Ms. Berg and Ms. Kramer on the line are on the line, so we'd ask that we'd be able to meet with them next week. Yep. Can, okay. Can I jump in here? Because two weeks seems really quick, given the 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 level of discussion that may be needed. Um. Can, can we give them a little bit more time? I mean, Mr. Chairman, maybe you feel differently, but I just think we ought to give them a little more time rather than try to rush it. If we if we take it for action in, in uh, December, we can do that. We have one meeting in November, I think. Let me check. I might be wrong. 
Yeah, we only have one meeting in November, so I was trying to shoot for that date, but um, we can certainly shoot for the December if, if meeting. We, if, if we had the meeting, I mean, the meeting in November is like the third tenth. week. The 10th. The it's always so, the second Tuesday and whatever the last. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it, I got it, I got it. Thursday, I'm sorry, Thursday. We have yeah. a big agenda item on the 10th, uh, Commissioner yeah. Manos. Let's, tr let's try to move that further. Like you said, yeah. I agree. Let's move it further. Right. Okay. So then we'll, um, in that case, working back from December 15th, um, to allow them time to uh, meet and uh, the ANC to have their meeting. Um, I'm gonna say until uh, November 21st. So that'll give them- uh, Sorry, I'm, I'm not following what you do. You're not moving into December, is that right? Right, I'm giving you the first date, which is between now and November 21st, you're gonna meet with the applicant and the homeowners association and any submissions that were asked for from the commission are due that day by 3 p.m. Is that for both of us or just the applicant? If you were supposed to submit something, yes. And then responses from the parties. So you get to respond to each other's submissions would then be due on November 28th. And I'm going to now turn to the commission. Did you guys want the office of planning to provide any responses um, to anything that the applicant would be providing? And did you decide whether you actually want OAG to I, I heard her say that she doesn't want to respond to what the applicant submitted, but to just provide an additional response. If so, then she could submit that by 1121, which it'll, would allow the parties to respond to it because they are allowed to respond yeah. to it. <clears throat> and I, if I, you want. You know, I, I do think that if, if I mean, that, that certainly makes sense, but I do think that if um, something substantive comes out of the further discussions, then we would like to have the Office of Planning weigh in on it. Okay, so then, um, and so that would be when Ms. Kramer was asking if they had anything due on the 21st. Um, it sounds like the commission would like to hear from, um, have Ms. Berg submit something, the ANC and the applicant regarding the outcome of their meetings. If they want to, yes. they could submit it. Yes. Okay, so yes. if you guys um, choose to submit uh, the results of that meeting and maybe a solution a resolution that your ANC voted on you can do that by November 21st 3 o'clock p.m. the applicants going to make their submissions that day and then on 1128 that's the day that the office of planning and you as uh, the ANC, the party in opposition, and of course the applicant get to respond to each other's submissions that were made on the 21st. Are you following? We do that in public. Do we do that in a public session, or are we doing that in no, a, a submission? The hearing is over when we finish tonight, so it will be by paper only. Okay. By 3 sure. p.m. on the 28th. And any draft findings of facts, conclusions of law, if you'd like to submit them, are due by 3 p.m. on the 28th. The applicant must submit them. If you submit them, you submit them through ISIS and then send me a word version, just to me. Um, And then we'll put this on for 1215 at 4 o'clock. Um, Chairman Hood, did you guys decide if you want Ms. Kane to make a further? Are you going to allow her to do that or not? 
Yeah, the twenty first. Uh, I think I think she. If she, I don't know what she she can. She was going to submit a further submission. Yeah, she okay. can do that on the twenty first, and then she that way that on November twenty first. And um, I don't see her on anymore, but maybe one of her coworkers is watching on YouTube. Yeah, I'm sure they're probably on YouTube. They can um, yeah, so pass that information, on, or maybe she is. Oh, let's um, make and, sure. Let's make sure that we get the information to them. Um, uh, just in case they're not on uh, YouTube, because we have quite a few watching us on YouTube. Okay, and so again, um, those submissions are due by three p.m. the twenty-first. The answers from the parties only would be due by eleven twenty-eight three p.m. Um, draft findings, facts, conclusions of law would be due by three p.m. on the twenty-eighth, and we will put this on the commission's December fifteenth. Um, agenda at 4 o'clock p.m. Other than that, what was asked for, the record is closed. No more submissions. Okay, thank you, Michelle. And I think we're all on the same page. Uh, so with that, I'm going to close, uh, Ms. Burke. I'm sorry, what is the HOA uh, need to submit? Uh, response or something? Report out on your meeting. Okay, so our, our thoughts up in the meeting when we meet with them, write that out. And then sound um, bites and sound you bites can call me point. tomorrow if you want to. I think I might, yeah. Sharon. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't regret that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, or or Monday. Uh, I mean, you can call me tomorrow. It's not my normal day in, but I will answer your questions. Just, you know, give me uh, give me an email. I'll call you back. I can wait till Monday if needed to. I don't want to bother your yeah. day off. Okay, um, sounds good. And then. A uh, construction management agreement, is that something that goes into the case file or is that something we just hope that they offer us or? It's a private agreement or Chairman Hood, do you want to take that one? Yeah, you, we'll point to it, but I mean, I'll leave that up to you all. And those, that's part of your discussions if, if they choose to, to enter into one, uh, but it would be good. Y'all can the negotiate. Applicant, the applicant can proffer a, a construction management agreement. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If they can, they can proffer yeah. it, but I, yeah. yeah. I, 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 you know, it's and one of those we things use, that they, where the and applicant we use, actually. And we usually reference a construction management agreement in our zoning orders, but because they are not enforceable through zoning, they aren't usually a specific condition in the order enforceable by zoning, but they are referenced. And in that CMA, you can have your own enforceable measures uh which uh it's getting late you see is very thing. familiar with how to do that yeah right. we're saying the same thing so it's getting late thank uh, you so let me let me go ahead and close this out uh anything else and let me just say commissioner may i want to thank you because i know in the when we were in the hearing room 10 o'clock was the cutoff so i want to thank you for not i'm not going to say you turn into somebody else at 10 o'clock but i want to thank you for sticking with us <laughs> We were so close to the end, and it's, it's a lot quicker commute for me to get home now. I okay. agree. I just said that today. All Someone right. asked okay. me, do you like virtual hearings? So, so again, I want to thank everyone for your participation tonight. And this, uh, the Zoning Commission will meet again October 13th. So you all have, I guess that's a week off, right? Monday's sure. a holiday, so. Oh, no wonder we're not meeting Monday. Okay, so October 13th, it'll be our regular... Uh, I think it's a meeting. Yes, yeah, a meeting case. Uh, we'll start at 4 p.m. on the same platforms. I want to thank everyone for their participation tonight, and let's make it work, Ms. Matisse and others. And with that, this uh, hearing is adjourned. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night, thank you.